And yeah. So, so there we are, and we're going to talking. see, yeah. and then we're going to see how, uh, or should I go to the stupid production first, or? Um, and there we are. We're streaming now, and uh, hopefully I didn't screw everything up with a 10-second stream. Hopefully this comes on the same stream again. Now I'll go over to the. Okay, we're working. Warning, please check the video resolution. That's fine. Open widget and uh, edit. We don't need to do any of that. Open widget. Make sure certain stream health is here. Uh, warning on resolution. No data. YouTube is not currently receiving data for the stream. If you believe this is uh, correct, let me see. Uh, it says good. It's up now. It's up now? Okay, good. You see it? Yep, I'm the first one to put a thumbs up. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, so let's... Second. Okay, bless you both. And now let's see if we can get the URL from it. How do I close the widget? Uh, now, now that I opened the widget, how do I close it? Um, uh, see, this is where I need Brendan here. And he should have been on with us. Derek Talley saying hello, everyone. And um, so um, how do I close the widget? Oh, press the edit button, maybe. Um, everything is there. Okay, uh, good. Let's save that. And... Uh, all right, so I guess we're on, and that's all that is. <laughs> but how do I get the URL? Where's the URL? Um, Shouldn't that be in the... Uh... I, here, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you in, in, in our messenger. Please, thank you so much. Wouldn't that just Bless. be the address bar? It's, it's, I can't find it. They've reformatted everything so that you cannot produce. Oh, so that you I see. Can... And I also have to take into account Thank that you. you're using an older uh, computer, so it might not, it might not, you know, show properly. Uh-huh. Because these things are configured for, like, Windows 7 and Windows... Something, yes. It's, it's awful. Please, please don't say any negative thing right now. What's not gonna work? I... So nervous. Everything should work. Uh, Sorry. Thank you. Yes, honey. Okay, there we are. This is... Thank you so much for that. I couldn't have gotten this done at all without Derek Talley, honestly. So let me um, turn on this. There we are. This okay. is... Thank you. See, without Derek Talley, this simply would not work. So let me get that share again. Then I can change that on all of the promotional banners. Uh, but honestly, honey, this is so frustrating uh to to deal with this and it's it's just one of those things they didn't need to do if it's not broken don't fix it and so what they've done is i think that what they're trying to do is make it impossible for people to live stream they're trying to make it more and more difficult so there's less and less people doing it don't fix it okay. and so what they've done oh, is i think and uh so at least we can turn that off uh and uh shut that down and thank you for putting it in the messenger box, Derek. Now what I uh, will do is uh, go over here to start changing the promotional banners. In the meantime, um, you can ask him that question again, honey, and um, have Derek answer it about his job. Thank you. Yeah. Right, honey? <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm here. Yeah. No, 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 no. Just... Sure. No, um, so we're live now officially, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, so what I was asking, uh, Derek, um, what was the question? Oh, uh, you were asking about, and, uh, you know, um, when you when you drive, like how many hours in, in, in one shot you drive and take a break? Well, no, usual. Well, the, being, being that um, I don't drive like the same route every day. Usually, I work I work anywhere from ten to fourteen hours a day. And um, on a, on some people like local runs to where they have uh, five or six stops to where they'll they'll do three stops and then have to go back and reload and do another three stops. During that time, it's not a whole bunch of driving. It's it's mostly uh, unloading and you know just driving around the city to get to the next tank. But then we'll have our road run days to where we'll go to like from Nashville to Birmingham, Alabama. And that's about four hours one way, four and a half hours one way, then four and a half hours the other way. And I kind of like those better because I, I'm I'm one who likes to sit back and listen to my audio books, my podcasts and stuff. So, you know, I, I take the good with the bad, I like the, the shorter local runs to where they're working all day, but in a, in a smaller area and they do less driving. So it all, it all adds up in total to about the I'll say 12 hours a day but if it's a if it's a day to where I'm mostly driving then eight hours of that is going to be driving 
the other four hours is just going to be loading and unloading and you know mis other miscellaneous stuff that's you know other than other than driving but um yeah and those j just for the record that those are the actual days i like that's why when i went over the road i really enjoyed it um one of my favorite runs was um when we when we were in east chicago indiana we had to go to uh minneapolis minnesota first so i would drive up to minnesota and then we would do a number of stops up in minnesota and then that's when i would go to bed and then my uh partner would do a lot of the the local you know the hydrogen tanks up there in minnesota minneapolis st paul and then when it's time to um go back down to mcintosh alabama from minnesota it was a straight shot and that was like the funnest time so i would drive from many old from um Minneapolis, Minnesota, I would make it all the way down to Connersville, Tennessee before I would have to run out of hours of driving. So that's like 10 hours of driving. Um, and then, you know, we, we get paid a house. So if you can drive, if you can put the pedal to the metal and not have that much traffic, you're going to make more money per hour than you would hour or the hourly rate. So it all, oh, so it all. You, so so you guys um, uh, uh, get paid uh, by the hour. Uh, well, we get we get paid by the miles when we're driving and and by the hour when we're working. So, um, you know, so the the hour if we're just doing a regular stop, the hourly is, is kind of like a flat rate. So it, it's kind of the the hourly is the same whether. You know whether I could do it real quick. I, I kind of made out, or if it takes a little bit longer, unless there's an actual delay. If there's a delay for any reason, for like if they have a crane blocking the tank, uh, but then I get to add those delay hours on there. But you know um, that usually doesn't pay off. As long as I can keep it moving and and uh, get my work done, it it all it all works out pretty good. So um, as long as I'm as long as I'm driving, I get paid by the miles and as long as i'm uh working i get paid by the hour there we are wow so much to know about different you know job different you know job criteria interesting the other um one, the, the other night it's interesting that you were talking about helium gas this is so funny like um, that um, last year uh, oh, i think there was this scarcity of um helium gas last year or before so what we do like we get uh, balloons for our open houses so we get usually like you know agents um we get balloons for our open houses and you know all different so we need like seven eight balloons every uh, you know over the weekend so seven on sunday seven saturday and seven on uh, Sundays is like 14 to 20 balloons. So last year there was uh, so I I went to get balloons and then um, my office is like oh we don't have balloons anymore because we the, the helium gas shortage. I didn't know that. I thought and I was so upset with them. Uh, basically, I was like complaining to my manager and my you know just making a big deal out of it. Now and then later on I found that okay um, so it was I thought it's only in New York. But when you guys were mentioning, so it's like understood. So that was the thing that happened that we don't know. We just, you know, oh, interesting okay. information. So, uh, it was well, funny. you know, one time we were talking about uh, that xenon gra that, that xenon gas. Yes. Um, I think Mercedes. What is, what is like that the, xenon gas? I mean, uh, uh, the what is it for? Xenon gas. Well, uh, Mercedes and now a couple other car companies like Lincoln, BMW. They use it in their lights. I know there's other uses oh, for it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I yeah. see what you're saying. All right. I yeah, see. yeah. They use it in their in their and um, one of those. Those are for one. They're filled up in tube trailers, so you'll have looks like one trailer, but it's really a bunch of different tubes that are uh, clumped together. But that trailer takes five months to fill. Five months to get it all the way full. Wow. So that's oh how rare that xenon. That's how rare that xenon gas is. That's amazing. For sure. <laughs> uh, so I'm um, sorry about that. Have you have you ever seen any? Um, like I remember, like long time ago, uh, the the truck that you drive is it like eighteen wheelers or one of those large yes. ones? Yes. 
Oh yep. wow! I saw one flip um, on the highway ninety um, ninety um, uh, uh, high, uh, towards you know uh, south, down south. So it was like a few hours, you know, traffic jam and all this. It was like very scary a scene. Um, it flipped and then, I don't know, like entire, like four or five hours, the highway was um, closed. Pretty oh, much. yeah. When, you, when one of those flips, um, some of the, some of the uh, best drivers out there are those tow truck drivers that have to get those ones that flip in a ditch. And uh, they flip in a ditch, and they have to pull them up, and then there's power lines there. Oh man, it's it's, it's real. It's real. Um, that's a real difficult job, you know. They, plus, they they're always on call. Those uh, those uh, uh, tow t- those tow truck drivers that tow our trucks. One time we had a truck break down in Georgia, just past the state line. Uh, we were coming from Cartersville. One of our drivers broke down before he reached the Tennessee state line. And uh, so we called a tow truck to get him. So now, granted, it's still like probably like 180 something miles away. But they, you know how much they wanted to pick up our truck. And plus, it was loaded. So you got a load, a truck that's already loaded. And you got um, going across the state line. You know how much they wanted to pick up our truck and bring it back to our yard in Tennessee? 10 grand, 10 grand for four hours worth of work. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, and so, the, and you know, luckily it, it was in a secure area and we didn't have to use, we, we found other means, you know. We found, a, we found a way to get it back, you know, in a the, in the cheaper way. So we actually took, it was our truck, but we took it back to Cartersville and they let us keep it on their property for a while to and get it fixed over there. But um, yeah, those tow truck drivers, they, they make money, man. Those mm-hmm. guys, the, the ones that have to pick up the uh, trucks that slide off the road, and especially here in Tennessee, you got some that slide up the mountain, slide down the mountain, going too fast around curbs, and then, you know, w- when it's cold outside and they turn the wheel, but the truck is still going straight and over the cliff. Yep. Okay, thank you. That, that was wonderful. I really appreciate that. So we have the... Uh, we are burning bandwidth, and uh, I'm happy to see that uh, people are responsive. I uh, do want everyone to know that uh, our uh, usual friends, the usual suspects, are here with us to keep us company uh, on our live stream. Daniel Arola says, hi, of course it's spelled H-I-G-H, from Houston, while I enjoy the sunset from the back, yeared. Uh, <laughs> there we are, and uh, he spelled it yeared, uh, Y-E-A-R-D. Uh, and uh, Sarah Shields uh, says, hi, Douglas and friends, have a blessed transmission. Hey, honey. So glad to have you with us. And Marcus Crick says, hey, guys. So hello to our man in Australia. Um, uh, definitely uh, deeply appreciated uh, everyone who's joined us. And uh, I want to go back to the round table. We have 10 minutes to the top of the hour. We'll bring Brendan Zogat on for a few minutes when he becomes available. Um, he's uh, asked myself to give him another minute, uh, but he's got a message saying call. Okay, so let's bring him on. And... Uh, there we are. How do I do this again? And uh, here, Brendan Zogit. And um, he'll be with us to um, start the evening on a high note. And uh, let me tell him I am calling. I am calling. Call. Hello? There we are, good sir. So, uh, right. so glad you're able to get those texts. Because, like, Messenger, every time I text you on Messenger, it cancels out of the app. So it's, oh, really it, 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 it's really weird. When I try to put the uh, URL uh, to wherever the live stream is, is displaying, and I, yes. um, I couldn't even have retrieved it without Derek Daly. So um, the way they set this thing up is it takes two people to produce until maybe I find out some way to do this with your help. But basically without Derek Talley there um, to actually see it. And if he were gone working tonight, it would have been Jameson Reese, I presume, who would have done that because Jameson Reese also simultaneously saw it come on and confirmed that we were live streaming. So um, what happened was they, uh, Derek provided in this case the URL and I was able to uh, then connect to the uh, video and then get the the share um, code, which is different. And then I was able to change the uh, promotional banners and then put up the uh, the hyperlink. 
So it all worked out, but it um, it definitely was not a comfortable experience. And nevertheless, we got um, through it much earlier than I normally would with a production. But that's only because uh, I had Derek on with myself for like uh, maybe about 15 minutes, uh, like you know, before also. before we even got to the bottom of the hour. So we kind of like, uh, uh, yes. uh, but uh, honestly, it's it's just. I, I think the new format sucks. <laughs> it really sucks, but right. I'll get used yes. to it. Um, uh, and and it, it might the be... The other way was more simple, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was just... it's uh, Well, this will probably become simpler as time goes on because it does connect directly to the OBS. So when I start it, right. then the, the, the channel actually starts. The, the live stream actually does start. And I made the mistake. As soon as I started, I chickened out and uh, stopped streaming. But I guess it was so quick that when I... S- started and stopped and then started it again it seems to have gone on the same live stream it doesn't seem to have started the new one thank god so uh there we have that that's the progress report for you and um please take advantage of uh this moment to uh share with us whatever you want to share with what little time we have with you go ahead and vent tell us about the firestorms and the smoke is back in the capital of california and uh how all the checked out the smoke map and Yeah. yeah it's like we have more fires all the way up to mount shasta from uh, Northern California all the way, you know, from the Oregon border down to where you're at, Douglas, and where I'm at. So it's like blowing into the valley. Uh, you guys have a bit more respite from the wind, but it's still smoky in San Fran, I'm sure. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, um... But out here, it's like the sun was blotted out earlier. It's starting to clear up a bit now, but earlier it was like it was like zero visibility for a, for a good minute there. Mm-hmm. Like uh Holy shit. Extremely hazardous air quality. Yeah. I, I mean, when I was talking to Brendan Zogit on the phone and he was helping us establish rendering our live stream public, uh, he was looking at the phone on the screen share that I was providing while he was driving and I was admonishing him not to do that. And he said, well, I can't see anyway. The smoke is so thick that I can't see what's in front of me. I mean, this is how alarming. <laughs> the situation right. is so so do share with us some of the other shit you're dealing with i'm sure you get trump cultists throughout the store every day now and they must have said the debates went well as far as they're concerned but go <laughs> yeah as far as they're concerned he just babbled babbled enough to get the uh, you know to just stop the progress oh god oh be- yeah, yeah but, but i don't even want to talk about that really yeah you know of course not no i don't want to lower it to that i do want to say one thing before i forget it um i have a reminder on my calendar to reserve office time with uh rosalyn office rosalyn office tomorrow at 11 30 a.m so i just want selena khan to know that she's putting her appointments on my calendar <laughs> oh shit oh god uh so honey just be careful about that um so uh like this might show up it's ever ever since i started changing i add some of my information i guess that's what is happening so i may have to completely separate myself oh don't do and, that don't. and use uh, yeah I mean, I don't mind it, but, you know, I just... I will walk it out. I yeah, have no yeah. problem if you know my office meeting time. Oh, my God. So it doesn't matter to me. Yes. Yes. Thank you, honey. And and so go on, Brendan, while the, we have you for a few minutes. I know you have to eat. This is your lunch hour, but do you get a full hour or what's going on with that? I mean, I don't have much more time. But, okay. Yeah. But I manage to... I, I have enough time to where I can go have lunch at this park, this, like, local park zone. Wonderful. Relaxing. Uh, and that's where you're at now, where we heard you kill the chicken. He, he just strangled a rooster. That's what he's going to eat. Um, no, so. it's, it's, that's just like someone's house. I don't think that's like... <laughs> I don't think that's a feature. I think it's just some, some, someone that grows their own chickens. <laughs> yes. I uh, mean, if I had a house, I'd have a chicken coop. I mean, they're nice to have around. Oh, God, if you yeah, say so. so. Uh, I wouldn't <laughs> want to hear that shit every morning. Good God. Uh, but, uh, yes, so, so go on. And it's not as bad if you have just chickens. That's like a rooster. Yes, yes. True yeah. enough. True enough. But yeah, I honestly forgot after like so much. I've been through so much at this point. I'm trying to remember what I was going to talk about. Oh, there well, you, of, there oh, well, well there, there was a lot going on that you were talking about. We were going to talk a bit about. I wish you, you were on longer so we could talk about archaeology. I was going to cover some more about right. uh, what we had started to speak about with Critaeus and all of that, of course, and uh, right. the Odyssey and everything. But aside from that, of course, uh, thank you for providing me the information. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of Japan's most loved actresses has killed herself recently. And oh, yes. I was going to ask you about that. Like, a uh... It's that she's like the third or fourth one that's committed suicide from these people bombarding her online or bombarding these actresses. 
So it's like, do you think that's something in the culture that's causing this? Or is that like possibly some cultist type attacks where they just are down to kill anyone who, or bring anyone down who's like prettier than them? Or what? Do you think it's just. Uh, this, 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 this is like. It, I'll have to look more into it. This is the third one that's happened. It's the third. Or I'm pretty sure it's like around the third I've seen of uh, these I, famous I, Japanese actresses like killing themselves from okay. people basically like going online and just trolling them to the point where they just kill themselves. It's like it's really shitty. I, 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 I don't. I, I, yeah, of course not. I, 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 all I can say is that most of what I deal with in terms of Japanese culture is historical, yes. and when it comes to what's going on in Japan today, uh, it's one right. of those things that I, I always have to in- investigate it independently. I, I don't know what's right, going yeah, on. Right. I understand. Yeah, and uh, I, I see there's a full moon now. Maybe you can tell us something about that. Selena Khan just informed myself of that, and uh, so uh, I don't know if the you can see. Moon? Yeah, I don't know if you can see it from where you're at, but she certainly sees it in New York. Um, it should be. Uh, let's see, what's today? The thirtieth. Yeah, she'll probably be seeing. It's like the stage, like right before the full moon. It's gonna be on the first. So like tonight into the first, and mm-hmm. second, I think. Wonderful. Yes, uh, yes it is the full moon. Okay, so, uh, and aside from that, of course, you also sent me the article about the new Japanese prime minister is trying to discuss with the Russians about ending the Second World War, essentially. Right, I'm hoping, I'm hoping he, yeah, I was gonna, I figured you'd be interested in that, because, like, I figured, since Abe's gone, and he was, he was more diplomatic, I'm hoping, like, Suga is a bit more uh, direct and just tells Putin, you know, fuck you, like, we're gonna deal, deal with this peace deal, or, you know, get it out of the way, that's basically what it seemed. Thank you. Um, yeah, he hopefully. tells Putin they should end the t- territorial issue, so I think he's going to be a bit more uh, upfront about it, just straight up telling him, like, you have to end this issue now. Yes. Because uh, yeah. the, in the article it says, like, they don't want it to go, he doesn't want it to be left to the next generation. Okay. He made the proposal to Putin as leaders had their first talk by telephone on Tuesday, expressed hope for the further development of these bilateral relations, including the peace treaty. Excellent. So. Excellent. Yeah, by, right. by, by the way, now, Niels Lars, or Niles Lars, says hello, so, and he gives us a hang 10, so a hang 10 to Niles Lars, and Daniel Arola says, those fowl crowing in the background from Brendan's end remind me of my childhood in the province in the Philippines in the early 1980s. There you are. Thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. And, uh, so... Yeah, like, the neighborhood where I work, like, those people are probably Asian that have these chickens. Oh really? Uh, actually, I thought you were up in that bumfuck little town that that everybody's got this stupid chicken festival and they they got. Well, yeah, that's to... like by my house, but this is like someone's house, like okay. actual house. Okay. By my house, there's like a chicken park, but that's just like rich white people that do. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! So uh, so so catch us up more on uh, what you what you feel is relevant i mean certainly when we were speaking about uh the archaeological news you were you were bringing up something about uh uh the uh something else yeah, archaeologically. I'll, I'll read that now yeah because it relates to what you've said before i thought it was really funny because um it, it's this uh the section we're in is about like archaeological preservation and degradation and decomposition right yes and then it's and so you basically said that you live in the hull of like an excavated ship. Yes. Well, in the yeah, in the 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 text of our book, I found this one. It said, examples of items that archaeologists have recovered from bogs include carts, wooden roads, and even ships, such as ones from the 18 and the 1900s, found in areas of that were formerly part of San Francisco's waterfront. There <laughs> we are. When I read that, I was like, oh, Douglas lives in one of those. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank yeah. you. So it was just funny. Yes. No, no, that is. They basically were preserved in parts of the bay that were, like, basically landfilled, and then they ended up excavating them at some point. Yes. So. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and uh, Jameson Reese says, I've got to show my place from outside because it sounds trippy. Actually, you can only see that from the inside because the inverted hull of the ship has been covered by a conventional structure. So if you see it from, say, Google right. Maps, the satellites, it'll look like a conventional home from the outside. It's only inside you see the hull, really. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, so there you have that. And, and I mean, archaeologically speaking, I mean, like, overturned yeah. ships were like some of the first houses yeah. ever built so yeah. you know <laughs> yes yes from like the viking era and various like, even before that 
like the yes. Phoenician era. Phoenician era. Yes, that's right. By the way, it's only a part of the house at this point. The whole is incorporated into the larger uh, house structure that is, uh, you can see the facade. It looks just like every other house from the street, but most of these houses in San Francisco, the majority of them uh, in, in the days of the gold rush when they were just crashing ships into the right. San Francisco uh, coast by the, literally by the hundreds, that's when people, the majority of people would uh, be, their homes would be built from these overturned ship hulls. And some of them got integrated into the structure and most of them were totally demolished, but there's still, you find others like mine, an example like that. But anyhow, go on. Yeah. Uh, definitely right i mean you don't literally have one of the bog ships but it's like the same idea like they yeah like what you were just saying they basically crashed it into the because i mean people some people who weren't didn't get the california history don't realize like california was basically empty until the gold rush and then you had like literally millions of people just coming in here yeah uh, to the point where these people paid for the entire ship and just like you said just left it just abandoned it yeah because there were enough people to pay for it Yes. Well, beyond that, it and was... Uh, they came to get rich and yeah. various things. Yeah, and, and, and beyond that, it was uh, when they paid for the ship, uh, the, the reason that they crashed it, because obviously people might sensibly ask, why would they do something so drastic? Uh, it's because right. the, the harbor was so full of ships that there was no room for the ships yes. to berth or to moor. So they just crashed right. them against the coast. Literally, if you see the window, quote unquote, in the hull of my the overturned ship that's incorporated into the back of the house, the, the window, quote unquote, or the sunroof, so to speak, that, that's the hole that was put in the hull when they crashed it against the coast, uh, the rocks of the shore. So, um, you know, I'll put up that picture again sometime soon. It's, uh, I'll see if I can find it in my files. Uh, right. You know, but anyway, I have some um, interesting breaking news coming in, apparently. So it looks like we're under a cyber, a worldwide cyber assault, it seems. Okay. It yeah. says the Tokyo Stock Exchange temporarily suspended all trading, citing problems with the system that distributes market information. This was like less than a minute ago, so it's like obviously developing. But um, someone else, at the, like I was at the vitamin store the other day, and she told me her system wasn't working because all of Microsoft got hacked. And they're basically like almost all businesses that use Microsoft as a service were offline. Okay. So it seems pretty uh, alarming, I'd say. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. And I, I and, really. And this has been yeah. predicted by people, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Shout out to Miguel Andujar, who's mentioned it. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's. Uh, could be getting pretty sketch. <laughs> Let's just say that. Yeah, it, it's uh, uh, James. It says and earlier that, when oh, we were trying to figure it out, it like uh, when we were trying to figure our things out, like it was even really bad connection, super bad. Yes. Oh no, it was horrible. The, uh, and when I first called Derek, we kept uh, breaking out too, and uh, right. and uh, we're lucky to have Selena Khan able to hang on with us because of the original problems right. we had with the connection there. We're very fortunate. The, the funny thing Jameson said was, uh, "Hope they don't crash the game world." Yeah, of course. To most, uh, they'll to most... leave that up. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they'll leave that up. Keeps people distracted. Yes, well, not only that, it's what they're all part of that world, no doubt. I'm sure most of these are gamers who are part of the hacking. This is what hackers do, right? They game. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, that is true. Yes. Yeah. So uh, please, uh, it, it, thank you for reporting that. It confirms. It, it, it contextualizes the horror that was today. Uh, and um, but. Right. Uh, uh, I mean, if it's starting to hit financial markets, I mean, that's not voting well at all. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, fortunately, Especially in Japan, that's like running the world's economy at this point. Yes, yes, or a large part of it. Yes, I know. It's uh... It's funny because I saw, yeah, I saw this, uh, one of the um, articles that came out and it said Japan lost 60,000 jobs and it was like a big deal because of coronavirus. And I was just thinking to myself, like 60,000 jobs? Like we lost millions, like well, tens of millions. 50 million, 50, yeah, 55 50. million, 55 million at the high end. So it's, meanwhile, yeah. in Japan, they lost 60,000 and that's a big deal. And I was just like, oh my God, why am I stuck here? What yes, thank you, thank <laughs> you. Oh my God. And and the horrible <laughs> thing up. is that Brendan Zogit is lucky. He's lucky to have a job and yet it's it's horrible. It's right. a horrible job to be, you know, you don't feel lucky. Yeah, I'm lucky to be, yeah, like uh, enslaved. Yeah, it's nice. Do, uh, tell us about the DMV. Were you able to take care of that? Oh my god, I don't even want to get into that. I, <laughs> the lady laughed in my face. She oh laughed. shit. I told her, I was like, this is really important. Like, I can't get my car impounded. Like, I need you to remove the penalties because, like, I basically haven't been driving as much for the last six months. Like, and I, the, none of the offices were open. And I was like, this is how, like, a bureaucracy is, or is this how they're supposed to treat people, you know? Like, serve the people. And she laughed. Like literally was like, ha ha ha. And I was just like, oh my god. Like, you fucking bitch. 
<laughs> oh shit! Uh, like you know, basically, she was saying like, you know, you really think that's what a bureaucracy's for? Like laughing at my face. Yeah. <laughs> look, I'm I'm trying to look around for for current events to analyze, <laughs> and uh, I can't believe what I'm seeing uh, on 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 this week's issue of the New Yorker. It says the yeah. students. The students left behind by remote learning. And I'm thinking, fuck, they ain't missing shit. Tell us about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, those people have it good. <laughs> They'll learn more just sitting at home, like, watching YouTube at this point. Because <laughs> it's like not being able to go into a classroom, it just removes, it just makes it so ambiguous. Like, you might as well just read, you know, just watch. Because half the stuff they're sending us is just off YouTube. It's like, she's like, here's your required videos. And I went through all of them, and it's just like, stuff that i'd seen before and just it was just stuff off youtube that like it teaches you the concepts quicker but it's not it's not anything that you should pay to get educated with you know it's just silly <laughs> yeah so like they're not missing much yeah oh, don't worry about your kids if they're out of school like they'll pick it all back up yes hopefully if it ever comes if they ever go back in so yes all right yeah. So um, please keep going. Uh, tell us what's uh, what's going on. And um, they, yeah, honestly, we we we're officially starting the show, and we're starting it with Brendan Zogit with what little time he has to grace us with because he has to go back to slaving away. And what do they have you doing? Oh, I don't want you to live the horror, but I, I you know I am curious. What do they have you doing tonight in particular? Or is it just everything all the time? It's just whatever they want. It's just like you're. I'm like Save Mart's bitch, basically. Oh God, that's awful. Yeah. Oh. It's like if if yeah if they can't close the deli then I go in, you know it's just if I don't close the deli then I'm ringing up people, and it's just, it's not fun but it's like it's a job so I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yes. not too bad though. Okay, I'm glad to hear compared that. to some, what some people have to do, you know, it's like, shouldn't complain too much. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, yeah. and, and, and so uh, keep going though. I mean we we want to hear. Uh... <laughs> Selena said TV on this. I, I saw that, yeah. Yes. What she sent to me, she was like, give me some more info. And I was like, I wish I knew. The Japanese took away that breaking news banner. So uh -huh. it must be pretty bad. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, it says Tokyo Stock Exchange halts all trading. Oh, citing shit. problems with the system. Yes. So yes. that's... um. Super bad news. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, uh, it, it, and uh, well, you know, fortunately, uh, you and I have nothing to lose. We have no money to invest. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. Yeah, That's what I, yeah. So we just watch it with a detached eye while the world falls <laughs> apart around us. Uh, among the right, three, honestly, part of me hopes the. Something yeah. collapses, so I don't have to pay back any of my loans. Like the whole thing. I, I, I reset hear you. everything. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I, I, I hear you. It's, it's one of those situations <laughs> where, you know, uh, for you and I, there's no place to go but up. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. but uh, I was so, telling that to someone. I was like, ever since coronavirus happened, like, I've been more chilling than before. Like, But it's just because we were, already, like you said, it's like, there's you couldn't go any lower. So it's just like, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> and uh, so when it, when it, when it comes to... Uh, yeah, your your life. Uh, catch us up a, a bit on that, as well as aside from uh, what you were talking about archaeologically, in terms of your uh, personal life, uh, with the few minutes you have with us, uh, give us a kind of hint as to some of the struggles you face, or is that just reliving the horror again? You, you can talk about anything you want, really. Oh, it's just constant like horror after horror. I mean, as with <laughs> everything, you know, it just goes good and bad. But um, mm -hmm. like uh. I got to actually see, uh, this is an interesting story, I'll share uh, like some positive stuff. I saw, for the first time ever in my entire life, I saw what's called like a great horned owl. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I've been taking night walks for like, you know, for years and years since I was a teenager. And like, this is the first time I've seen one, like full fledged, like doing her hunting. Mm -hmm. And it was like the most beautiful bird, one of the most beautiful birds I've ever seen. It was like over a foot tall, just like beautiful, like the feathers on the head were you know that when it's called a great horned owl it's because it has like these feathers that look like horns and massive eyes like beautiful beautiful form uh it also has a name called like the cat owl because it, it almost looked like a cat like perched on top of it was like a goal post you know like a soccer goal post and she was posted on top of it and it looked like a cat you know i was like thinking you know is that a cat or so yeah. i went and like got closer to it and she like spread her wings and flew into the darkness and it was it was beautiful. It was very silent. Like owls have like completely silent flight, which is just amazing and just super swift, fast. Like one of the fastest birds I've ever seen. Extremely fast. 
it was almost as if it like dissolved into the night sky like she just went into the darkness as opposed to flying over it it was just, like inside so owls are very special I've, uh, you know I take that as a very auspicious sign you know yes uh, you, know, you don't see them very often because they're they're extremely nocturnal and secretive and hard hard to actually locate so just seeing her was amazing and uh so that was good and then the geese like the geese are still around i think they're waiting um, a little bit longer to go up north because it's still and that's another crazy thing we're in september and it's like almost 100 degrees still yes including these fires which is super abnormal even for sacramento like by this time it usually starts calming down but um you know here we are yeah yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's been a, a nightmare, and uh, that's Ouch. because of yeah. yeah, it's that's a uh, climate change, and uh, it, it's hard to believe anyone even denies it at this point. Uh, so, uh, right, yeah. clearly something's up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, say the least. Yes. Yes. And uh, in terms of uh, what about your friends with the uh, Yu-Gi-Oh uh, decks? When uh, you were running that campaign the other night, uh, you were dealing with somebody who had a much more expensive deck than you. I mean, how's it? It was like twelve hundred dollars, or th it was more than that, like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars worth of yeah cards. Yeah, and and, and how's it? You don't have uh, that that kind of aside from the fact that you don't have the money. I would think that just over the years you would have accumulated such. So. It's like because there's newer newer sets that come out and stuff I gets see. you know recycled and banned. Like you could make like a comparable. I could make something comparable, but you know it takes strategy and various things. But a lot of like the main cards you need, because like they've been changing the rules lately and doing different things. Like a lot of the main cards you need, like you actually have to pay for them uh, because they have, they don't reprint them very often. And like you know, it, it's like levels. You know, like you can there's levels to it you can get you can spend a hundred bucks or you could spend a thousand but the person i was playing against like he sold his whole collection just for that one deck so it's like wow. yeah it's like it just depends on how you want to play like do you want to have a collect i'd rather have like the collection and for me it's more like nostalgia and you know from when i was a kid i've had these same cards and so for me it's more nostalgia play there's other people that are more competitive so you know it's that's what makes it interesting you know there's a lot of options <laughs> Yeah. yeah it's not just like a you know for me video games it's like like when you pay to like nowadays it's all pay to play like microtransactions so like i would never even start playing a video game it's just you know i was doing research and the people that make gta 5 like they're making like 20 billion a year mm -hmm. off just like microtransactions like basically scamming people because they release new stuff and you have to pay a million dollars and in real life you actually have to fork over cash Otherwise, you have to play for 10 hours, and it's just like, it's basically like a racketing scheme, a racketeering, you know, scheme, so that's why, uh, yeah. when it, you know, it sounds expensive to play $1,200 with the Yu-Gi-Oh!, but at least you have the cards to look at and enjoy and, you know, be nostalgic about or whatever, you know, it's, for me, it's more tactile, I prefer that kind of system, right. you know, mm -hmm. than just paying like $1,200 for a fake Ferrari inside of GTA you know? <laughs> and, and then showing uh, like I have a friend like no disrespect but he always like oh look I just bought a Ferrari and I'm like thinking to myself like really like, that's you, a, that's you spent pathetic. 10 hours just to buy that like that's, come on that's, that's <laughs> sad that's sad but that's how most people live nowadays see like people are probably going to get pissed because a lot of people probably play that game but like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's silly I mean to me just to me it's silly like that yes. It, it, but definitely, it takes away the fun of it, you know. Yes, yes, right. and uh, that's my gripe about the video games. Right, right, yeah, definitely. Uh, so, uh, so, so, do go on. Uh, it, you, do you have to eat now, or or what? I, I mean, you should be eating sometime soon, right? Or, um, I mean, uh, or what? How much time do you have? Well, yeah, for this? yeah. I have a few more minutes, like five more minutes or so. Okay, and uh, I was just gonna review. Like, uh, there was something else I wanted to bring up. Let me see if I can please, watch. yeah. Let's see and the drum the, the drum biden debate was just so bad i mean I it's, it's, so stupid. it's like i knew that was gonna happen like did anyone think that there was gonna be a real conversation like i don't if you thought that i'm sorry for you yes oh yeah. my god obviously there wasn't gonna be any kind of real progress uh let's see uh oh this is an interesting study uh it says the neanderthal gene increases coronavirus risks Possessing Neanderthal genes can increase the chance of suffering severe 
suffering a severe form of COVID, a new study has shown. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, the European or Northern European peoples have um, a higher chance of having the Neanderthal gene. So Holy shit. Probably why the Germans are reporting about it. Okay. Interesting. Let's see. Uh, let's see. And, uh, hmm. yeah, I lost the article I was looking for, but, you know, that's just some... Oh, that's that's another thing I wanted to bring up with you, Douglas. It's mm-hmm. like, uh, I was listening to NPR the other day, and I was talking about how Trump's most valuable property he owns, mm-hmm. right? It's, uh, it's some kind of office building in San Francisco, and it's on five, it's 555 California Street. Holy and, shit. Yes. And inside of it, he rents to literally an arm of the uae government or something or united arab emirates yes yes and so uh ever since they purchased that spot or started renting from him he basically gave them more deals and you know it correlated directly with the israel deal and just like it's so just incriminating like it's you know it's crazy (laughs) oh god Uh, he's basically like a you know a railroad baron that's running our country or whatever you yes know, just doing whatever he wants business wise yes oh my god and all these people are trying to expose it but like no one cares like no one listens yes so, oh yeah. here we it's, are it's true it's true and and uh you, you know and now his tax returns have come out and he he pays almost no taxes and of course none of his followers are going to care they'll just say oh that's why he's a smart businessman even though it proves right, exactly. that he's a terrible businessman <laughs> but go on it it's... right the only way just so people know the only way you could do that is by losing money yes like, thank you anyone who knows about taxes the only way you could pay no taxes by yes. writing it off is because you're losing money yes <laughs> so, yes there you go <laughs> oh my god but he, he yeah he he tried to like finesse around that and hide that but whatever <laughs> there we have it was that. like obvious from the get i mean anyone who's followed trump <clears throat> since before you know has like known that yes yes so. and uh of course following him is depressing so it's not like we're following him uh, well i mean since like the yes. days of the apprentice and stuff you know yes, so, yes. Well, like he's obviously like yeah well well he's before he made like yeah. millions off like overseas what is it like licensing like licensing his photos and his clothes and stuff like, yes he's basically just a cheap what is it called like you know yes uh he's just well he's just a con artist it's james yeah, exactly. in the oh, yeah the <laughs> that room, yeah but yeah. enough anyways enough of that let's see there's possibly one more thing that i was looking up here mm-hmm. let's see uh where are we at here let's see by the way, I do want to mention this for uh, Derek Talley. Apparently, uh, Derek, uh, off the coast of California, maybe, uh, two Marine Corps planes crashed. Maybe you can find out more about that. Tell us what's going on. <laughs> in, you know, okay, uh, I'll look into it. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, I don't know if there were any fatalities or if so, how many. Um, Derek will check into that and find out for us. Um, but... Uh, yeah, bad news from India, so it's no surprise yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's all. Oh, yeah. this is sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to bring up something a bit better before I left, just, just to make it more, uh, you know, Palatable. engaging. But this is what I was going to ask you about, Douglas. Like, do you think Azerbaijan versus Armenia is that like a? Is there a chance of conflict there? Because Turkey's getting involved, Macron's getting involved, and of course Putin's getting involved. Right. So uh, it looks like there's this is the fourth day of clashes between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. Yes. Azerbaijani forces stepped up their offensive on Wednesday, and that area lies in western Azerbaijan, but it's populated by ethnic Armenians. And then it just goes on, you know, like the the various presidents were calling, you know, all their allies. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of what they were putting out was very bluster, blustery, very warmonger, or not warmonger, but they were basically saying we're not going to move an inch and the other side was saying we're not going to move an inch and we're ready for anything you know so to me that could be probably one of the flashpoints at our current moment yeah yeah well uh, it's definitely something to uh, watch out for this is a watch this space uh 
uh, kind right. of uh, phenomenon. Uh, it, it's it, honestly, it's been going on forever, and um, the only way it will end, of course, right. will be if uh, one side or the other is uh, wipes the other out. So all we can hope for is a balance right. and a kind of demarcation. Uh, honestly, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh region and the Armenians have my sympathies. Uh, they're a, one of the original Christian populations in the world, and uh, their uh, history of persecution is uh are the azeris are they like islamic i forget the, exactly the they is uh, well the aren't. azerbaijan is um is islamic but you know the ones that were um, part of the soviet union for a long period of time they're islamic in name only it's kind of like you know yes. a lot of uh, russians are like christian and it's more like it, at this point most russians identify with the orthodox church only as a form of nationalism it's not like they're really uh believers uh, right. they, as a matter of fact this is why they were uh uh, basically uh, exercised or uh, excommunicated by the, uh, the uh, exarchate in, um, in Byzantium. And so uh, with that, uh, it, it's almost as if they have their own church now. It, it's like the Church of England. You know, the Church of England separated yes. from even the Protestants and just made itself a national church. That's what the Russian Orthodox Church is like. The Azerbaijanis are the Azeris. They're um, Islamic, but they're very secular in their behavior. And um, that's fortunate because if it weren't for the Soviet Union kind of occupying them and rendering them very secularized, then they would have fallen under Iran. They would have been under that mulocratic uh, regime and it would have been terrible for them. Many of their yeah. people suffer under Iran occupation, and uh, that's where Eden is, where, where they've located Eden definitively, is in that Azari region of Iran. And uh, in terms right. of. Right, and then it's interesting because in Revelations it talks about uh, basically, oh, the final whatever, you know, the apocalypse, the final war basically will start in the land of the first light, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's hard to say where that is, but that would be a good or one of the criteria would be like, you know, where humans first developed, where agriculture first developed, where Adam came from, you know, so it's interesting. Yes. That that area is very fought over. Yes, yes, very much so. And uh, so it, it's, uh, it just makes sense. There's a kind of uh, a hideous sense to it, of course, the battle over uh, the area around Eden. Uh, yes, so uh, exactly. aside exactly. from, yeah, yeah aside, from, aside from that, the, the important thing to bring up as a bit of trivia here is that the Mahmoud Akhmani Nijad, who was the, uh, the fire eater who was uh, dominating Iranian news for the longest time, he's actually ethnically Azari. So most Iranians... Right, they like hated him or something. Like, I'm pretty sure he doesn't even live in there. Uh, there well, it, he, he does, but it, what most Americans didn't understand in the West was that people in Iran who were not part of the mulocracy despised right. him. They were just tired right. of him. They thought he was just a, you know, just a jerk. But uh, all the rest of the Arabs who were Islamic, who were not Iranian, these are ethnically totally different people. Iranians are not Arab. And, uh, but the Arabs right. in the, like, uh, Palestine and other places, they all loved him because they all thought he was giving it to the man every time he went on one of his Judeophobic rants. So just so people right. get a bit of the trivia there. So uh, anyhow, so do go on. And uh, Right. Oh, I'm about to drive back to my uh, job right now, so oh, God, I'm running so out sorry, of time. I ahead. wish I could stay longer, though. I wish you could, too. Uh, 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 to, so did you get a chance to eat anything? I hope you're eating something during your lunch. Yeah, I, ha I brought my snacks, yeah. Okay, really. all right then. All right, love I'm like you on like a liquid diet at this point. Oh, so God. It's hot and dry. It's like you can't even eat a full meal. Oh, God. Oh. And the smoke, too. Oh, God. Sorry. Oh, that's <laughs> well, love you dearly. Like a son. Uh, okay. Hugs. Take care. All right. I'm glad you're on air. You okay, guys have you. a good evening. We and, couldn't uh, have done it you. without you. Anyhow, thank you so much, Brendan. We could not have done this without you. Thank you. Yes, no problem. All right. Have a good evening. Many see blessings. Hey, see you later, Brendan. Yeah. Good evening. Yes, nice talking to you. Derek, good luck. Hiring Divine's with you. Have the, I'm, I think you should. You're probably excited to be back at work. So, I definitely feel it. Yeah. Yes. So, it, yes. And, have and, a good one. And say goodbye to our listeners as well as Selena and Jameson, of course. Yes. Good night, JMO. Good night, Selena. And uh, good night, the listeners. Like. Yes. Thank yeah. You. Good Enjoy night, Brandon. Evening. Thank you. Right, thank yes. you. Oh my God. Okay, I'm gonna shut the call. Yes. All right. Okay. And um, thank you. That was uh, Brendan Zogit who made it possible for us to be on tonight. We could not be on tonight without Brendan. He uh, actually helped me adjust to the new format, which is otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, 
you know, like Selena says, don't dwell on the negative. I'll just get used to it. But honestly, uh, you know, why fix what's not broken as far as I'm concerned? But um, let's uh, get started tonight by, we'll do the usual. We're going to start with a, aside from officially opening uh, the bandwidth for burning uh, when uh, Brandon arrived, we are now going to get a kind of personal update and uh, a medical status and work update from Mr. Derek Talley, who will catch us up on his life, after which we will... Uh, turn towards uh, Selena Khan to uh, introduce her day and what's what's going on with her and then kind of say hello to Jame and Jameson uh, before we uh, go into a roundtable mode so I can take a look around the internet and find out what there is to analyze aside from the debate which I, I'm sure will be inescapable and I'll just have to address that. Uh, so um, Derek, uh, do me a favor and uh, bring the bandwidth while I uh, just go for a quick uh, restroom break <laughs> and I'll be back in about you know seven minutes at the longest and uh, I'm sure you can handle it uh, throughout that time and beyond uh, but let people know uh, how special your day is tomorrow early in the morning and that you'll be leaving us early tonight but uh, you know let us know approximately the time you'll be leaving and that the phone will be left on and you'll be charging it and the call will be riding on your phone again for tonight uh, and uh, so catch us up and the stage is yours thank you Okay, um, yeah, um, it's been, February 10th was the last time, uh, Fe well, actually February 7th was my last day at work, and I started my cancer treatment on February 10th, and I've been off of work ever since, and um, I've just been relaxing, recovering, uh, hanging out with Douglas and the crew and everybody, so that's been fun, and um, I've been doing some constructive stuff, you know, but... Uh, there's, there's a lot of time wasting involved, but that first five months that I was off, um, I really couldn't do anything and I couldn't, I couldn't eat and everything. So these last couple of months, um, I've been building my strength back up and tomorrow it's time for me to go back to work. So tomorrow when I go back to work, they're not going to put me in the truck right away. Uh, I have some safety classes I got to take and we take our safety classes on computer and so I'm going to be doing a lot of computer work tomorrow, catching up on a lot of the uh, safety updates and our and our safety classes. Then on Friday, uh, they're going to put me with a driver trainer, and I'm just going to drive with a with a driver trainer doing a ride along and everything, seeing if I still got the skills after eight months. I mean, even when I'm working every day, well, we have a driver trainer ride with us every six months anyway, um, just just as a pre precaution to, you know to critique our driving skills. So it's about, I'm, I'm overdue for a, a ride along with the driver trainer anyway. So on Monday, I'll be back on my own and back to driving and it'll be back to working as usual. So I'm looking forward to it. So they're looking forward to having me back. Um, it's a good place to work. So really no, no complaints about, you know, whenever I show up, when I, during this time that I've been off, whenever I showed up to work for any reason to um, do some paperwork or just, you know, up, keep the keep everyone updated on my status, you know, everyone's been glad to see me. So um, I'm be, I'll be glad to go back. So I was looking at some stuff in the news here, just catching up. But I, I didn't watch the presidential debate last night because um, I forgot that it was on. But then once I was scrolling through Facebook, um, I, I started seeing people commenting about the, the debate in real time. And um, so then I was reminded that it was on, but I just wasn't compelled to uh, look. I figured I'd get the highlights later on. But here's something that I got in the news that i um, not really surprised about. It seems like to be a, a ongoing type war these you know between the people that call themselves the left and the people who call themselves the right which they're all interchangeable if you ask me but in this uh this particular article says Kyle Rittenhouse to sue Biden over white supremacist campaign ad Kyle Rittenhouse is pursuing a libel case against Joe Biden and his campaign after the former vice president included the 17-year-old in a Wednesday campaign advertisement suggesting he is a white supremacist, despite the Anti-Defamation League finding 
no evidence he was connected to any extremist movement. So um, that's that's the crux of it right there. They said the ADL said there was, and this is the Daily Caller. The ADL said there was no evidence that Kyle Rittenhouse was connected to any extremist movements. So, well, if he wasn't then, he is now. So. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, so, uh, um, go and on. I, I had the story of, on, the, on the Marine plane crash, yeah. and I knew, you, I knew you had to take a break for a second, so I was actually saving that once you got back. Oh, go on. Yeah. Please. Uh, two military planes made contact during mid-air refueling, um, and then they have uh, some audio here. So this is from um, DesertSun.com. So DesertSun.com, they actually have the audio. Uh, I need to see if I could work on actually paying, playing some audio and having it um, show up on the, on the show. But I'll read the article here. But it's crashes involving two aircraft uh, participating in military training exercise over Dharmo on Tuesday afternoon resulted in multiple minor injuries and at least one hospitalization. None of the injuries were life-threatening and the confirmed hospitalization involved the pilot who was ejected from a Marine F-35B jet that reportedly crashed near Salon City. I don't have a count, but I can say there's no injuries above a minor injury, said First Lieutenant Brett Vanner of the Marine Corps Air Station, Yuma in Arizona. The case of the cash is under investigation. The jet was part of a refueling exercise with Lockheed Martin KC 13OJ tanker being used in a weapons and tactics instruction course. It is described as a seven week training uh, event hosted by Marine Aviation Weapons and Tactics Squadron 1 MAWTS 1 which emphasizes operational integration of Marine Corps aviation in support of Marine Air Ground Task Force. So basically what happened was they were doing some training on how to refuel uh, a jet plane during uh, in an active war situation. So this is where they do the training. Just like when I was um, stationed at Roosevelt Roads in Puerto Rico, that's where the Navy pilots the brand new Navy pilots who were just out of officer candidate school and just out of uh, jet pilot school, whatever they had, had to learn their, you know, how to fly. This is where they practiced their bombing. Uh, they actually practiced their bombing, uh, bombings in Vieques and uh, Roosevelt Roads was a big naval base and it was designed to house Army, Navy, Air Force and Marines. But the whole reason for the base being right there is was for to be a boot camp for the pilots who were learning how to drop bombers, the bomber pilots. Well, when the people of Vieques started complaining about the bombs being dropped on their island, because they were live bombs, uh, they probably weren't as um, potent, uh, but they were, um, they were in fact live bombs. And there was, a, before uh, the, the, the protest took place, the big protest, because I remember uh, Jesse Jackson's wife actually went down there on the island. I think Jesse Jackson's wife actually stood on one of the targets, you know, but um, wow. she uh, on one of the bullseyes where they were where they were to drop the the uh, targets so that they couldn't drop the targets there. I mean, like they could if they wanted to, but <laughs> uh, but, but uh, uh, there was a security guard that got killed. So there was another uh, place that housed um, some of the magazines. And, and, you know, with me being a Marine, uh, one of my jobs, was I had to walk 13 miles of fence line. I also had to walk um, along the magazines uh, that were embedded into the mountain. We called them magazines, but they were real big bunkers that were dug out inside of these mounds in the ground where they kept the weapons for submarines and they kept the weapons for the uh, planes that dropped the, the bombs that on the Vieques so that they could practice, do their practice. So um, there was a security guard that was that went out farther than he was supposed to oh. uh, to smoke a cigarette. Oh. And then there was a brand new pilot who dropped a bomb a little bit closer uh, to the facility than he was supposed to. And those two uh, negative situations combined and, and the concussion 
of that bomb killed the security guard. So the people of the Aikens really started protesting and said, okay, well, we want this to stop. Well, uh, they had a new governor, and it was a female governor of Puerto Rico, and she said, I'm putting a stop to the Navy dropping the bomb on Vegas, uh, in Vieques. So uh, you know what the Navy did? They said, okay, that's fine. So they picked up the, the Navy base, Roosevelt Roads, and they left. And then Fort Buchanan Army Base, which was a reservist army base in, in Puerto Rico, they also picked up a left. And then the other Navy base, uh, Savannah Seca um, in Levittown, Puerto Rico, they picked up and left. So just like that, just because they said, okay, you don't want us to do our, our bombing over here, they picked up every military base in Puerto Rico. And, you know, that was their economy for the most part. Yeah. So now I hear if you go to the, um, if you go to those areas now, uh, they're basically destitute. It's lots true. Lots of homeless, lots of corruption, corruption from the police, corruption from politicians. And there's no money out there. People are dirt, dirt poor. Yes, it's and true. And they love them some Trump. They love them some Trump. You talk to a Puerto Rico man, them Puerto Ricans, they love them some Donald Trump. And he just treats them like shit. Because what? Because when I when I was when I went down there, we had just got finished helping them from Hurricane Hugo. Uh -huh. So Hurricane Hugo, um, I wasn't down there when Hurricane Hugo hit, but I went down there just right after Hurricane Hugo hit, and um, a lot of my uh, fellow Marines that were there, they were they were telling me how they were helping the Puerto Ricans put roofs on their houses again and clean up all the stores and and. Uh, the Marines and the Navy and the Army, Air Force, everybody was out there just hammering away, just like home, like Habitat for Humanity type deal, yeah. just building people's houses and putting their roofs back on and helping them out. Well, this time, uh, with no Army base there, no Navy base there, um, we just pretty much left them out in the dirt, and then we made it to where you couldn't even get the ships into the docks to get the supplies. There were people volunteering ships and uh, volunteering supplies to go into Puerto Rico. They couldn't even get the supplies through Puerto Rico. And it's like Donald Trump. Donald Trump said, fuck them. Right. But they're going to they're gonna try to, they're going to put them back in office again. So it will. They, that's those of them that are, shall I say, so ignorant that they have no idea what's going on. Uh, it's uh, they love his machismo. And you know what it is that they, they look at the, the Fox News and the Fox News tells them because, you know, um, for the most part, the Puerto Ricans are very uh, a conservative, socially conservative people. I mean, I mean, yeah, you got your wild side, but you know, they, for the most part, they they look at themselves as being uh, moral, and um, I'm I'm thinking that they're they're kind of brainwashed by the Fox News crowd saying, well, if you if you're a moral person and uh, you're against abortion and against this and against that, well. You have to vote Republican or else, you know, and then you get you look at the machismo of Donald Trump. Like, he don't just don't give a shit. He's an alpha male. You know what I'm saying? He's got that alpha male kind of uh, vibe to him. So they they're attracted to that. The Mexicans and the Puerto Ricans like that alpha male. Deal. I mean, he's keeping their babies in page in cages. The Mexicans. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. But they but they still want the, the you know, they they're still attracted to that alpha male. Uh, you know, I got some of the the Mexican co-workers that I work with and they'll have stuff like uh, they'll have an American flag and say if you are not ashamed of this country uh, press, press share and fly this flag on your page oh, for God. our country <laughs> yeah they're these Mexicans <laughs> <laughs> self-loathing it's, it's self-loathing yeah, but but go on yes it, it's a and also a real insecurity there's a real insecurity there they're, they're very much afraid to be identified as a foreigner uh in this environment uh the present time is very volatile and and they're afraid of persecution afraid of being deported uh so they uh they, and, and the funny thing is of course even if they're legal citizens it's it's like you said there's an element of that machismo there but please go on continue it's it's a well when i when i lived in colorado springs i know that there was a, a war every year between the mexican mexicans and the american mexicans mm -hmm. i mean they could be related but there, uh, there's a uh there's a there's mexicans that were born in mexico and some of them are not citizens yet. There's a war between them and the Mexicans that were born in the United States. And um, every year in in um, Colorado, I think it's Pueblo, 
mm-hmm. or, or somewhere. Every year in Colorado, they always go to war with each other. I mean, they kill each other. Right. It's war every year in Colorado between the Mexicans and the Mexicans, the Mexican Mexicans and the American Mexicans. And I never understood it. And now that I'm, now that I'm, you know, it's been almost 20 something years since I've been there. I'm now just kind of starting to, oh, okay. I can see, I can see, I can see where this war is because you got some people who, like you said, want to be white so bad they can taste it. Yes. And you got some people who, who still got the pride of their original country. So, right. you know, and, and the thing is, I found out living in Chicago that um, in order to be part of the Mexican mafia, you have to be born in America. Right. I didn't. That's yeah, it. You can't. You, you, I mean, you have to be Mexican, but you have to be born in America. And so um, Chicago is one of the places that a lot of Mexicans try to come to to make their babies born here. I don't know why, but, you know, you, you got Los Angeles and you know, the Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and all that. But uh, in Chicago, because uh, we have we we have wars all the time in in Chicago between the Mexicans and the Puerto Ricans. The Mexicans and the Puerto Ricans don't like each other. Right. And so, but in in the Mexico, you you'll have a family that comes in from Mexico to Chicago, and their number one hope is to have their baby born in America. Even if they get sent back to Mexico, their baby being born in America now makes that baby eligible to join the Mexican mafia, and he can, you know, come big time drug dealer and take care of mom and pa in their retirement. Right. Right. Yes. It's uh, there. You have it. It's all part of a tragic situation in which uh, people are trying to adapt and uh, make the most of what they can in a situation that otherwise gives them no real opportunity for advancement. America is not a land of opportunity. People don't understand that. There's opportunity for people who are born wealthy. There's opportunity for people who have certain advantages. And without even uh, going into something that a lot of people are just going to say is a cheap and easy shot, really, if one is born white and uh, middle class, they, they really do have, or even white and to an extent lower class, they have much more opportunity than anyone who's not. And, uh, you know, and, and people get outraged at that observation, but it's a fact. It's not an opinion. It's a fact. It's, it's simply been proven again and again by statistics. Um, you know, it's, it's take, take, for instance, the idiot who kept messaging you all the while we were exposing him, Zachary Garrett. This motherfucker tried to come on my show to uh, scam some money based on people he said had suffered a home invasion, and there was no GoFundMe. And it's basically uh, a situation in which obviously this was quite suspect. I wasn't going to let him on uh, to ask money for a family that didn't exist. So it could all go to him so he could, quote unquote, give the money to them. That's that's bullshit. And uh, then when I brought up the fact that uh, his whole story was suspect and elements of it uh, I was going into just to add to the absurdity of what he was saying. Uh, When he's talking about this white guy in uh, the the Southwest, uh, one of the four corner states, uh, Arizona, whatever, New Mexico, it doesn't even matter. The situation was bogus anyway. But he says, oh, this, this white guy was, uh, you know, uh, is, you know, suffering a home invasion. And I said, at least the guy's got a home to invade. Uh, you know, I never owned a home in my life. Then he starts coming on to Derek Talley. I never owned a home either. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a difference, motherfucker, because as he told myself, he's got parents who do own a home. So when they fucking die, he's got a home. <laughs> so uh, my parents died. And I had no home. And I would have been homeless. Except I'm in the only city in the world that has a backup system for people like me. And if it weren't for the fact that I was in San Francisco, which is also one of the most expensive areas in the world, it's so expensive that they're the only city in the world that has health insurance for the homeless. They're the only city in the world that gives money to the homeless. And that is something that kept me able to pay my rent until things stabilized. Uh, honest to God, that's the paradox of San Francisco. It's a, it's a, it's a place where they're so rich, they can... You know, the only other place comparable is Marin County, where because they were one of the wealthiest per capita income counties in the United States, they're so wealthy, more than you can imagine, 
they imported homeless people because their problem was they had no homeless. And they said, this is bad for our image because we all look so rich. Uh, people are going to look down on us. So they actually imported homeless people so they could have a homeless community, a little tent city, so they could show off to people how good they took care of their homeless people. That's that's Marin County. I'm not shitting you. That's that's not urban legend. That That's exactly what they did. They paid San Francisco to import some homeless up there so they could just put them in a tent city that's on display like a zoo where, you know, you can actually feed them at certain hours. Literally, people leave sandwiches and all this other shit. And those are the happiest homeless people on earth. And they uh, just live in their tent city and and chill. <laughs> this is like life in wow. Marin County. So they, there you go. Well, you know it. what? Uh, for in Chicago, they do just the opposite. I remember when Mayor Daley was the mayor. And uh, whenever somebody important came to visit Chicago, like the Pope, yeah. you know what I'm saying? The Pope, who was supposed to be, you know, looking out for the home. Whenever the Pope came to Chicago, all the whole, day before the Pope came, all the homeless people would disappear, yeah. never to be seen again. <laughs> yes, yes, Mayor Daly. They would just disappear. Yeah, yeah like there was the homeless. What homeless? There's no homeless here in Chicago. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know that Mayor Daly is infamous. <laughs> Mayor Daly is infamous. That he's he's the guy who actually uh, went on record to say during the time that they had um, the um, uh, Kent State when when the kids were shot at Kent State by the National Guard. It was around that time that Mayor Daley went on record to say, too much education will get you killed. <laughs> That's what he said. And he's famous <laughs> for, for cracking skulls. And, uh, you know, if he could, he would have set up gas chambers for the homeless. He would have said they, they were delousing them. You know, the, and uh, that's what they said in the camps. You know, it, it, we're delousing them, and he would have just gassed them all. Oh, you, are you talking about the first Mayor Daly? Because the last Mayor Daly is the son of the original Mayor Daly. Oh, I'm talking now, about the original. That. I'm talking about the original. I, I didn't even yeah, know. I thought you were talking Mayor about the Daly, original, he too. Sick. Shit, he's got yeah, a dynasty. Yeah, the original Mayor Daly, when he gave his son a job in City Hall, somebody, somebody told him, well, sir, that's nep nepotism. He says, I don't give a fuck. It's my son. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If I want him to get a job, he's getting a fucking job. It's fucked in your nepotism <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> oh, you got to hand it to him. The one thing you could say about Mayor Daly is he was honest. He was honest. He never hit it. You know, I'm a crook. Hey, I'm a crook. But, you know, I've got the guns. I'm big. You're small. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's it. I, I didn't even know his son had become mayor. I mean, like it's a dynasty and shit. Like it's North Korea. Like it's Kim, Kim Jong-un and shit. I mean, I'm not surprised. But, you know, that's that's so fucking why. Why do people in Chicago tolerate that? Is it just because I guess Al Capone, well, he was mayor. He was mayor for like 20 years. I mean, he was like the, that daily dynasty was at Chicago for about 50 years. Because first you had the father who was mayor for for years and years. And then there's a couple of people in between. And then uh, Mayor Daly, the son, Richard M. Daly, uh, became the mayor. And he was mayor for. I don't know, over 20 years before, before Rahm Emanuel, we didn't think he, we didn't think Mayor Daly was ever going to leave. We thought he was going to be the grand old man of, we thought he was going to be like, a, uh, what's the one down there in Cuba? C C Castro, Fidel Castro. Yeah. We yes. thought he was going to be like <laughs> mayor for 50 fucking years. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! It's uh, and it's so predictable. It's it's like uh, it's pathetic. There you go, the machine. I mean, that was the kind of thing. That's what produced Harry Truman. But uh, yes, so obviously, um, what we're experiencing is the third world nature of America, and uh, what what you have is kind of like this. Uh, uh, you know, the fix is in, and it's always been in. Uh, so it, it's going to take some real social dislocation and reconstruction before America really even starts to work. So we've got, um, uh, we're, we're in for it. We're, we're in for uh, what's likely going to be a civil war anyway. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go into the reasons why tonight. Uh, so, uh, you know, during Arc of Narrative, uh, definitely I won't be on too long tonight, I hope, because of course I'll probably be seeing Peter Moon tomorrow, but uh still there we have that um but uh by all means continue whatever else you feel needs to be brought to our attention uh before um you know before you kind of uh prepare yourself to kind of retreat into the gentle night so to speak and uh well, i there, yeah there's a full-blown war in the caucuses rising as turkey vows to help 
as Marjazan take back occupied land. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Yeah, Azerbaijan, yeah, you, you did well. Azerbaijan, yeah, yeah they're going to help Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan take back occupied lands. Um, already, Azerbaijan uh, and Armenia are locked into their worst fighting in the decades in the disputed Noag. You, know, I can't pronounce none of these places. That's okay. Uh, and the Nagorno. Uh, Nagorno Karabakh. Yes. Yeah. Now, only three days into fighting, at least 100 people have been killed, which includes soldiers and civilians on both sides amid tank warfare and deployment of infantry and artillery units. Uh, there's also increasing signs of direct aerial combat, raising the likelihood of a full-blown regional war in the Caucasus, Turkish President or or Guardian says. Er Erdogan, Erdogan, but go on. Yeah. Erdogan shocked on Tuesday with the direct threat of intervention on his um, Azerbaijan's behalf. Uh, he says, Turkey raised the specter of full-blown war in the Flashpoint Caucasus region of Nago Karban and Thursday after vowing to help its ally Azerbaijan seize the disputed territory back from Armenian control. As fighting in the region raged for a third day, Turkey said it was fully committed to helping Azerbaijan take back its occupied land, which the Azeris was driven out during the civil war of the early 1990s. So we have a we have another war that's going on, and we'll see how soon it is before America gets involved. Right. Well, hopefully America does get involved. I honestly uh, think it's very important that America does in this case. Uh, I, I wouldn't usually say that, by the way. That's not something I would usually say about uh, places outside of my native Taiwan or uh, something of that nature. Uh, say, for instance, if uh, China were uh, threatening to invade um, uh, certain southern islands that are contested with Japan or something like that, it would become self-evident uh, where America should intervene. But uh, most Americans are really unfamiliar with Armenia's tragedy. And uh, it, the important thing to understand is that the Armenians were, uh, aside from the black African Ethiopians, uh, the first tr uh, Christian nation in the sense that they were the first people who converted to Christianity as a people, as an entire population base. Uh, and uh, so they're one of the oldest Christian nations on earth aside the Ethiopians. And uh, they are one of the most, they have one of the most tragic histories of persecution uh, at, at far longer than that of the Jewish people in terms of persecution. People don't understand this, but the Jewish people have been around, of course, for millennia and uh, much of their time has uh, been a history, uh, their history has been a litany of persecution, and yet uh, before their persecution uh, is actually um, started, the Armenians were suffering it as well as, uh, as Christian people. So uh, it's one of those things that most people in the world are unaware of, and uh, they, uh, their, their nation was once huge. It was a Christian empire that dominated that, that Caucasus region where Eden is located, and uh, it's since uh, become a landlocked um, little uh, spot of ground where they're holding every inch of ground that they can. And uh, so they really need to be helped in holding that ground uh, by a, any other nation of the West that identifies with Christianity. And uh, this is one of those areas where, uh, in terms of the conflict, there is no need for the Azeri people to be uh, pushing this conflict. Uh, in one of those cases, just from a detached perspective, the, what the Azeri people need to concentrate on is reuniting with the Azeri people who are under Iranian occupation. Half of Azerbaijan, or, or maybe more than half, is under Iranian domination now. And so what they should be concentrating on is uniting with those Azeri people and severing from Iran, which would place the territory of Eden within a totally Azeri uh, shall we say, um, administration. It would, it would place that into, uh, that would be the greatest tourist boon that they could have. They would make more money from that than trying to expend blood on taking Nagorno-Karabakh 
which is occupied by ethnic Armenians. So uh, hopefully this is, would be the ultimate outcome of this war, that it would help sever uh, some of the, or shatter or sunder some of the Iranian occupation in the north. And uh, that, that would be much more constructive. Uh, we don't know where the final uh, outlines of the borders will result whenever any war starts. But uh, with the Turks trying to get involved uh, with the Azeris, um, then hopefully the Russians would get involved against the Turks. Well, then in that case, it, we have to take this on a case-by-case -case basis. I would side with the Russians in that case. Uh, so it, right now, Turkey has a horrible record <laughs> and they've been persecuting the Kurds who are a Muslim people. Uh, and uh, it, it's just that Turkey, uh, is occupying many nations on the Anatolian Peninsula and uh, literally should be half its size, whereas it might need to gain some territories in the Bosporus. But I'm sorry, so go on. Yeah. And, uh, then, well, yeah, you told me a lot more than what I knew. I mean, I'm glad I brought the story up so that you could then, you can then bring some education to it because, you know, I was coming at it from uh, a, a, a point of it being all new to me. Um, you know, not not really paying attention to that part of, of the world or what what's happening over there. But it, uh, but I, abs I absolutely agree uh, when you said they were the you know one of the first Christian nations that um, that as a people um, became Christians because uh, doing a lot of studying in the Book of Revelation, uh, you get the seven letters to the seven churches, which is in Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three. Um, if you look at where those churches are located, it's right there. Uh, Istanbul, Turkey, um, Asia Minor is what the Bible calls it, Asia Minor. And if you also look at it, um, the seven churches, and you look at their location, it's all clockwise in a circle. So you got Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. What about, Those are the what, what, what about Cappadocia? Uh, did you did you say that? I forgot. I, uh, well, that's not what well, that well. Um, yeah, that's mentioned in the Bible, but I'm talking about the seven churches. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah specifically about Revelation chapter two and chapter three. Right, but uh, by the way, I yeah. want people to understand that Derek Talley actually has it down better than I do when it comes to actual scripture. <laughs> so credit to Derek Talley. He's the he's the go to man for, for scripture. Uh, and uh, better than I better than I. Uh, and uh, I have my moments uh, when I'll, I'll dredge some memory out of the attic of my mind. But uh, Derek Talley has got it. Uh, this is where he shines. And, and I, I will uh, vouch for that. So please, please go on. Yes, it, as you said, um, I, I think this is where people also need a little review of the Bible in the sense that um, uh, people don't appreciate the Bible enough as history. And, and they don't tend to look at it as a as a historical uh, book. They, they tend to look at it more as allegory, uh, metaphor, um, a source of kind of like anecdotes or stories or parables. Parables, basically, is how most people think of it. But uh, it, um, you can give us a little background on why it needs to be appreciated as history, because that, of course, is where we read our future from, is from, is from our history. That's how we understand where we'll go in the future, because history does repeat itself. And... Uh, and uh or rhymes at least rhymes if not repeats so uh yes go on derek continue oh yeah and I, I i do believe the the uh the uh prophecies in the bible and before i really talk about something i really like to go in depth and, re and really study on it but there's something that you said that um that really brought something home to me uh and, and it's when you were talking about where the um well, the people who are claiming to be Jews now are from that, you know, they're not the real Jews, but they were, they're from that same area, Turkey. Yes. Yes. They're uh, from, yeah. yeah. Well, when you, when you read, um, Revel so I don't have the Bible in front of me. I'm going off of memory, but I, I remember it pretty good. Uh, and Jesus letter to the, uh, church in Smyrna, he, he tells them about those from the synagogue of Satan, those that say they are Jews and are not. So, um, you know, the, the, with the emphasis being on synagogue of Satan, people would say they were Jews. But when he talks, he also brings it up again when he's talking up to uh, to the church in Philadelphia. But he says three words that he doesn't say to 
the church in Smyrna. When he's talking to Philadelphia, he says, those that say they are Jews, but are not, but are but do lie, but are from the synagogue of Satan. So it leads me to believe he's actually talking about two different groups. So, so when he's talking to the church in Smyrna, he's talking about people who say they are Jews and may in fact be uh, Jews, but uh, because of their disbelief and because of you know their re rebellion against God, he's saying they're not Jews. But then again, when he's talking to the this, uh, the church in Philadelphia, he said, "So those who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie, because they're from the synagogue of Satan." He says those three extra words, "but do lie." Now you have a group that says they're Jews, but they're not. But they're actually lying about being Jews but they're still called the synagogue of Satan. So people look at that synagogue of Satan as being one group, but I'm thinking that the synagogue of Satan um, may be multiple groups, and some of them say they're Jews, and may may or may not be genetically Jews, and some say they're Jews, and they know that they're lying. Yes, thank you. I mean, that's so important. And so that people understand that we're not promoting Judeophobia, here, what uh, the, the biggest problem is it, with a uh, population base as uh, persecuted as the Jews were and as scattered as they were, dispersed uh, to the four corners of the earth in the diaspora, which is the, the population shift across the continents, uh, then you had ample opportunity for many people to claim that heritage that uh, we're not genetically of that heritage. and. Um, so that people understand this, uh, Arabs and Jews are both Semitic. They are genetically indistinguishable. Uh, this is, goes back to, of course, Isaac and Ishmael. Uh, Isaac and Ishmael were brothers, and it is Ishmael who is looked upon as the founder, the founding father of the Arab nationality, of the Arabic uh, branch of Semitism. And uh, since the Arabs are much more numerous, and much more populous, the term anti-Semitism, as monopolized by the Jewish people or people who claim to be Jewish, is extraordinarily offensive. It's uh, because when you use the term anti-Semitism, you're really saying anti-Arabism. And uh, so we, in terms of someone who is uh, fearful, loathsome, uh, or uh, hateful of the Jews, the correct term is Judeophobia. This is why I, I always disambiguate. And yet people are still using that term anti-Semitism, and it's an abuse. It's an abuse of a term. Uh, but uh, to give you an idea of where we're at uh, with the concept of the Jewish identity structure, what uh, our man Derek Talley is referring to is the Hazar peoples. And the they're also known as the Khazar is another pronunciation for it. So it, it's, it depends on how you pronounce it, but it's spelled K-H-A-Z-A-R. It's the same people. And they're a Turkic tribe. They're ethnically Turkic. They were a warrior tribe. And they were converted to Judaism in the days of King David and Solomon and, and, and the real ancient Jewish dynasties. And at that time, the Jewish people aggressively waged wars of conversion, just as you had the, the Christian Crusades and the Muslim Jihad and their concept of holy war. The Jews had their concept of holy war. They called it Holocaust. That was the actual term. And that meant the burning of an entire population, the scourging and the burning of an entire population is a sacrifice to God. Yes, the God, the God that you identify with uh, to extent. And this is why I have made it a point to have people understand uh, you need to disambiguate the Jewish God from your God if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, your God is not the God of the Old Testament. That God is a very bloodthirsty Jewish tribal divinity that demanded the sacrifice of sons, the Holocaust of entire nations. Uh, with the manifestation of Christ, then you had a concept of a new God. That's the God of the New Testament. That is the Christian God. So when people use the term Judeo-Christianity, that is like a ridiculous conflation of terms. And uh, so when you come into 
what we're speaking of now specifically about the synagogue of Satan, then yes, you have uh, from the Khazar peoples a extension into Eastern Europe because when their empire collapsed, they migrated into Eastern Europe, maintained an ethnic separatism of their own demand. Uh, they literally segregated themselves into ghettos. That was where the term ghetto came from, was an ethnic enclave of Jewish people in Eastern Europe. And uh, they would actually demand that separation so that they could maintain their culture. And it was like Chinese living in a Chinatown. And uh, so, and very similar in, in, in many ways. And uh, then what happened was with the dispersal from Europe with the Holocaust as it came to be applied against the Jewish people or European Jewry, then you had a massive exodus almost overwhelmingly from Eastern Europe into what is now known as Israel. And uh, so the person who really did the research on this uh, was a man named Arthur Kostler, a surname spelled K-O-E-S-T-L-E-R. And uh, Arthur Kostler is uh, Jewish. Uh, he was a Jewish author, and uh, he uh, definitely uh, was someone who was not trying to promote Judeophobia. But what he was trying uh, to do was uh, have people understand the reality of the situation in the Middle East, uh, that it was not what people perceived it to be. These weren't people returning to their ancient homeland at all. This was a literally a white settler regime of European invaders setting up a colony and claiming that they were returning home. That is the synagogue of Satan. In that sense, Israel is the synagogue of Satan. That's a, that, that if you don't understand that, you've got no concept of your Bible. You have no concept of reality. And uh, so... Uh, a, reference, a reference with that would be in John chapter 8. Uh, in, in John chapter 8, uh, it, it's in, like I said, the synagogue of Satan seems to be two different groups. Now, in John chapter 8, Jesus ad addresses the Pharisees, and um, they they pretty much called him a bastard. They, you know, they don't believe that he was, you know, the, the son of God. But then when in the argument with them, he goes, I know that you be sons of Abraham. So he confirmed their genetics, but then he turned around and said, but you are of your father, the devil. Then he turned around and because of their heart, because they seek, seek to kill him because they want him destroyed. He, you know, he, he can, you know, he can, he called them, uh, you are of your, your father, the devil. He calls them sons of the devil. So they're not Jews. So in Romans chapter two, um, it said, who is a Jew? And it talks about the person who has their heart circumcised. So, you know, you have you have like a genetic a component to being a Jew, then you have kind of like a religious component to being a Jew because the people that were um, that converted to Judaism once Judaism dispersed across the globe, those people were called proselytes. So uh, those proselytes, you, you read about them in Acts chapter two because they all came down for the Pentecost and that's where the church was born. And you have people from all these different nations, I believe like, 20 something different nations were mentioned as being part of the the first church um the, or the the first church service where Pete, where peter was preaching and the church was born so um you had jews and you had proselytes people who were converted to judaism and um they were looked at as much as being jews as those who were genetically jews while those who were genetically jews rejected the christ the very christ that they were promised uh, because they had their own religious and political system that they created out, out of nowhere so that when their own Messiah came to them that they were promised, they didn't even recognize it. So then, and then, so that's one group of Jews, the people who may be genetically Jews, but they reject the, the teaching of the word. But then you also have um, imposters out there, right. those who say that they're Jews and they're not, but do lie. Right, right. And without, uh, you know, overwhelmingly dwelling on this, uh, it's one of those things that, again, can be exploited. People can abuse this and, and turn it towards a kind of Judeophobic ideology. But uh, that's not my intention. It's not Derek's intention. But to give you an idea of just the kind of machinations that we're speaking of, Israel has a policy 
where they allow anyone from anywhere in the world who's Jewish to obtain Israeli citizenship. That's the policy in theory. That's in theory. Of course, there's the law on the books and there's the law of the land. And the reality is the biggest problem has been with black Jews out of Africa. So there, of course, was an enormous dispersal of the original 13 tribes of Judea. Many of them went deep into Africa uh, and uh, basically are black. And so when many of these black tribes, there was one, not just Ethiopia, where they're famous, of course, for black Jews out of Ethiopia, Ethiopian Jews, but way, way down in South Africa, uh, there's the Lemba tribe, I believe. And uh, it is the Lemba tribe has elements of what they say is the uh, sacred Ark of uh, the Covenant, uh, and which has elements of it scattered uh, throughout the, uh, the world. And uh, one element of it is uh, claimed by the Lemba, who in their tradition are, uh, I have been maintaining this, uh, this artifact and elements thereof for thousands of years. Now, according to the Lemba tradition, their male ancestors were Jews who left Judea about 2,500 years ago and settled in the place called Sena, which was located on the Arabian Peninsula, which would be present day Yemen. And much later, uh, their oral history relates that they migrated to Northeast Africa or Ethiopia. But they're now way down in South Africa. And so when they tried to establish uh, uh, citizenship in Israel, that's so that members of their tribe could settle in Israel, the Israelis uh, were, of course, in you know, just malevolently skeptical. And uh, so finally, genetic tests were done. And dioxyribonucleic acid proved that they were Jewish. So you've got this black South African tribe. They don't just claim Jewish ancestry. So they're not of the synagogue of Sa Satan with a false claim. They are genetically fucking Jewish. Whereas if you test most Israelis... There won't be a drop of fucking Jewish blood in them. One third of Israel is fucking Russian. The other third is like people who are descent from Polish people, various other Eastern Europeans who fled there from the Holocaust, uh, who were Eastern European Jewry as identified as a culture, but they're literally Turkish in their bloodstream. Uh, so the overwhelming majority of Israelis are not Semitic. They are Turkish. So uh, this is why they had this kind of alliance going with Turkey for the longest time. And uh, now, of course, they're establishing other alliances with the Arab world in a front against a united front against Iran. Uh, but uh, you, you can look up about the Lemba tribe in southern Africa with its Jewish roots, uh, the genetic tests that proved it. Uh, and uh, basically, of course, the Jews have their own messianic tradition. They await the Mashiach. Uh, but uh, yes, in, in Christian tradition, they rejected the Messiah, who was the king of the Jews, uh, because he was basically descended from the Davidian line. Now, what becomes offensive here, and should offend you if you're a Christian, is the fact that the overwhelming majority of Jews will deny that Christ was of the Davidian line. Now, this is preposterous, because King Arad, the man who was essentially running Israel under Rome as a satrap of the Roman Empire where they took a local uh, individual and put him in charge uh, of the local ethnic group so that people wouldn't feel they were directly ruled by Rome. They would take some local guy, usually the biggest asshole in the area, and put him in charge. And uh, he would be totally dependent on Rome because everybody who was local would hate him. Uh, they did that with Erod, who was not Jewish. He was ethnically Edomite. And uh, so this Edomite was running Israel and he was seeking to kill Christ. Now this is historically indisputable. <laughs> no one argues. Erod wanted Christ dead. Now, why did he want Christ dead? Because he knew he was a descendant of the Davidian line. And therefore, was the true heir to the throne of Israel. That's why he wanted, if you're a Christian, your God dead. And so the Israelis today, they love King Herod because he built all the buildings and structures in Israel 
that is worth seeing for the tourists. So to them, he's the guy they put on their coins and on their uh, currency. There is an image of King Erod that at some point was struck on modern Israeli coins and currency. I know that much. So the man who tried to kill your God, if you're a Christian, is held up as a national hero in Israel. So this is something to take into account. This is not the people of your God. Yet most Christians in America who are ignorant and stupid and basically the majority of white Protestants in America, they view Israel as the people of God and the nation that is automatically the one that they will do anything to defend and uphold. And uh, that makes them dupes of the synagogue of Satan. So that's been your Bible lesson for today. Derek will round it off <laughs> before we talk. All right. Well, yeah, that I, they, I usually have fun talking this. I'm, I'm like a self-proclaimed uh, Bible prophecy head. But, um, yeah, it's, it's important to know who the Edomites is because remember Jacob and Esau were brothers, and Esau was the older brother. And Esau was the one, the older brother is the one who usually gets the blessing for the, the firstborn, for the Messiah. But Esau sold his blessing for a bowl of porridge. It, um, plus, Jacob was the one that God chose to uh, carry that uh, Messiah line. So there's been a war between Esau and Jacob ever since. And they were twins. So, you know, as far as, you know, trying to find out who's Jewish by their ancestry, um, they, the twins have pretty much the same DNA, you know. But, you know, um, Esau's people went to Egypt at first his sons became the dukes of egypt so that whole that whole area is you know is got some got some good history to learn about so um thanks for participating with this with this uh long drawn out kind of uh bible history uh with me i kind of had fun with it um so is there anything else you want me to touch on before i i turn it on over to the next person Oh, uh, I, I think you've done a, a great job. The one thing I'd like you to touch on is, uh, did you mention that the Marine Corps aircraft, it's miraculous that there was no fatalities. Uh, did, you, did you mention the fact that they were around the Salton Sea, which is this artificial sea created in California, uh, is where those two, uh, I, I like the way that Derek read that, uh, they, they say made contact, which is something you never want to do with arrow frames, which is the body of a plane or an aircraft like a helicopter, is when they say make contact, that's such a clinical way of saying they crashed. <laughs> so, uh, but in terms of uh, their, um, their clashing or crashing into each other, uh, this was going on in, uh, they, they collided, two Marine Corps aircraft near the Salton Sea, which is this incredible artificial sea created in the middle of the California desert, probably the largest artificial sea in the world, I believe. And uh, it was just left to rot. It's like um, a dead sea, like you find in Israel, except with all, without all the health benefits of uh, mineral salts and all that stuff. It's just like, uh, it's really just poisonous, briny, toxic salt. Mm -hmm. It's, it's this, dead, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, did you mention the salt and sea in that? Uh, uh, no, uh, this, this is my first time really uh, get, hearing about it. Well, I've, I've heard about it before that there was like an artificial sea and stuff, but I really, did, I didn't know the name of it or I didn't know much about it. Or was it created by the military? It was created by uh, um, civilian developers and they were going to develop the largest city in California and it was planned. It was an extensively planned out city. They uh, had an entire city uh, street plan laid out where it would have been this enormous... Uh, kind of development that would be an organized kind of sprawl. It would be like a sprawl like Los Angeles, except instead of organic, it was planned, but it never came about. And the city that did exist there is entirely abandoned. Um, you would have to prepare for it because it's like, it's a desert journey. So you don't want to go there without a lot of water, a lot of fuel. You, you want to be prepared. And when you go out into the desert to see it, you can see this abandoned and empty city. There are probably squatters who you do not want to meet. So personally, I would be armed. Uh, but it is a, um, it's a Mad Max road warrior scenario out there. Um, but uh, most people pr could probably not encounter anyone. But it's, um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating place. But 
don't go there unless you're prepared. And um, maybe people would say, oh, I went by there and it was safe and all that stuff. I mean, sure, you could drive through a ghetto too and not get shot up by a gang. <laughs> but uh, statistically, if you keep doing that, ultimately uh, something will happen. Uh, so uh, it, it's uh, another thing that I'll have uh, Derek touch upon if he knows about it is that um, with all of the fires we got going on in uh, California, uh, evacuations are underway with a brush fire that started in Camp Pendleton. So I don't know if you're aware of that. There's forced evacuations throughout the Camp Pendleton housing area. So if you can kind of check into that before you leave for tonight. Uh, that okay, well, I didn't even know that. But one thing I did know, uh, not to alarm anybody, but if you ever seen Mad Max, uh, it took place in 2021. There we are. So. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that, but it makes sense. Yes, yes, that's uh, uh, yes. We're in we're in challenging times. The times are dire. They're fraught. Uh, they're certainly the end times in one sense, at least. Uh, the end of the world as we know it. Um, so uh, definitely, uh, while you look up what's going on in Camp Pendleton. Um, well, I have it right here. It okay. says uh, evacuations underway after brush fire starts at Camp Pendleton. Uh, this is from San Diego. Evacu evacuations were ordered at Camp Pendleton on Wednesday after a brush fire started on the east side of the Marine Corps base, possibly threatening structures. Base officials said on social media Wednesday that the D. Luz housing area and surrounding buildings were being evacuated and suggested that evacuees go to Page Field House. There is a potential threat to structures and large smoke plumes will be visible, officials said in the Facebook posting. The Camp Pendleton Fire Department was fighting the fire, and Cal Fire San Diego tweeted that it had sent firefighters and aircraft to help. The North County Fire Department also said it was providing assistance. So that's what we have on the uh, Camp Pendleton fire. Thank you. And uh, explain to people the importance of why Camp Pendleton has meaning to a Marine, uh, what, what, it's, what Camp Pendleton is about. Um, Camp Pendleton, that's, that's one of our uh, main base, uh, really our first base on the um, West Coast, because the, the Marines was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So, you know, and we were born out of being a security force for the Navy. And um, eventually, as we, you know, fought, you know, America uh, earned its independence and everyone uh, down south, uh, we, we spread it out west. Uh, Camp, as far as I know, Camp Pendleton is the first base that we had to put out west in order to be support for the U.S. Navy. Right. And uh, so thank you for that. And so, so Camp Pendleton is basically where Marines go to train after they graduate from boot camp uh, at the San Diego Marine Corps Recruit Depot. Many of them go for their training at Camp Pendleton. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, it's obviously a very important base, a very large one. I've gone into it before uh, in terms of my own experience with uh, basically the many of the Marines who were there were involved. Of course, there's, there's many Marines at Camp Pendleton. There's, there's literally thousands, uh, but hundreds at the very least were involved with a homosexual pornography ring uh, that I helped expose back in the uh, 1990s. And uh, that was ultimately shut down with the help of many of their wives who were wondering why uh, their, their husbands wouldn't have... Uh, uh, sex with them and uh, so of course that was it was shortly after that or around that time uh, that uh, the uh, Marine Corps Commandant was trying to turn the Marine Corps openly into a uh, male only uh, literally homosexual community because he was saying he would accept uh, Marines only that w were not married you you could not be married to become a, mar a Marine and that and you know what when I was when I was in they they kept saying uh, if the Marine Corps wanted you to have a wife, he would issue you a wife. And uh, they said that to um, a couple of people, because there's some people who, you know, had their little lives planned out. Like, I'm going to go to boot camp, then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to marry you, then I'm going to go do my training, and then we're going to live on base type of stuff. You know, right. uh, people who didn't know how things work, you know. Yeah. So um, but then they would come back, and they would be married and want to know who they turn in their 
marriage license and certificate too and you know all say if the Marine Corps wanted you to have a wife the Marine Corps would have issued you a fucking wife you know it was all like damn you know I grew up on the Air Force base and that you know that was a culture shock to me so that was uh, so family friendly the Air Force is family friendly yeah and so um um but I, ho- I was hoping it wasn't a commandant that I knew, but we were in at the same time. So w- w- was this uh, commandant Gray that said this? Uh, it was during the Clinton General administration. Gray? It was during the Clinton administration. I'd have to look it up. Oh, okay. So this was after General Monday. So when I got yeah. out, um, it was General Monday. So it could, if it wasn't General Monday, then it would have, it would have been had to be in the commandant after him. Yeah, it had to be. Uh, commandant, let me look it up. Commandant, uh, uh, no married man. <laughs> I'll look that up and I'll probably get it just by that. Okay, so Clinton admin, Marine Corps commandant, no married men, uh, unmarried men. Yes, uh, so uh, what happened was August 12th, 1993. Uh, the Marine Corps announced Wednesday that it would no longer permit married persons to enlist after September 30th, 1995. But, of course, it was forced to rescind the policy within a matter of hours uh, after (laughs) President Clinton, as executive commander in chief, personally intervened and said, what the fuck? Are you guys all faggots? That's basically what he said. Uh, So uh, so basically, the New York Times, August 12th, 1993, uh, the Marines want singles only, but they are quickly overruled. Uh, Carl E. Mundy, Jr., the Marine Corps yeah, coming. General Monday, yeah. yes, yes, there we are. And uh, Marine leader contritely admits he aired on singles only policy after rebuke from his executive commander in chief. In a crite, uh, this is August 13th, 1993, New York Times, in a contrite admission of error. <laughs> The commandant of the Marine Corps said today that he was indeed wrong for having blindsided his executive commander in chief, President William Jefferson Clinton, by ordering a phase out in the enlistment of married men and women without first seeking approval from civilian superiors. So he wanted basically a gay force. This is, uh, you, this, it's, there you go. Uh, Ha ha ha! You knew this guy? I, I, I'm well, no, I didn't know him, but you know how we have to memorize the chain of command. And yeah. uh, the, the first commandant that I had to memorize was General Gray. And when I got out, um, I, you know, we had to memorize General Monday. And it was spelled weird. Like, yeah, M-U-N-D-Y. Uh, M-U-N-D-Y. Mundi. Yeah. 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 So uh, something didn't sit right with me about this General Monday. <laughs> He didn't. He didn't seem like General Gray. General Gray seemed like a general's general. Right. right. General Gray was old school. This general. This general Monday. It's kind of seemed strange to me. But by the way, um, our our man Derek Talley is absolutely correct. Um, we had to memorize ranks of the different uh, forces because the Marine Corps is part of the Navy, but it uses the same ranks that the uh, Army and the uh, Air Force use. Everybody uses the same ranking system except the Navy, which has a totally different tradition. But the Marine Corps is using Army and Air Force type ranking systems, uh, that, that, but it has to memorize the Navy's ranking system as well. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you, you need to memorize the chain of command. Uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps, etc., uh, which I did, I just burned it all out of my brain through drugs and dope and drinking and just everything else. And uh, but, but he's right, a good Marine, which I am not, <laughs> would have been would would have that on the tip of their tongue. Uh, and uh, but beyond that, uh, the uh, what what else was I going to say about that? It brought to mind something else that uh, in terms of the different services, when you mentioned the Air Force Base being fr- family friendly. Basically, what Derek Talley is trying to tell you is that the Air Force is a branch of the military or a military branch. I'm sure his father would argue with this, but it's, a, it's, it's basically a military branch in name only. There, there are a bunch of civilians in uniform. It's like a nine to five job. You go to work every morning at 8 a.m. instead of, well, instead of 9 a.m. Instead of nine to five, it's like eight to four. 
and you go to work every morning at 8 a.m. and you come back at home, you know, the regular time. It's it's like it's like you were a civilian except wearing a uniform, uh, really. And um, I, I, I'm sure your father would argue with that vehemently because he was in Vietnam and was on an Air Force base. But you get my point. In general, uh, the overwhelming majority of the Air Force uh, after Vietnam fuck you might as well stay home i mean <laughs> there's nothing you're gonna see you know what i i do have a cousin in law uh, uh a dude who's married to my my cousin and he enlisted in the air force and do you know he is now a marine corps officer how did that so happen? he was, yeah. so he enlisted in the air force i think he went to some kind of um uh took an academy i don't know if he went to the air force academy but whatever it was he was he enlisted in the air force became and, and when, you know, upon uh, getting his degree, decided to go to be a Marine Corps officer. I wonder if I can get him on. Okay. I'm going to see if I yeah, can get him on. Yeah, be happy to him on. Yeah, that would be wonderful. And, and your yeah, father then, again. Then you can ask him, how does that happen? Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> and, and, and your father again, if he, if he wishes to come on again. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, he's um, uh, so so definitely. Yeah, I would appreciate that as well as your truck driving friend, of course, at some point. And uh, so uh, definitely we'll work on that. And uh, aside from that, uh, you know, um, do segue over. I guess we'll we'll um, segue over to James and Reese for a little bit and he can catch us up on a little bit that's going on in his world but uh, thank you Derek that was wonderful definitely appreciate um, it all right well um, um, it's been a pleasure so now ladies and gentlemen please welcome uh, Jameson Reese to the program thank you what's up Jameson hey how's it going everyone Oh, James, and uh, oh, um, deeply appreciated what you said the other day about uh, making some cheddar out of uh, my illustrations. Uh, do take the time to also enter a thought for the individual who I had produced the illustration for, who, uh, for all I know, may be dying. I don't know what's going on in terms of the details of the Taco King of uh, Flint, uh, Michigan, but he definitely needs our prayers, and hopefully he's in a better space by now with some moral support. I, I don't know the details, but I know he's he, he's back that off so uh um but definitely I, I hope things work out for him yeah thank you in my wishes yeah and and we'll be bringing up a little bit more about that what little i can when we give a pack one Mireles a shout out who uh, provided myself a donation and we're um dealing with some of the bureaucracy behind paypal for that uh but i did get his donate donation and i was able to spend his money on what i needed and uh with that we're going to turn towards james and reese who's going to uh Tell us a little bit about, now you've had your Bible lessons for today. Um, uh, James and Reese will give us a little education in the other side. <laughs> okay. But but actually, before you start, James, and bear with me, I'm going to check the live stream uh, and do read out from all these wonderful people. Maria Michaela Gregorich is with us. Mwah. Love you, honey. Thank you for being with us up in Canada. Uh, Daniel Rolla and Brandon Young is with us. So hello, Brandon Young. Uh, God bless you. And um, he says, I don't think Trump is an alpha or or, ha or has any machismo whatsoever. I do agree with you, Brandon. And uh, I like what Brandon Young says. He says, RuPaul has more machismo than Donald Trump. Uh, by, by the way, one funny thing that happened was uh, back in the days when Rand Paul was still a thing, uh, he had some website up that was put up by his fans, and I was interviewed by this little radio station down in Texas during the NFL Super Bowl. So nobody heard anything I said. Everybody was watching the Super Bowl, especially in fucking Texas. Uh, so nobody listened to anything I had said that night. But what was interesting was they had this pro Rand Paul website that whoever their designer was, he must have been a flamer. He must have been totally fucking gay because it was all pastels and it was all this like you know uh, lavender and puke and and uh when i uh, referenced um to that vet veterans administration bureaucrat friend of mine who was retired uh after serving there for a hundred years or something you know over 30 uh um paul mosslander and I said, uh, could you take a look at this website? Because I forgot what it was, but we were saying something about RuPaul. And so I had him reference that website. And when he went there, he said, this website looks a lot more ran. What, what did he say? He said, oh, he said, this website looks a lot more RuPaul than it does Rand Paul. <laughs> and and that, that said it perfectly. By the way, Vicki Johnson, shout out, honey. Mwah. 
Thank you, honey, for being with us. She says, Experian had a global incident yesterday and shut down the ability to pull credit for several hours. Uh, Experian called it a global outage. It was running today, yet so much sensitive information must have been compromised. Thank you, Vicky, for informing us of that. Cathay Sanford says uh, that Brendan Zogit's owl was very cool, auspicious, the cat owl. And um, shout out to Cathay Sanford, wonderful white cat as her icon. And uh, with that, we turn back towards, oh, oh Jameson Reese uh, in a second. Isaac Romero says, loud and clear, Doug. Thank you, Isaac Romero. Definitely appreciate it. And, uh, and thank you, Jameson Reese, for taking care of GRV. Was that another yellow Russian troll bot or or, I'm guessing that was probably Nicole Frolic because they were talking about the show's presentation like, oh, it's so random. <laughs> oh, and I'm like, oh. uh, only another YouTuber would talk shit about that, especially one who was on air. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. And so I, I, have to that. Yeah. I have to conflate that with her. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Wow. And Isaac Romero says he is a twin, so that's interesting information. Raymond Joyce says... Why don't they put a satellite on the fire areas to see if any have been set on purpose as arson? Uh, that's because they don't... They can't see through the smoke. Thank you. There's, they're going to see through the smoke. Thank you. Thank you. And Isaac Romero says, my twin bro was the one who introduced me to Douglas. Oh, bless him. He first heard him on Coast to Coast. All I remember is when Doug talked about World War II. It finally made sense. Bless you. Thank you, Isaac Romero. Uh, and uh, so uh, definitely going to Raymond Joyce says thank you to uh Jamo Reese he says thank you Jameson uh gotcha he says uh yeah, so uh so there we have it um going to turn it over to Jameson now and uh, uh you know uh take it away honestly uh I'm anxious to hear what's been going on in your world are you willing to share a little bit about the female character who's now your icon or do you feel that's uh, kind of personal or uh, oh no. yeah I can share about her she's a work in progress uh her name is Maneeb Ira. It's just some name I came up with out of the blue. Just literally pulled it out of thin air. Um, and uh, at first, you know, I wanted to make her a very intelligent character, but I also wanted, to, but, you know, and the more I thought about it, I was like, I don't really associate with humans that much, so why not make her not only intelligent, but super strong and all this other shit that humans aren't anyway? So what the fuck? I'm just going to go make her, a, you know, a sort of overpowered badass who whose weakness is my weakness, not being able to process what humans, you know, not being able to process communication with other human beings. Okay. So it's going to be quite interesting uh, to walk her through this chaotic world that I've come up with, which is similar to ours. But, you know, I'm interested in introducing some more technological ideas of things we haven't seen before. You know, I'm wondering why with our physics, we don't have the ability to be able to tether something into a higher dimension and go back down into the third dimension, you know, such as, you know, imagine being able to take a tumor out of someone's brain by putting something in the, you know, fourth dimension that, you know, connects to that vector in space time that happens to be that tumor on the person's brain and extract it, you know. So what you're saying is that uh, what philosophers have hoped for for centuries where we would ultimately be able to work on such things as what you're speaking of tumors without the violation of the physical vessel in other words without surgery which is a form of violation and invasion of space in the most personal sense uh, by physically yes. ripping you asunder in order to attempt to help you uh, and uh, that will someday be a thing of the past that no longer exists because we will be able to do that dimensionally in the manner that you have described. I think that that's, that's, a, that's a serious question. It's a valid question. Well, and, the idea and, came from uh, doing studies on cattle mutilations. Um, and uh, also I, I, did some, uh, I did some research, well, more, more like just looked at pictures and shit and, and, and read what they had to say about it on, on uh, mutilations of people in South America that seemed awfully bizarre and that it seemed like, uh, it literally seems like uh, whatever surgically removed certain parts 
did so, you know, they said they did it with laser precision, but it seems almost like they might have pulled whatever out through another dimension, if you ask me. And so that idea got me thinking, well, if, if you can jump up a dimension and go back down, you can take something from anywhere, so long as you have the technology to be able to, um, you know, dial in a certain vector. And now um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, some of the things that Rupert Sheldrake is saying on his website, and I'm starting to really resonate with some of these things about, you know, fields and whatnot. So maybe instead, maybe all we would need to do after, you know, putting, after having something suspended in the fourth dimension in order to, you know, zero in in that particular vector of space time is try to get a signature of its field. You know, it's it's frequency or, or field waves or something. You know. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, yeah. I mean, my question is, I, I I tend to think that we probably have something like this, and if we do, that would mean you would literally be able to store an entire arsenal in hyperspace and pull it down. Pull, I mean, so, so the idea of literally having infinite ammo and things like that would not seem far fetched. Right. Right. No, I, I hear you. I mean, this is all something that will become factors in the future for our uh, civilization. And uh, hopefully we don't have that level of technology available to us because, you know, this 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 kind of government doesn't deserve it. At the same time, that is a terrifying idea. But there's too much that occurs that makes me think that we might. And I sort of think that, you know, we would reach that level of technology if we come to merge uh, some of the aspects we know in arcane sciences with what we know in the physical sciences. Right. Hold on for just a second. I'm going to remove my earbuds, but I'll be speaking while I do that. And I want uh, you to know that uh, to take comfort from uh, the situation as dire as it may be, this civilization, even if it did possess that technology, they're so incompetent, they're so corrupt, they're so short-sighted, they're so greedy and everything else that it really won't help them anyway. <laughs> so uh, it, there's not too much like, fear to be found in that. Yeah. It'd, be like a, it'd be like somebody who, it'd be like a normal person trying to, you know, reconstruct some of uh, Tesla's technologies without any of his blueprints. It'd be like, how the fuck do you do that? Yes, and and beyond that, even if they had the technologies, most people wouldn't know how to apply them, even destructively. Uh, it, it's one of those situations where, of course, there's so much we have lost from the past, and uh, when people uh, turn to the, the past and think of it as far more advanced than people used to believe, they're right. Uh, but uh, what where it goes off the shall we say, where it becomes stupid is where people start attributing that to aliens. And that's, it shows their contempt. Once, yeah. go to, once we go into Atlanta and the people from fucking uh, Venus, the people from fucking uh, Andromeda and all this other shit, it's like, okay, let's, let's just, let's just shut up. You had me, <laughs> you had me at ancient people being more advanced. Thank Why you. do you have to ruin it? You know, thank they you. Always, Thank you. Yeah, and, and 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 I see why they do that though. There's 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 a design behind ruining it. Is because they want they, they want people to get out of thinking that we were more advanced than we are now. Because the the suggestion of uh, us having been more technologically advanced in a way that synchronizes with nature than we are now. The implications of it is that there's a sort of downsampling or degradation occurring. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and uh, go on. You can feel free to articulate on, on these points. Uh, and uh, Well, um, unless you, Unless you wanted me to jump in at that point to say something. <laughs> no, feel free. Go on. No, 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 no. I'm just feeling things out. Um, yeah. Well, what I'm going to say is I'm certain that when it comes to advancement, uh, some of it we uh, do we have incorporated into uh, the arcane sciences, but the problem with the uh, translations sometimes is that the translations would the translations of that older ancient technology would have been made by people who didn't uh, who who no longer understand how it works, basically because they're downsampled, so they wouldn't be able to really get what their ancestors were doing, so. 
they would sort of interpret these technological miracles and whatnot as as, as being gods or, or or all types of things. And so the so the so the issue with uh, arcane sciences is that one has to start to separate out, separate out the superstition from the practical technology. Thank you. Good. And this is something that uh, too often in the modern, uh, especially in American occultism, they don't do. They, they rather tell us about how, you know, Belial met his wife than explain why the sigil works, why we're able to do this, and why we're able to tap into, you know, and, 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 and if you're going to summon him, ask him how the fucking technology works. Don't ask him, oh, well, what is my wife going to do tomorrow? Is she cheating on me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when... But, I but shit you not. This is how some magicians waste their fucking time and uh, power. There you have it. But um, in terms of, uh, say for instance, there's two things I wanted uh, yourself to go into, which uh, you would have a good insight into. Uh, one is uh, the gaming community with the kind of games that you participated in, role playing or otherwise. Uh, aside from what we both know about the community itself, which is quite repulsive, what about it's the? Yes. What about the the games? And uh, in terms of the games themselves, which of these games, like, um, and I'm talking about the more accessible video games that people have played, like Dead Space or uh, Halo, etc. Uh, which of the games do you feel is the best parallel uh, to much of our social situation that we're dealing with? Kind of like one that um, presents. Uh, honestly, I'm I'm one of those people who you would call a hardcore dedicated gamer. What this means is that I rarely, if ever, branch out of one game, uh, and, and unless it's so, I'm only currently playing three games. Uh, one game is Guild Wars Two. That's the fantasy one, where I get to you know make the you know sexy black chick with the big boobs and destroy everybody. <laughs> cool. cool, which is pretty much my fantasy. That's why I make graphic novels. What, what did you I'm... think of? What was the name of the girl who was on The Walking Dead who had the samurai sword? That was so popular. Everybody was just oh, tougher. Man, don't, I don't remember. I, I, my, my, uh, I paid more attention to Walking Dead, the graphic novel, than okay. I did the uh, show. I barely watched the show. Uh, I only saw the show in passing because my father was a fan of it. But I, my, my thing is like, if if it had a comic book, I'd rather read the comic book than watch the show. Right. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, The Walking Dead started off as a comic book. And uh, they, it started off the same way. It started off with a cop who wakes up in a hospital and everybody's gone. And uh, so the, the series, at least at the start, followed the comic book religiously. I don't know how it evolved later or whether it, it continued to do so because the comic book was meant to go on forever. Uh, the zombie story that never ends. Uh, by the way, that brings up something that uh, reminds me of Noreen Helpand. What does... What do you think we should derive from everything Noreen Halpan was sharing with us the other night? What was it that stuck? About the, uh, about the uh, what do you call it? That, um, oh God, what is it called again? Morgellons. Yes. Yeah, yeah that, that has been something mysterious to me. I, I can't help but personally think that there might be some some names in a register of people that they have given this to deliberately. And I don't know why they gave it to them, but I suspect they want to see if the, you know, because it's interesting to have a disease that causes the body to just manufacture, you know, materials that make skin, nails, hair, um, collagen and things like that on its own. Um, but the question is, for what reason would they want to harvest those types of materials, those fibers? Could those fibers perhaps be used in a computing system? In a biological computing system, perhaps. I wonder, you know, I, I maybe my mind is just going out in the woo-woo world, which I often do because I have a really hyperactive imagination. But, you know, if you could, in theory, harvest something that would uh, create a organic technology and you could do it cheap as fuck using a human body or something, maybe even a human corpse, you would be able to manufacture things and make a shitload of money off of literally nothing. Okay. And uh, that is something that, of course, is uh, a potential motivation uh, for uh, spreading the disease, so to speak, or inseminating it in people. I mean, 
I mean that even but that's that's a far fetched reach. That's a really far fetched reach. Honestly, I do think whatever it is is experimental. I think that uh, based on my research, I, it suggests that there's a certain uh, spiroshet uh, used by uh, that's found in uh, Lyme disease. So it's obvious that whatever it is is modified from. It's like a modified version of Lyme disease or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but whatever it is, it does something just completely different. I, I I can't make heads and tails of it. What I can say is about the chemtrails is that I don't quite buy it. I can see I can see them having if they were to make a program to use the chemtrails for weather modification, such as to down downgrade uh, global warming. You're right. It ain't, wor- yeah. it, it ain't working. So it's a waste of money. It's a vast waste of money. It's 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 like them trying to create another TSA. What what would be the point? Thank it's you. just not practical or an economic level. So there there would have to be another way that this is getting to the targets. And the question is, I, I, I was trying to see if maybe there was a correlation between people with a negative blood type. Mm-hmm. And uh, because I was suspecting that this might be a reaction to a certain uh, bacterium that might be something seen in people with a negative blood type, perhaps. But I couldn't find anything where they uh, mentioned in their studies, you know, in, in these uh, very deep studies where they mentioned the blood type of the people. Mm-hmm. They talk about their history as far as what diseases they might have had, what they suffered from, anything but the blood type. Right. That, 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 that I found kind of interesting. Right. Uh, and, and, and that may be an important factor. I, for instance, am fortunate in that uh, my blood type is O. It was always O, originally O negative, is now O positive. And in that sense, uh, I'm still lucky because O has been found to be very resistant or at least much more resistant to contraction of the coronavirus. So uh, yeah. in, in that sense, I'm fortunate. In, uh, in, in terms of uh, what happened with, um, with, with Noreen Halpant, in uh, all respect to her, uh, let me see now, let me check in on her, see if she's uh, available for us to, to, to call. Uh, she'll let me know if uh, she's available, but she probably won't be on with us tonight. And, um, and that maybe that's okay because um, we gave her quite a bit of time and I think what she shared with us was horrific. It was uh, like a horror story. Uh, but, it was uh, also really interesting. Yeah, but... Uh, I, I don't know why the, the, uh, the audience has to excuse me sometimes. I'm not what you would call someone who's fascinated and morbid, but it's just like from... I, I'm, I'm very detached. And because of my detached nature, I could I could look at such things with a sort of medical with a sort of astonishment that the medical student would have rather than a regular person. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And uh, so in her case, what it could be, of course, and we do have to um, express this, there is a um, pathological fear of bugs under the skin. And I'll look up the exact name of the phobia. Uh, <laughs> I, I came across that where they used to think that it was a sort of uh, where they found that where, where people had this sort of fear of parasites being in them and moving beneath their skin as well. And they were attributing that to uh, the uh, what do you call it? They were attributing that to uh, uh, Morgellons for a long time. Mm-hmm. But based on what I read, medical studies show that they have now come to accept it as a legitimate diagnosis. Mm-hmm. That is not connected to psychological issues. Okay. So apparently they've upgraded the status with that, but still doctors are slow to come around because doctors, again, they don't even want to treat uh, people with Lyme disease, and you know that that's pretty odd in and of itself. So I think it might be another one of those Plum Island experiments run a run awry. Well, it'd have to be Plum Island. If what they say about, shall we say, Morgellons is true. Uh, it makes the Plum Island Lyme's disease look almost primitive. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, the one thing I, I know about Noreen Halpan, she has a dermatological condition, and it's a baseline. I don't know what it is. I have seen it before. Uh, dermatological condition of blemishes on uh, skin that manifest. They're not always there. At times they manifest, and uh, so... I'm sorry? Could it be dermatitis? I don't know. 
I, I don't know. I, I, there's several things that come to mind. Uh, primary, cutaneous, amyl, uh, loidosis, uh, exfoliacea. Uh, it, it, at any rate, whatever it is, there's these... Uh, it's, 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 the one thing I know it's not is I know it's not rosacea <laughs> or psoriasis. I know it's neither psoriasis or, or rosacea. Uh, it, it's, uh, it could be vitiligo uh, which causes uh, large irregular patches of skin uh, but huh? but what this might do is it might be exacerbated by a condition known as Ekbom syndrome which is uh, also known as delusional parasitosis which causes people to falsely believe they are infested by bugs on or under their skin um, now, uh, and, and the way victims tend to refer to the invisible invaders is as insects, larvae, organisms, parasites, worms, uh, mostly they just say bugs. But uh, the, um, it, it, that it may not be that. I'm just saying that we have to maintain the open mind to the fact that what she might have is two sets of conditions that exacerbate each other and feed on each other to create a morbid fixation. And, uh, and no, that, that can't happen because, you know, I, I, I can't say that to my, I, I, I can speak for myself. I'm somewhat of what you would call a, uh, oh gosh, hypochondriac, where as soon as I read up of a disease, I'm like, oh fucking no, I got to go to the emergency room. And, and people got to like literally strap me down like, no, Jameson, you don't have this. No, Jameson, you don't have that. Yeah. So, you know, it, it comes with anxiety, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, but, and, and that's the, that's sure, understandable. Yeah. I mean, we're all like that. Yeah, go on. You really will, for a while, walk around believing you have some shit, you know, like, uh, like uh, I don't know, like, like fucking uh, lymphatic cancer or some shit, and, 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 and all of a sudden, you know, you, you, you wind up in the emergency room for something else, and it turns out everything's normal, and you're like, holy shit, mm -hmm. I figured I only had a year left to live. There you, there you go. I mean, I get it. I, I, we're, we're all, we've all been there. Uh, certainly, well, maybe not all of us, but I am. I, I think uh, it's just one of those things that's part of life. Obviously, in her case, things have gone much further. <laughs> that's, uh, the, and the internet has not helped. That's no, the problem. No. So do point out how the internet uh, can exacerbate these conditions to a point where it becomes far worse than it needs to be. Uh, there is this, this thing called information, too much information, mm -hmm. and in the wrong hands, in the wrong context, better yet. Too mm -hmm. much information in the wrong context, and you can start to look at symptoms in like uh, one of those doctor um, websites. And, you know, these could be symptoms that anyone, everyone has had at some point in time, but you look at that and say, okay, I definitely have diabetes. I know I have diabetes. Uh, I, I, I got to go buy a blood sugar level thing. And then you check your blood sugar level and it's normal. It's like, well, holy shit. No, maybe maybe it's too much caffeine drinks, you know. So you, if you're going to get information, you want to make sure not to get emotional about it. You need to uh, read what you're reading emotionally detachedly. Of course, because of the Russian troll mill and the uh, cyber attacks, you want to cite your sources you want to go at the bottom of the web page. You want to see who wrote whatever article. You want to click on the image of that person. You want to learn all you can about them. They say they went to the University of Chickens. Well, where the fuck is the University of Chickens? And you want to Google that shit. And if you see that the University of Chickens was a fucking college made by Donald Trump, you want to say, oh, fuck that shit. They're not going to trust this guy. Yes. I, came, I actually came across a website where I was looking to find out some of the information you stated about the uh, N95 mask and wearing them for too long or re-wearing them, re-wearing the same ones. And this guy had a website claiming to be a doctor. This guy claims to be a like doctor in neurology or some shit. And then he, he has a website where he's saying, oh, COVID isn't real. COVID is caused by... You, you, the coronavirus symptoms are caused by wearing a mask too long and uh, building up uh, carbon dioxide from wearing a mask too long. And I'm thinking, what a load of shit. Thank you. This guy has a PhD. He, he had best 
quit practice right away. Someone had best, you know, bring that up to uh, <laughs> uh, 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 board of uh, I think I think it's the Department of Justice that covers them or something like that. You can just the that. American Medical Association at least, and uh, yeah. so someone needs to look into some of these people out here. the The claims are outrageous. The diet fad claims are equally outrageous. You don't ever want to go on a site for, uh, you know, to learn about, you know, alternative healing and whatnot. That's like natural news run by Mike Adams. Thank you. Yeah. Because I had, I had, you know, followed that site for a while and they had all this shit about, you know, and, 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 and it's not that their information was necessarily wrong. It's that once you, once you start to ha see that political tilt in there, you're going to get some fucked up information. Yes, you get bad information because that bad information is going to seep in there. Um, the the hard part is finding information that's not funded by a company that would have interest in pushing a certain agenda. So it's really really difficult to find anything out there. I say, uh, be your own boss. Mm -hmm. uh, we learn as kids, eat a lot of vegetables. Eat a lot of vegetables. <laughs> Fruits and vegetables mostly. Eat fruits and vegetable mo vegetables mostly. Now, uh, you don't want to eat all those grains. They make grains the largest group because oh, who who funds the food pyramid? The agricultural industry. I, I'm not making this shit up. Right, right. And uh, all those grains, you know, you, you eat too much bread, all that winds up doing is bloating you up and you wind up getting something like colitis or irritable bowel syndrome or a lot of gas. You just, it just fucks everything up. Oh, thank you for sharing that. It's, uh, you know, there's some, some of that. Oh, by the way, you were recommending uh, a wonderful human being who had a anti-cancer diet from the TED Talks to uh, Mr. Derek Talley uh, back in yeah. February. Yes, his name was, uh, I think it was Dr. Lee. Uh, I, I would have to look that up again. Um, but uh, he tells you um, he tells you how to uh, combine certain fruits and vegetables and certain natural oils to get the most out of the antioxidants and how to cook them so that, you know, when you have a meal, you have a very tasty meal. The guy I used to be friends with, you know, he, he, he started to cook like that, and the food he made was pretty good. He, he cooked really well, but uh, near the end of our friendship, he stopped. He started to cook less and less, so I kind of knew something was up. Yeah. And uh, so uh, aside from all of that, uh, it, when we were talking about um, uh, Noreen, of course, and uh, what she was talking about, and back to the video games... Have you seen anything like Morgellon syndrome in any of the video games that uh, is portrayed? I haven't come up with. I haven't, you know, the most of the video games I, I used to play uh, when I was younger were just horror or giant mech robot games where you like natural, you know, shoot up things in your, in the giant robotic armor or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that note, I do have to note something of interest to me. Japan built a giant 18 meter tall robot. Yes, that that's like that, that looks like a Gundam. It is so fucking cool. Granted, you know when they show it moving, they have to show it sped up because it moves kind of hella slow, I guess, right. since they're testing it. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I Japan's gonna have basically Gundam is gonna be real and it's gonna happen in Japan. So why the fuck am I in America? <laughs> there, we, there we are. But by the way, explain to people what Gundam is so they understand. It actually, the, so people understand this. When uh, people think about Japanese cartoons or anime uh, or uh, manga, the comic books, they oftentimes it's a stereotype. It's a, it's a cultural stereotype of Japan is the giant robot. As a matter of fact, there's a magazine dedicated to Japanese popular culture, and the name of the magazine is Giant Robot. I don't know if it's still in circulation, but it just goes to show you what a powerful meme uh, this is, uh, a trope in uh, identifying uh, the Japanese culture. But in terms of uh, what uh, the Gundam was, it was a specific name for what is actually not a robot. It is a giant mobile suit. That would be... Yeah, it's called, yeah. Because the original series was called uh, Mobile Suit. Yes. And uh, Mobile Suit was, was fucking awesome. Uh, the old one was made in like 69, I think. 
But uh, the entire series, uh, the original Mobile Suit is extremely good. Uh, I, I like the original better than Gundam Wing because Gundam Wing seemed like it was more like showing off the robots, mm -hmm. whereas Mobile Suit Suits had depth to it. And the depth was basically a sort of philosophical analysis of how war affects the young and how war affects youth. So we follow, you know, this kid Amaro Ray as he's like forced into this responsibility of of uh, piloting this suit he doesn't want to pilot in a war um, that he doesn't want to be a part of. And you see how the casualties and how the deaths affect all the characters emotionally. And they got into even more depth in the uh, later version of uh, Zeta Gundam, which mm -hmm. came out after, uh, which which is actually uh, Kido Swinsi no Gundam, mm -hmm. I think it was called. Thank you. But uh, but uh, these are very good series for people who, uh, and the old ones are actually, I, I, I like them better than the new ones, honestly. Mm -hmm. yeah, because and, yeah. because the storytelling and depth, you know, you actually sort of feel, you, and I'm not someone who feels easily, but you actually feel the characters and you're like, holy shit, dude, that sucks. <laughs> right, right. Uh, in, in terms of uh, beyond that, you might remember that the Gundam series, which, by the way, actually came out, I believe, uh, I might be wrong about this, because there were many precursors. The J Japanese culture is one of continuity. So there... I think Acid Boy was like the precursor to all those robot things, right? That's correct. That's correct. And so people understand Astro Boy. Uh, it's basically... What happens in the original series is that, uh, and this was an animated series, this was a cartoon that profoundly impacted uh, Japanese culture because it was the beginning of the indoctrination in the positive sense, the indoctrination of the Japanese public into the acceptance of transhumanism. And uh, so in terms of the Japanese culture and its acceptance of transhumanism, Astro Boy was a young boy who's the child of a scientist who dies in an automobile accident. Not the scientist, but the child. And the scientist is on site, uh, or arrives on site, immediately after the accident, and his child is dead. And his child is mangled to such a degree that the only part of the child that he's able to rescue is the child's heart, which he brings back and uh, it basically integrates into a, a young android that he has been working on, which is just basically a biofacsimulacra. A, uh, in other words, a facsimulacra of the human form. So he puts his son's heart within that, um, that uh, biofax and uh, therefore is able to comfort himself that it's his son's heart that is animating the biofax. So this is where the heart is integrated and artificial blood is pumped in that has the muscle work and um, he knows his son's heart is always with him. But he doesn't intellectually accept that as his son. But what the most decisive aspect of that story um, is, is that the, um, there is an incident of enemy alien races where they're able to cyberjack or hijack the minds of men. And because they're able to do that, when the human beings try to defend themselves against these aliens, one of the first things they do in their desperation, because the alien technology is so superior, is they integrate human brains with their artificial bodies that they're creating that can exist in the vacuum of, of space to fight the alien invasion. But the aliens are able to overtake the brains of these uh, vacuum-capable biofaxes. But Astro Boy is immune because when the aliens try to hijack his brain, it's not his brain that's operating his artificial body. It's his heart. So that is what leads to a decisive victory. The one biofax they can't cyberjack. So that's an important element of the story that shows that there is muscle memory and the ability to retain much in the heart that is separate from the brain. And sometimes the heart is more important. So, What's even more fascinating about the heart is that it actually generates a it generates one of the main fields around the human body. Yes. So go on about that. 
Give us some details. I mean, I'm not I'm not exactly sure how far it extends, but it extends pretty far out. And um, basically, that 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 you, you, your specific frequency is uh, is able. It's it's one of the reasons why that field is the reason why you're able to detect someone walking behind you, even if you can't hear them. You like all of a sudden have that instinctive urge to turn, and you see someone on a bicycle, some asshole riding by on the sidewalk. <laughs> Which happens all the time on Staten Island, sadly. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I get it. Yes, the, uh, the just another annoyance, of course. Uh, Staten Island, uh, actually, that'd be fascinating. Give us some of the details of why Staten Island is so unique in terms of some negatives. Oh, that would be appreciated. What's unique are the people. They're just. Uh, <laughs> Waiting for this. Yes. They they're just weird. They're just weird. <laughs> Whether they're black or white or whatever they are, if they were born out here, you know, it's like there's something. You look in their faces, and there's something that just says, "Okay, you were definitely born here." <laughs> And I'm not trying to insult everyone on Staten Island. I'll have like a whole mob outside my house, and then the next thing I know, you know, I'll Good wind point. up. Uh, yeah, you, dead. yeah, you don't want dead. to go too far with this. You got your parents. Yeah. yeah what I'm going to say is that there are some. Um, what I'm going to say is that there are some some stereotypes like of some of the people who are, are more on the like poor, you know, sort of white trailer park like persuasion. Where you sort of like hear them like a mile away and, and you sort of see them, they're like, Hey, what's going on there, buddy? Hey And then they're like they're like on drugs and shit and, and, and it's like they, they there's just like no shame. It's like <laughs> no shame. It's like if ever there was a place in New York where people are shameless, this is it. Yes. Oh, my oh, 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 and I also have to remark about that, that the Trump flag I saw in this area around Rosebank, where um, someone has a Trump flag where, where it says Trump 2020, and you see Trump's head on, like, Rambo's body. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and, and I wanted to take a picture of it, and, I, and I'm probably going to take a picture of it one of these days just to, you know, <laughs> poke fun at it. But it was just, like, the most absurd thing I've ever seen. And so this is basically... That, that tells you what you need to know about Stan. <laughs> there, there you go. And uh, so... It's, uh, like, it's like the rejects with the Brooklyn accents, you know. Mm-hmm. Right, right. It's, it's just, just, I can like, imagine there's plenty of things that... Uh, but oh, like, so, they, they weren't dressed like those people on Jersey Shore and shit. And, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and uh, aside from all of that, of course, uh, I, I've told everyone, of course, the uh, fact that I might not be burning bandwidth too long, but who knows? Last time I said that, I went on uh, for a full 12 hours anyway. Uh, but that in mind, uh, while I'm looking around on the Internet, um, honestly, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have to dwell a lot on the debate and the repercussions of that oh, debate. I wanted to bring up something about the debate. Yeah, um, please. Yeah, I, I want you to, you know, buy me as much time as possible while I'm looking for something besides the debate to talk about. So please, by all means. I didn't watch it, but what I have to say is Trump made, like, a, a remark on uh, Biden's son, mm-hmm. how he was unemployed, and, and, and I couldn't help but stop and think, why is that every white man's insult? Interesting. Someone says, someone says like, you're un- well, you're unemployed. I'd be like, okay, that means I got free time and you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand why employment is like the meaning to life if you're a white American. Where did that come from? Well, it's the Protestant this work fine, ethic. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Well, the worth ethic is just absurd. I mean, if you're gonna live your whole life to work, you might as well call yourself a slave, or or, or a drone like an ant or something like that. And uh, I, 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 I drone, yeah. drone, a drone is worse than a slave because a slave doesn't have a choice. Yeah. Yes. Well, a drone uh, doesn't have a choice either. It's genetically programmed. 
<laughs> but uh, in the insect sense, we're not talking about drone in the mechanism sense. We're talking about drone in the insectile sense. Oh, uh, by the way, um, to get back to what I was saying about the Astro Boy first, um, when we were talking about Astro Boy as the first, the uh, other thing that came up that I remember about Gundam was that I believe it was in, it was Star Wars that inspired it only in the sense that when Star Wars came out in 1977. Then the Japanese man who was reviewing it, he said, oh, I, I, he felt inspired to do something for Japan that was Japano specific, uh, that would be like a Japanese Star Wars. And so what he uh, came up with was far more socially relevant in the immediate yeah. sense than Star Wars. And so the concept of the uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, which is the original giant robot series, or rather the definitive one, the one that we all remember uh, if people analyze uh pop culture there were giant robots well before gundam so this is where the precursors come in uh manzigar was probably the first and um that was yeah i remember that i remember some of it yes yes it was so <laughs> long ago at yeah. the very least yes um, yeah go on and uh do you remember anything specific or <laughs> All I can say is the name rings and rings a bell. I might have come across the manga once or twice. Um, wasn't it called uh, uh, um, Mazinger Z or something? Yes, Mazinger Z. Z. Yes, Mazinger Z. You have an excellent memory. Yes. I've seen it on like Cartoon Network when Cartoon Network actually played like some of those old uh, Japanese uh, anime. Uh huh. Uh -huh. That was back before Cartoon Network became Product Network. Yes. <laughs> It's it's like two seconds of animation and then five minutes of toys, toys that are made in China and are so toxic they will kill your kid because the paint is made of lead. Yes, yes. Oh my God. Yeah, that was in the old days. They have forced them to change since then. Uh, China's had to change a lot of its industrial, uh, um, shall we say, production uh, style. Uh, but that's you know, plastic still isn't good for your kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, I, I, I noticed that in in the, in the stores now they have this uh, baby formula from Gerber that has fluoride in it. Mm -hmm. Why would a baby need fluoride? I I I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. What, what do you think they're trying to do? Just damage the brain cells at an early age, or uh... probably it? Well, whatever they're doing, it's working. Okay. It seems. Okay. We're, given given the amount of young people I come across who are like. Trump sympathizers. <laughs> it's, it's done its job. It's it's done its job. There's, there's no going back. Oh God. Uh. So. Uh, e e yeah, it's it's, it's it, it, I honestly don't think they need to do anything like that. You think that people are just naturally they seem to be being born stupider and stupider. There's a, a kind of degeneracy or a downbreeding uh, going on at any rate. Why would you need to artificially, uh, uh, you know, advance it? Um, but I, I would I wonder if it's really I want, because I, we also have to acknowledge the fact that uh, the min there's always a minority that's smart. But we also have to notice that 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 smart minority is probably less than twenty percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they, they, yeah. Eighty percent are just like border border. Well, uh, out of eighty percent, I'd say like at least uh, seventy five percent are just dumb. Uh, you know. By the way, I don't want this to turn into a, a kind of upholding of the intellectual as as the person no, who no, deserves no. I, I, I'm, yeah i'm not being elitist because because some of us uh some of us super smart people are evil as fuck it, it, there you go and uh, <laughs> it, it's there you have it and but the beyond I, yeah go on uh the yeah, i'm not gonna sugarcoat that uh, yeah. i'll leave it at that yeah but beyond that uh in in terms of uh good people you, you don't um need to be intelligent to be a good person there are good people out there who are not necessarily uh intelligent as, well, as that's true. yeah and um but, uh good people are probably that five percent i was speaking of you know that five percent in these and the uh other 75 percent are just people who can t go either way i um I, I hear you. I hear you. That's just I know a bit exaggerated because I'm somewhat of. Uh, I have to admit my uh, pessimistic bias. I, I get it. No, no, I get it. So I'm not. I'm, yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, I consider myself a uh, um, 
a optimist in so many ways but uh it's one of those things where i am uh i understand where jmo is coming from because i do see an overwhelming amount of evil there there is so much evil that is that is perpetrated by by so many people and it seems to be so common uh and you see it on the internet of course just the bullying uh of uh people who are just vicious and there's no reason for it other than people being vicious and this is how they derive joy from life there seems to be in american culture in particular uh from what i see a kind of uh just enjoyment of other people's pain and uh yeah, that, that that does exist there's a there's a uh, america's like sadis sadism and masochism on the extremes you know so you can have people uh flagellating themselves while watching someone gorge being crushed by a steamroller slowly and laughing and it's like what the fuck am i looking at you can just imagine that scene in your head that's that's america yeah. <laughs> you, you know you've entered the united states that that the, yeah there is so much of that and uh so um in terms of uh anything else you want to bring to our attention i'll start monologuing sometime soon but it may not be till um uh, you know 15 more minutes yet so i, I want to you know, I want you to bring up something that we can spend yeah. some time on. Yeah. It was. Uh, oh, it oh, was, here's an idea. When I, I found was... out about this interesting cult called uh, Blood Over Intent. Oh, that was it. That's what you brought up in the messages. Yes, tell me a yeah, bit about yeah. that. That what what is this about? Let's. Go... <laughs> this was started. This was a cult that was founded by I think a Mary Makovich, mm-hmm. Makovich, Makovich, and Russell Banks. Now, Russell Banks claims he's Satan, and he holds down a regular 9-to-5 job, and he tells people on the on YouTube to uh, that he will lead them to heaven, and that all they have to do is sacrifice their, you know, blood. So what they do is they make videos of themselves uh, pricking their fingers and, and putting smearing blood on sentences of things they want to happen. It's like soft magic. Because uh, anyone who practices magic knows that writing a sentence and smearing blood on it ain't gonna do jack shit. First off, um, that 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 right there is funny. But the very fact that there are so many people doing it, and then there and these are young people. These are people of all ethnicities, and they think it's cool and whatnot. And it's just so asinine. It's like, all right, first off. Oh God, where do I start with this? It is. Where do I go into, who do I attack first? The people who are exploiting the idiots or the idiots themselves? <laughs> it, it, All I can say yeah, is I suspect that this is a part of what we will call a social engineering. And I expect this is a part of an MK Ultra thing that many of these people, uh, many of these people who have magical knowledge now, are coming up with pseudo magical practices and creating cults around themselves to sort of exploit the uh, people to uh, harvest blood from them. Um, the idea, I guess, is that this guy will use a form of psychic vampirism, where by having all these people send their energy to him through this uh, through these stupid blood rituals. Now, even if he's not Satan, even if he's just a piece of white shit, he's going to somehow now um, harvest all their energy through their blood and become something. It's it's like it's like trying to take a fast road to apotheosis, but it's lazy. Mm-hmm. It's like I want apotheosis without doing all these rituals and work. He explains to people uh, apotheosis, the ascension to godhood. Apothe- yes, apotheosis is ascension to godhood. What this means is. Uh, after your physical body dies your ego and your conscious awareness will still be intact now a lot of people don't realize this but as you know if if anyone's done research on the scientific analysis of the dying process um, there was a guy who spoke extensively about it I cannot remember his name he was on TED talks and he would talk about you know sitting with people as they departed and what phenomena would occur in the room and whatnot, uh, people always seem to see this white light that envelopes them and they, you know, sort of start to feel a sense of peace and they just go along with it. And I would imagine at some point, whatever was the ego is, is, uh, 
is disintegrates. Now, what's left is an ego imprint, and the ego imprint is what we would call the astral ghost. The astral go the astral spirit can't live on on its own for that long. So what happens is the astral spirit either starts to break down, or it needs to, or revert to some form of psychic vampirism, and vampirize the living for sustenance to keep itself alive. It thinks it was the previous owner of the body, but it doesn't realize it isn't. It's an imprint. Okay. So uh, by by achieving apotheosis, your full ego remains intact with your earthly memories and everything. That's the idea, and you would become you would enter the realm of either the infernal empire or the uh, angelic empires or where, wherever the fuck you want, whatever you associate with. You know, if you're a right hand path, you might want to go to where uh, your uh, the god whatever god you believe is or whatever but anyway the whole idea is that you don't you, you don't die and just become a corpse mm -hmm. well uh, by the way um back from that back to uh i keep getting off track back to why i was bringing up uh the mobile suit gundam and what happened with the that series why it was so decisive in japan uh, it, there were many reasons why it made such an impression uh as uh jameson was saying it wasn't about giant robots per se, but rather young people who were piloting giant mechanisms that were anthropomorphic in shape. In other words, giant biofacsimulacra, simulations of the human form that were but mechanisms. And uh, so the young people who were the brains of these giant mechanisms, the uh, nervous system, the, uh, the motivation behind the movement of these otherwise uh, inanimate objects, the uh, pilots that excelled, or the uh, types. yes, they were called new types, and these yeah, neotypes. They were types Go. because these uh, new types would have these this sort of almost psychic connection with their Gundam, where they can sense what the in it. They were almost psych. They were like empaths. They were em empathic young people, and because of their empathy, they were able to tell what the enemy was going to do before the enemy did it. And for that reason, they made like superior pilots. And so this was the first time where we saw something that was sort of relevant to the human condition because in, in real life we have that. We have empaths. We have people who might have an extraordinarily sharp intuition on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. can tell when something's awry. You can tell when to get out of there for some reason. So it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting how they made that the focus instead of the machines themselves, which is sort of my critique to the newer series because the newer series seemed to be like this sort of... Uh, mechanic fetish more mm. so than you know I mean it depends on how far up you go also because I think uh, I mean Gundam Unicorn which was fairly recent was pretty good as far as story was concerned mm -hmm. but then I find all the all, all the all the ones they released that have char you know are pretty good mm -hmm. I don't know I just like his character uh -huh. it's pretty cool of course well he's the most popular one in Japan uh, char is the quote unquote, the Red Baron of that universe of the Japanese battle suits, uh, the man who is uh, capable of, uh, of a great, um, uh, he's racking up, he's, he's racked up the greatest score in general. He's not actually the highest scoring in the Gundam arc of narrative, but he is the most charismatic. <laughs> and so, yes. Well, it's also good as he's, he's, he's also the most clever. And that's what I like. What I like is his craftiness as far as wit is concerned. Because here we have a main character who's popular, who, use, who, who not only utilizes charisma, but he utilizes his wit. And when you see some of the things he's, he, he comes up with in his mind, it's like, holy shit, this dude's clever. Right. I like him. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard not to like him. Oh yeah, we, no. the Japanese love him. Uh, all the though the, in the West he's perceived as a villain. It's a it's a Japanese narrative, and he's perceived as the most sympathetic of villains, and uh, and and uh, certainly the one that everybody uh, uh, likes. People really um, uh, need to understand that. Uh, however, I think that this is the point that we come to that is an element that most people don't get from Mobile Suit Gundam. The new types are the neotypes, these extraordinarily gifted youngsters who seem to have evolved to the point in this human evolution, to the point of the evolution of the human species where we are extending ourselves by our mechanisms and therefore these children seem to be evolved to do just that. 
um, they are seeking kind of the reason for their existence and ultimately this leads to the main character of the series going to essentially find a kind of um, it was it was something I didn't really get myself but there was a point to it where I'd have to review it again because it was so long ago but the one thing I do remember was he ultimately wound up communing with dolphins and yeah. the dolphins somehow exposed the reality that the neotype was kind of an evolutionary dead end. That, 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 it, that ultimately the neotypes were not the next stage in human evolution, but were almost like a kind of manifestation at a time of war that a had... Stepping stone. Yeah, that, had, that seemed to have no because other purpose. Than that. Just the downfall of the new type happened to be the fact that they hate war. You know, there we and, and that's and that's where it's sort of arguable that the uh, only new type who sort of embodies a complete evolution is Char, because he he seems to be well versed to war. But the thing is, problem is he's so versed to war that he can't adapt to peace. So he is an endpoint. Yeah. Um, and this is this is actually uh, this is actually shared on uh, the end of uh, the movie uh, Char's uh, counterattack, where him and Amaro have the final showdown. And Amaro states that n that neither of, neither of us can be new types because all we know is how to fight. Right. So it's, it's quite interesting how they you know how they, how how they sort of came to that conclusion. Yes. Thank you, thank you. So there you are, and uh, that that is that's the point. <laughs> and that was uh, I think it, the most important takeaway of the moral philosophy is how important war is to man's evolution and uh also the shortcomings of the new type that could not see that and um adapt to both war and peace there's this uh, uh the, the, there's too much of either a in in zeta gundam uh the main character camille he after after the end after a prolonged battle and after he kills so many people he goes into a state of shock where he just stops functioning altogether because he, he just can't he can't function with war anymore and so he's just so averse to it that he just he ceases to be able to function with the real world anymore whereas like uh amaro and char they're locked in war yeah okay and uh so uh, uh aside from uh that then uh in terms of uh <sighs> Uh, it was interesting. There's another interesting story I could buy some time with, uh, which involves a contamination in uh, of water in Texas. Uh huh. Oh, please yeah, go into that. The brain-eating amoeba of Texas. Yes, one young man already died of this. And yeah. uh, so, tell us a bit about this. Everything that you know about this. By the way, the horror of this is that amoeba are truly immortal creatures. Uh, the first amoeba yeah. is still alive, uh, and it's a wonder that we they haven't overtaken the world <laughs> and in some cases scientists argue that they have in terms of other worlds but uh that's a subject i've brought up before and we'll go into again in the future but please go on about what's going on in texas to, to tell us what you know what i do know is that they've they've uh they, they've they've uh called a state of emergency and they don't want residents to drink any of the tap water mm -hmm. what happened was uh that the the uh amoeba normally isn't something that can really bother a human being if, if ingested in the stomach but apparently the water got up the kid's nose and so they think that he might have been in like a fire hydrant playing around or he might have been some kind of sprinkler and the water got up his nose and so it 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 would have it would have passed his blood brain barrier going directly into his blood, and it would have uh, gotten into his brain. But still, you don't want that shit going into your liver either. Right. So um, this goes to show you that we have a situation where the infrastructure of the United States is crumbling horribly. Nobody, there's no oversight to uh, any of this, and uh, it, things are just getting worse. This is why for a long time I was talking about, you know, buying water that's just bottled water. And, of course, I did that until I went broke. And so I'm literally, like, surviving off of scraps now. Um, literally having to drink the uh, municipal drinking water from the sink tap. But um, it's not recommended. I, I foresee this getting worse, especially with, the, with 2021. 
regardless of who gets in office, I can assure you that if Trump doesn't get in office, all the white guys who are working in the municipal drinking water are going to say, oh, fuck this shit, let's just poison the water. And if he does get into office, everyone's going to say, oh, we don't have to work anyway, so fuck this. Let's just leave the world to fucking die. Yeah. Right. This, we're also facing water shortages in some parts of the country, in some parts of the U.S. Um, that goes without saying. But... Um, while we don't seem to have to worry about that right now, initially in America, it's I suspect in the next two or three years, uh, if not sooner, it's going to become a big problem, and you're going to see people lining up to get bottled drinking water. You, you know that, and yeah, thank you. Other, and, and, and where it's a tragedy is that a majority of the water, of the fresh water supplies, are taken up by companies like Nestle, Pepsi, Coke. Mm -hmm. So all the accessible drinking water that would be fresh water for us regular people is going to them mm -hmm. so that the uh, local government can get kickbacks and so that people have no choice, no access to fresh water. So this is what happens when the corporations literally have too much power. Thank you. And uh, an important point made, to be sure. Honestly, I will pursue this. You, you've uh, made an incredibly uh, vital uh, uh, observation. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, pursue that as well as pursue what uh, Derek Talley said about uh, the Republicans weaponizing outrage, talking about how the... Uh, how the Puerto Ricans are the Latin Americans, so many of them buy into the uh, machismo bullshit. And of course, uh, it's, it's, it's all image. But the problem is this this is the problem with the American mindset. And to some degree, I would say that the Puerto Ricans, because it is a domicile of the United States, have been Americanized to a degree. To buy into this, uh, not only that, their culture is very sort of, you know, masculine domination anyway. Yes, that's right. And, uh, uh, I, yeah, go on. I would rather it have been female dominated because, you know, some of the females are really, really attractive. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, I think uh, Latinas are, Latinas are some of the most attractive women in the world, uh, believe yeah. me. It's, uh, uh, and and uh, it's it's horrible that their culture is just so full of macho bullshit and uh, it, it's but anyhow uh, do go on with uh, shall we say the um, uh, other aspects that need to be emphasized here while you're uh, buying time for me I think that uh, you've done a good job so far just go on a bit more and uh, the, problem, the problem with the Trump cultists is that we we have a such uh, our problem is the American black and white thinking mm -hmm. this it's, it's it's this thinking where you're either this you're that we, we don't realize that we live in a state of gray mm -hmm. now um i i want to give people an example of, and this example comes from another story that i found about uh, palm oil plantations in indonesia and how they're enslaving workers and abusing workers well it turns out just about every product you can buy on store shelves has palm oil People are switching to palm oil. Companies are switching to palm oil instead of, of uh, corn oil because it seems to be cheaper and it seems to last longer. The problem with this is uh, a lot of the workers, are, is, especially in places in Asia and Africa, are being enslaved to do this. And their, 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 their working conditions are horrific. So for people to say, I don't want to vote because I don't want to participate in evil. Well, guess what? It's too bad. You've been participating in evil since you were born. You were born in America, guess what? Welcome to the club. We're all forced into it. Because you, you, you're not going to eat if you're not going to buy something that has certain things. You know you know what I'm saying? Right. So, and, and this is the problem with the black and white thinking. People think, oh, oh, but Joe Biden's evil. But Joe, so, so is Trump. How is Trump not evil? But, 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 but. You see, you see what I'm saying? It's it's just, I don't, I, I, I can't grasp, I can't grasp it. It's just puritanical thinking that, you know, it's just black and white. We need to realize that in an adult world, you need to compromise. You need to compromise. And we're in a situation where in this election, we have to compromise at this point. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that compromise means, yeah, Slow Joe is going to have to overtake Dump Trump. Yes, 
Yes, and and by by the way, um, yeah, no, he, he, go on with your because. I I think it's important, <laughs> please. Well, because uh, having a dumpster as a president is a really bad idea. It, There's it, nothing strategically sound about it. There's no <laughs> way having a trash having a trash monster as a president is going to go well. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, it's uh, it, it's one of those things that. Uh, I'm going to uh, have to emphasize that, uh, you know, our girl, Crystal River, our, our lady, excuse me, uh, Crystal River uh, did me a favor the other night and uh, just last night, as a matter of fact. It was her birthday, by the way. Happy birthday, Crystal River. <laughs> so, Happy birthday. Yes. And uh, so I do want to uh, mention to everyone that, uh, uh, you know, she's, uh, she's a year older now, uh, but uh, we would never know it. And uh, in terms of uh, just uh, one of the things she brought to my attention was the Biden memes that are comedy gold. And uh, I had no idea how incredibly stupid and repulsive Joe Biden was as bad as I knew he was. And we still have to vote for him because we don't have a choice in the situation that I, I, I don't like the man. That, it, this is, the reason why I won't watch the debate is because I don't want to hear what either of them have to say. Uh, yes, they're just yes. literally, they're literally playing the back and forth uh, doubles against each other. Uh, yes, yes, you, but you're so stupid. Well, look at your waist high heels. Uh, <laughs> Where'd you get your suit? Well, well I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to, you know, do a little bit on the debates. I may, you know, what I've been doing is that well. Derek Talley and Jameson Reese were talking was I've been reviewing the debates and in one ear and I have it so that it, that fortunately it doesn't come into the um, audio uh, that we're listening to. But, you know, it's 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 awful. I mean, it, there's no way to describe this. I, I'll try my best to do some justice to it. I can't. Uh, but um, Nobody talks about the issues. Nobody's it, talking about any issues. Yeah. They I, are thank you. Just literally just shaming and slamming each other. Yeah, that's yeah. not a debate. Yeah, that's it, not a debate. That, that's a bunch of high school. There's a bunch of high school kids playing the dozens. Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to, um, you know, explain uh, that. And uh, people will say, say, for instance, what are the issues? I'm going to explain a, a preeminent issue that uh, neither one of those gentlemen addressed. Well, they're, you know, not really gentlemen. Uh, Biden is to a degree, but not really. Here, here's the thing about Biden that was uh, brought to my attention by Crystal River. That um, and these things do need to be uh, brought up now. I brought before, of course, that Joseph Biden is, if he's not a honest to God pedophile, he's just this <laughs> side of a, a of a child predator. I mean, you know, you've seen him groping and sniffing these young girls and shit, and it was just a running joke uh, back when he was vice president. And but that was uh, also when he was uh, when he was addressing Hillary Clinton, how he held her for like too long. It, he he's a creep. Yeah, yeah, he's creepy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's totally fucking creepy. And uh, <laughs> what, what is that? I said, there's Slenderman. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, there you are. And and uh, the the funny thing was that um, Ronald Stroyney, shout out to Ronald Stroyney, he uh, sent me a, a question in the private messages that was I considered this a preeminent example of nonlinear thought, uh, where I assumed he was high. And he wrote me just a single sentence like, Douglas, if you ever address Joe Biden's, uh, you know, sniffing and groping people, it's really creepy. Essentially, essentially what he said. And I told him, yes, I've addressed his perversity. Now go get yourself some sleep because my assumption is he just hasn't slept enough or something to ask a question. I mean, you know why? I, because he hasn't said anything to me in months and months. I mean, I haven't talked to this guy in maybe over a year, you know, and suddenly sends me a private message saying that it's kind of like it was so like, that's the first thing you say to someone who you haven't talked to in years. So the first thing I assume is that he's high. And, uh, you know, if he is, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, it's just what it is. I, I, I just, uh, you know, just another country to visit a family member. And, and the first thing you say, so, hey, what do you think about Biden's creepiness? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just like, it's like you know, what the fuck? What, what? Hello or some shit? Yeah, yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, uh, you know, it's it's just one of those uh, things that, uh, you know, anyhow, um, first off, uh, Joe Biden is creepy. Confess, and It's just one thing. It's just that it's that there's a childish naivety 
naivete to the to the American mind that is childish even in adulthood, and that's terrifying. Yeah. Um, that's literally that that's worse than the black that 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 contributes to the black and white thought because people are like it's either this or that it's either what fox says or it's what cnn says which are you gonna believe fox or cnn you can only choose one it's like gee dipshit how about neither yeah 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 but that then we don't want to fall into the trap that we heard the young ladies who have been on our program take no, that 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 path of states I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. I'm, 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 I'm going to shut my ears and close my eyes either. But there is a way of getting sources that are non-biased. This mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. And, and people, there's a way of vetting your information. There's a way of checking your information for legitimacy. There's a way of looking to see, there's a way of thinking. And the problem is Americans are too fucking lazy to think and they're childishly naive. You know, there, there, there's something that I also wanted to bring up that I never brought up. Um, and it's this naivety that goes on in the civil rights community that we could sit down and talk about race. It's like it's like it's like yeah. Let me tell you what it's like to be a black man and you're a white woman. It's it's, it's like someone Japanese sitting down saying, "Let me tell you what it's like to be a Japanese woman to a black man." It's like how the fuck is that gonna work? <laughs> <laughs> or it's like describing colors to a blind person. It's emphasize because it's so different. You see. So it's, it's, it's just that mindset that somehow it, 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 there's a sort of fatalistic optimism behind that mm -hmm. where I want to believe you're not that bad. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I saw the police shoot him, but I still want the police on my block because I feel safe. Yeah, they're going to shoot you, too. Well, 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 that might not be true. Yeah, uh, uh. Yeah, it's that level of stupidity. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, uh, I, I appreciate that. It's one of those things where... Uh, where we're at now, um, when I saw what Crystal River showed me, which was really funny and really painful at the same time, I could not <laughs> believe how bad Joseph Biden was. It, it's like, but I'm going to bring up the fact, of course, that we're still stuck with voting for him because we really don't have a choice. It really is that or it's it's going to be as President Donald Trump himself is saying in the debates, it's going to be bad. He himself is saying that. That's a threat from your own president. So we have a man who's already threatening civil war. He's a madman. And uh, I see this in some people who have put out these posters that are ripoffs of the Obama poster. Now, the Obama poster became a meme, which was ripped off as a joke in all kinds of ways. But people might remember the two-toned blue and white are kind of like three-toned uh, red, white, and blue poster showing Obama that said hope. And it, it instantly became a meme, a trope. And now they show Donald Trump showing his two fuck you fingers, you know, his two middle fingers pointed out in this, you know, a double fuck you saying Trump. It's not even it's not even a joke like um, narcissist or th these are people who are on his side are putting up these posters where he's giving people flicking the two fuck yous and, and saying Trump. It's just there's no hope. It's just Trump <laughs> and they're saying vote for him because it's just a fuck you to everybody who doesn't like him. That's essentially what they're left with is just vote for him because it's a fuck you on, uh, against everyone who's upset with him. And, and this is what they're left with is, uh, you know, it's just that he's so offensive. They want him in because they want to continually offend people because that's what they groove off of. This is where I said the American pathology of grooving off other people's pain. Uh, Trump pains people. And so vote for him so we can continue to pain these people so uh it, it's it's a situation where uh you just can't have this go on and uh but when it came to biden uh the the the, the comedy things that i was looking at which were hideously funny in which people were making fun of joe biden they took stuff that biden said and i couldn't believe it what he said blew my mind i don't know if you've seen what biden said but, you know, some of these jokes I, I might send you later, just, just the links to them. Crystal sent them to me. She forced me to watch them. And when I suffered through them and I, I, I thought to myself, this guy is he's like an automaton. He, he is like a biofax simulacra. He does not look like a real human being. He looks like rubberized plastic. He looks like he's got a plastic <laughs> mask for a face with this artificial <laughs> smile. There is nothing about him 
that looks real. He looks like your archetypal, respectable white guy, and that's all that's there. It, it's like it's empty. It's like it's totally... It's like that came out of a factory. Uh, I, 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 I but, felt that way about him the minute he was vice president of uh, Obama, it, it, to be it, honest I, I knew I didn't like the guy to, from the beginning. I saw him. I, I didn't. I just didn't know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and I and, and uh, yeah, and and but beyond that, it's uh, when he started saying some things to look like he was uh, somehow able to relate to the man on the street. Your average American, I guess, what he was trying to relate to was the average poor American who has to deal with violence on a fairly regular basis. And so he was coming out there and relating this story, which you can look up, about corn pop. Corn pop. And I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. He was, he was up there saying, oh, corn, corn pop was a bad guy. He hung out with a bad crowd. So, you know, it sounds like some kind of black guy <laughs> gang name. So, so but, but whoever this corn pop guy was, everybody was taking the meme of, of Biden saying this. And they were showing a giant cereal corn pop, you know, the corn pop cereal, giant corn pop. And then they were he was saying corn pop was a bad guy. He hung out with a bad crowd and they were showing this picture of uh, corn pop riding a motorcycle. And then he was surrounded by a bunch of other motorcycle gangsters who were like Count Chocula and Captain Crunch and Tony the Tiger and shit. And it was just like, oh, my fucking God. They made Biden look like an idiot, but it just got worse. I mean, Biden's up there saying, so Corn Pop was threatening some people at a swimming pool. And so Biden said, oh, the old guy at the pool, he gave me a chain. And I went out there and I confronted Corn Pop with the chain. And Corn Pop had a rusty razor, like a straight razor. You know, the typical black guy's weapon, you know, from way back when. And, and that, that he somehow, like, said, I apologize to you for something I said, but not about asking you to leave right now. And... And that Corn Pop accepted his apology and went away. And that's when this is this is Biden trying to show us that he is capable of some street level confrontation involving violence with your archetypal black baddie named Corn Pop. I'm assuming after his cornrows or something like that. It just came out so, so wrong. It was just like it's just like it doesn't make any sense. It's like, why would he even try? It was so pathetic. It was pathetic. It was just beyond pathetic. It, it's like, why would he even bother that angle why would he bother that angle it doesn't even make any sense it, it's a it's like what what is it, it's so stupid uh, and and it's like no one is going to believe joe biden <laughs> picked up a chain at a swim swimming pool and confronted some black gang it, it, it was just so stupid and 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 it was like what the fuck where does this come from and and this is part of what he's trying to push to show that he's somehow able to Relate to the common man. It doesn't make any sense. It, but but, but I think Biden's just a placeholder for Kamala Harris. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is how we have to look at it. We're not voting for Biden. We're voting for Kamala Harris. That's basically my is literally that they're going to kill him off and we're going to have our first black female president. And they're only going to have her up. She's not going to necessarily be a good president. It's just they're just going to do that because they want to address the new age of the female or something it, it's something occult behind it well, well, well that's if, if it happens that's if it happens I'm, I'm hoping it happens I'm, I'm hoping it happens don't you hope it happens i mean you do want her to i would rather have her yeah, I, I i would rather that happen than have him there for four years thank you I mean, thank you this. Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe the guy's going to pull off a mask and you're going to see the gecko lizard. Yeah, yes, yes. I, I keep... they, won't have to, they won't have to call uh, David Icke and say, you were right. Yes, yes, yes. It, it, it's, it's something like that. It's, it's, when I look at him, I can't believe him. He doesn't look like a real person. He looks like a, a programmed automaton. And, um, and we can only vote for him in the sense that we're voting for Kamala Harris. He is the battering ram for Kamala Harris. We hope he dies uh, while he's president so that Kamala Harris can take over. Uh, really, that's what it comes down to. Now, people, of course, who are afraid of Kamala Harris uh it's like so what she's a black woman it's like big deal get over it it's 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 like uh you know how much damage can she do uh it's it's one of those things where she can't be any worse than what we've got now and will probably be a lot fear is from white men because you know they can't they can't keep their dicks to themselves and they're in this sort of denial that they like black women so they have to shoot and hang black men over it yeah yeah there's there's and and, 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 and the same people who are racist you know they wind up raping black women okay so what was that about 
Yes, yes. Oh, 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 well, I don't consider them human, so I can do whatever I want. Yeah, but you got off on it, didn't you? Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just where, where we're at. It's, it's, it, 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 it's, this is how we're, we're involved in a world of insanity. Um, so, uh, do, um, Tell us a bit about the psychology of that and beyond. Uh, it, obviously, there's a, a lot about uh, white culture that imitates and emulates black culture. And that's what they were trying to lampoon when I saw these clips of Joe Biden. He was trying to be yeah. cool by somehow being black. He was trying to somehow he's going, come on, man. You know, this kind of when he does that, it just doesn't come out right see, at all. Uh, I, can see, I can see how in my head, see Obama with his hands in his face, like, oh my God. Thank you, thank you, yes, that's right. That the hands in the face, you know, just. I could just, I could just see it in my head clearly, like, thank him you. just shake his head like, he did not just do that. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I don't understand it either, you know, why, my, my thing is this, you know, I rather an honest fucking racist come to my face and say, I hate niggers, and I'll say, well, you know what, good for you, I hate you too. Yeah. Now go away. Beyond then that, I'm... you could also tell them that you probably don't like many blacks yourself. And <laughs> like, come on. Yeah. I'm them, I might as well just tell them, well, you know what? I hate all you humans. <laughs> so there go you away. Go. But, um, you know, what I find weird is, is, is again, there. I rather have an honest bigot than have someone who, who who's like using me so that they could sort of, because they're in self-denial that they're racist. So they're like, I got you as a back friend. I can't be racist. It's like, it's like, yo, those niggers. It's like, wait, what did you say? I mean, you know, I'm, I mean, <laughs> you know, in the hood, we're like, yeah, it's all good, nigga. You know, you know, it's like, okay, I think we will have to walk away from you right now before I hit you in the face. <laughs> right, and and uh, but uh, in terms of the. Uh... So did you catch any of the uh, debates where President Trump was asked to confront uh, the issue of the white supremacy? And, oh, and... Yeah, 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 yeah. I did catch that part where he said nothing. And uh, again, to to his, uh, this is honestly where I have to give him credit. He's an honest bigot. He's letting you know he's a fucking racist. Actually, I think you give him too much credit. He's a dishonest bigot. He won't. He won't admit to it. It's like, why can't you just come out and say it? You know, uh, that that uh, it, it just be upfront about it. But no, he's not. I, he's. I thought he has said that. Hasn't he said the N word many times? Uh, he Behind did, him? but you know, at the same time, he denies being a racist. It's it's your typical. He's, he's a hypocrite. It, I, I see. Yeah, he's it, it, a total hypocrite. But hypocrisy. I don't know which is. Yeah, I don't and know. His, are going to say, oh, he's not racist. Look at what he did for the black community. He said it. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, uh, and I don't know which is worse, him or Biden trying to relate to the blacks by telling stupid stories about corn pop and the swimming pool and all that shit. And it's just, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's both so repulsive. But like I said, why don't we just, why don't we just replace them both with uh, Kim Jong Un? Yes, yes. It, well, let's, let's, let's just get this fucking show over with. Since since we're already marching to the Armageddon, I, you know, I, I mean, listen, I, I've reached the point where I honestly entertain the idea of that observatory burning to the ground being good, because I figured, oh great, a giant asteroid's coming, a giant bolus is going to wipe us out. Let's direct that motherfucker to Russia and just watch as this all goes away. <laughs> we can only hope. Oh my it's God! So and uh, well, I, I honestly entertain making a spell for that. Uh, yeah. I probably would. I mean, I've done. A, uh, well, if if and it's a good thing that I'm not as good of a spellcaster as I uh, would like to be, because if I was, I don't think we'd be we'd exist right now. <laughs> I, I yeah, I I hear you. I get get what you're saying. So in in terms of uh, aside from that, uh, what what else in the uh, current scene uh, begs some attention? I'm going to try and explain to people something that you brought up about this kind of. Uh, miscomprehension they have about uh, what seems to be everything. Uh, one of the things that was brought up, uh, for instance, was uh, what's going on here in California with the uh, people have been, this is, a lot of people have asked me this question about whether California, Governor Newsom has just passed a law uh, protecting pedophiles. 
and I'm going to try and educate people on that. I'll probably start off my monologue with that. But I, I don't know if you've heard any of this or... Um, this is new to me. Okay. And it's, it's not the case. And I'm going to, you know, try and explain why that's not the case. But um, it, it's one of those things that when I start to monologue, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that issue. Um, I'll go to the restroom first, kind of, you know, breathe and try to center myself. Because so much of what I'm covering is about the debate. It, it seems like it's petty. It's not. It's, it's really something that will drive people to uh, madness. Uh, because it exposes so much that is so wrong about our society. Uh, by the way, Maria Grigorich says critical thinking is beyond most people. But there is the acceptance factor, too. People need to fit in, and that's more important to most. Um, uh, Daniel Arola... Uh -huh. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, I could, I could run with the fit in thing for a little bit. Yeah. And uh, so Daniel Arola says, I'd like to see Kamala Harris end up in the Oval Office after Biden or in case Biden's health gets poor and makes him retire so that she can take over. Yes, this is basically what we're hoping for. And uh, honestly, uh, so, so go on and tell us a bit about fitting in and why that was never your priority. The problem with fitting in is often you, there's a sort of insincerity you need in order to fit in. There, there's a sort of, uh, I was never really accepted for who I was because um, I've always been accepted, you know, by what I would show, what I would display my anger, you know, because sometimes, you know, people did things that really pissed me off. And as a kid, I had a short temper. I would be chastised for it, so it was like, you know, I, I wasn't going to, I would rather have gotten into trouble as often as I did than try to fit in and be a good kid. But on the same token, a lot of the good kids were just boring. You know, they fit in with each other, uh, all they cared about was stuff. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the stuff they cared about wasn't anything of depth or substance that seemed to really appeal to me. I couldn't think much about, you know having new basketball sneakers or some shit, you know, it's just like, you know, people talking about the new cell phone that came out. It's like, who fucking cares, you know, mm -hmm. popular. The problem with fitting in is that one becomes completely insincere and one loses oneself. It's better to be in exile for a while. When you're in exile for a while, you have to put shit together for yourself. You have to start to discover, who am I? What am I going to do with this? What am I going to do with my life? It's not going to be dictated by anyone else. So, you know, when you're on the fringes, you sort of have to build a sort of adaptive intelligence you don't have if you're fitting in, where you have to constantly uh, have a sort of attentiveness to your surroundings, for one, because you realize that the herd can be somewhat dangerous because uh, people in that fitting in mindset seem to be judgmental to those that are outside of them. Not only that, because they're judgmental by things that aren't them, they have a bias. And that built-in bias acts as a blinder, preventing them from seeing reality. So they can't see reality for, uh, they can't see reality as a whole. They're not capable of grasping situations as they occur. They rather go by other people's opinions. And the other problem is that when primates, the problem with primates that we have is when we're in large groups the more of us there are the dumber the crowd gets the crowd sort of builds its own mind and so the individual's ability to reason disintegrates it, it, it becomes inversely related with the size of the crowd we see this outside of like uh, stadiums when there are sporting events when people just get loud, loud rowdy because their team won if you won, why the fuck are you destroying half the city? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Right. But you see that that's just how the hive mind works, you know. Well, they say the a study was done by sociologists that proved that uh, the uh, crowds that, especially when they turn violent, like a lynch mob, that they have essentially the collective IQ of a unicellular animal. They're operating as an amoeba in a very real sense. So it's uh, it's no exaggeration. Uh, the crowd is a, the mob is uh, a dangerous, uh, unthinking animal, a responsive uh, mechanism. And uh, that's uh, what we're dealing with when we uh, deal with uh, the reactionary politics that we have that in today's society. That is precisely what I'm afraid of. Um, I'm afraid that regardless of who wins, the, the numbers of people who are going to get together and 
fight and cause havoc is going to increase all over the country. There's just no words for it. Whether their cause is just or not is not going to make a difference. Whether, but the more the more people that are storming one area, the more there there are going to be people. There are people who I consider hobgoblin people, and the hobgoblin people are people who are human beings who just want to join whatever crowd they could find so they could fuck shit up because that's what they do. They spend their whole lives trying to look for people to hang out with so they could fuck shit up wherever they go because that's just what they do. I want to smash a window. I want to break someone. I want to punch someone in the face. Yes. Like, yes. Because yes. it's just what I do. Yes. It's just what they do. They're born. I, I, I can say, I can honestly say that perhaps their non-playable characters don't have souls like the rest of us we would be considered playable characters in a sense i i I, I like that it's a good analogy and um it's a uh, the term in role-playing games would be npc or non-player character and uh these are usually just uh shall we say bit bit players that show up for the sake of a skirmish <laughs> and, uh, that's that's what many people present themselves as now literally uh, AI, they're computer AI, and, and so they're not controlled by any real human being controlling them. They, they literally have the base intelligence of whatever's programmed into them, and that's that's your basic hobgoblin person. You know, there there's always going to be somebody. There's always a tipping point, and I don't know what number of people is needed for that tipping point in which that hobgoblin person comes out and does some fucked up shit. But there's always a numerical tipping point for some reason. I'm starting to notice this um, more and more because it always seems like, you know, for, to some degree you can have a peaceful protest to a period of time. And then as more people, start, as some people start to leave or maybe more people start to come in, there's always got to be one. And that, and that one person is, isn't always alone. There's always someone else who synchronous, who, who's all, who all of a sudden is synchronized with that, is that morphic resonance and then they just start doing it and then it just goes on and on. This is, and and this, is, this sort of ties into the idea that uh, Rupert Sheldrake puts forth of, of uh, morphic fields. You have too many people, you have too many morphic fields push, pushing on the same frequency. The problem with these people is that they don't have a strong self-identity. When you don't have a strong self-identity, your morphic field is subject to the resonance of frequencies that are outside of you. You have no control over yourself. Okay. And this is the problem with people who aren't self-actualized or don't realize their individuality. Now, my argument is that, you know, one has to evolve and become a complete individual before one can work for the greater good. Only then can one work for the greater collective if one has that sense of self-identity first. If you have too many people who are working, who claim to be working for the greater collective, who don't have that strong self-identity, They'll not only be easily corruptible, but they'll easily fuck shit up. And things will be mismanaged, things will just fall to shit, as often is the case in the United States. Okay, and uh, so uh, what I'm going to count on you to do, because I'm going to take that quick trip to the bathroom, I'll be gone for about um, five to seven minutes, is I want you to, um, uh, you know, surprise people and uh, try and present positive things. <laughs> Just as a challenge. Take this as a challenge to yourself. And I don't think you've been particularly negative tonight, mind you. I don't think you've been particularly negative tonight. But maybe what you can do is kind of uh, put into some context, uh, you know, something that will uh, give people a different perspective than they may have of you from uh, what, um, you know, what usually they assume when they hear from you, which is a lot of uh, condemnation of the human race. Um, is there anything positive that you can come up with? It? By the way, uh, before you get into that, I'm just going to uh, cover you for a second while you gather yourself on that. <laughs> uh, but um, I'll give you an example of my father, my late and sainted father, the man who raised and guided me, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, who was the chief petty officer of the United States Navy. Uh, it, it's a... Uh, it, it's a... Uh, let's just put it this way about my dad. One of the most important things he taught me was that intelligence is not what necessarily is the most important thing in the world. Uh, that uh, he was not what I would call... 
he had native intelligence, but he was not necessarily intelligent at the academic level to a degree that would be uh, professorial. He, he graduated from high school, but um, he didn't graduate from college. And one of the things that my mother made him do was go back to college with her. And uh, so that was incredible. It was one of the great um, things they did as adults, which was wonderful. But there was a lot of an element of Homer Simpson and Al Bundy to my father, the man who raised and guided me. And you would not believe how much Homer Simpson and Al Bundy was in my father, to the point where he was easily uh, reflected in those caricatures to a degree that was spooky. It was just like he loved donuts. He was someone who... Just like Al Bundy when he died and went to hell and uh, you have this demon who's assigned to him pointing out uh, how he's going to suffer. Uh, Mr. Bundy, now that you're in hell, we're going to subject you to an eternity of the most disgusting diet imaginable. And he uncovers this veil of these little dough-wrapped uh, Vienna sausages. Weeny winks! And Al Bundy goes... We love those! You know, that's something my father would say. That's exactly the kind of white trash shit he would eat. That's it. And, and um, that's... And then uh, there you have uh, the demon saying, Well, I'll have you know that a steady diet of Winnie Winks will have you spending an eternity in the bathroom. Uh, of course, Al Bundy said, Why do you think I love him? It was, uh, you know, he was a guy who was at that stage in life where he was past the great sex phase, past the great dinner and, and, and food phase, into the um, great bowel movement phase of life, where I had a great bowel movement. My, my dad had all those elements. There were all those elements to my father, but he was still a wonderful human being. He was still a person who respected other people and taught me so much, and it was not necessarily always of the intellectual sense. Surely there must be elements of that, that um, that that uh, are other aspects that uh, James and Reese can can bring up something similar, something similar in terms of uh, experience that um, gives us a different perspective on on humanity. At any rate, I'll be right back in about five or seven minutes, more like seven to ten minutes, and uh, I'm going to go okay. mute, and I'll leave it in your hands. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, positive things. Okay, folks. Um, you're gonna have to bear with me. Um, all right. Well. The fall is here, so I'm in a much better mood for what it's worth. Um, I could go into why I like the fall, which is because I guess it's a lot cooler. Um, it's not as uh, frantic. Uh, well, actually, everyone's going back to school. That's a plus. Um, uh, the leaves falling and everything uh, look pretty pretty when they're in... Uh, <laughs> all those different colors and uh, the veils between this world and the other world is the thinnest which is great for my ability to continue my craft um, uh, geez man having to redeem myself here this is this is really going <laughs> this is really going to be one of those moments all right um, okay let's see my name is Jameson Reese I was born June 3rd at 3.06 a.m. Ha! Huh. How's that for a synchronicity? Um, let's see. I like to sleep. I like to, uh, I do enjoy spending time with my cats because, you know, I, I seem to get along really well with animals, actually. So that could be a positive thing. Um. It seems everybody's dog and cat likes me, so I mean that definitely means I can't be that bad of a that can't I can't be that much of a brute or, or monster if if you know animals like me. And for some reason, even though I tend to try to stay away from them because I'm afraid of the coronavirus, kids don't seem to kids little kids seem to take a liking to me. I find that odd because you know I really don't want to have kids. Um, that idea is kind of scary in this world. Um, I, I would be too worried about how I'm going to protect them then. But, uh, okay, I got to keep it positive. Uh, all right. Um, all right. Uh, 
Jeez, jeez. What, what is it about me that's positive? Um, I'm a straightforward guy. I am not going to bullshit you. I am an honest guy. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, I'm creative. Kinda. And I know how to draw. I'm getting back into working on my graphic novel. I am getting back into reading now that the heat is dying down. I can probably go out and read in the park. So I can, I have a lot of uh, interesting things to look forward to. I have an extremely chiseled body for my age, which is quite exceptional. And, you know, the women definitely don't complain about it, um, which is a good thing. Um, I take care of myself, well, at least externally. Uh, I try. I, I definitely do eat the right things, but you know, there's, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I could probably do a little better. I'm uh, slowly on a hell of a lot less of the substance I used to abuse than I've ever been on, so I'm starting to come back down. You can probably tell by my speech because I'm not stumbling and stammering over words that I'm a little more sound of mind. Although that might change in a few hours. Um, Let's see, what, what, what else can I do? I can probably walk very fast, faster than your average person, which is a interesting attribute, I guess. I, it's useful if you need to get out of trouble. Uh, oh my god, I'm doing horrible over here. Okay, uh, oh yeah, Halloween is the best part of fall. I certainly look forward to that day. Although I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing. I, I used to enjoy spending Halloween going to Central Park and doing strange rituals. And, you know, people would look at me like I was weird, but I would be like, oh, it's Halloween. Who gives a fuck? Get over it. For all you know, I'm just doing it for show. Um, let's see. I am... I, I don't know if I can really keep this positive without going into the occult because it's just something I'm just drawn to do. But I am making progress in working with the 72 Ifrit, which are a uh, species of Jin, who I will not go too much into. But I'm just going to say that my work is making progress. I've uh, recently had to clean out a flood in the adjacent room uh, that's connected to the basement in which I dwell. And that adjacent room seemed to be flooded pretty badly. Uh, there was mold that I had to clean up. Uh, I had to clean up also. Well, the good thing about it was it happened to be a blessing and surprise. Even though we haven't fixed that uh, pipe that was leaking, we just shut off the valve. Uh, the good thing about it was I was able to organize and get all the old uh, things that my brother and sister left down there and bring it upstairs for them to sort through their shit and get rid of. So we seem to be going through a period of cleansing where, you know, you can get your house in order. This goes in, this goes in line with what, what uh, Crystal Rivers was saying about um, going into your affairs and cleaning, all, cleaning everything out. So that seems to be going phenomenally. Um, the only thing left to do is to probably uh, clean up the area where some of the tiles are. Um, that were extra spare tiles that were, you know, beneath the circuit breaker in that pipe. Why the fuck would you put a pipe that directs water next to a circuit breaker? Okay. Positive. Being positive. I'm just saying, though, that's that's just bad construction sense. Dude. All right. Not going to go there. Going to go to my happy place. My happy place, of course, is either a pitch black place where I have no body... <laughs> Or it's a pitch white place where I have no body. And uh, sometimes it's just blank and gray. So that's my happy place inside my head. Not a lot of scenery there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, not a lot of scenery there. So um, things are just well for me to relax. Uh, oh my god. Talking about myself has been the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. Um... Uh, let's see. What can I do for you, the human public? I can 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I okay. just came back and I, um, what, uh, here's one thing you can talk about. Obviously, if you hate humanity so much, you still have a sexual taste for females. I noticed that when I put up, uh, that one birthday e-card to Peter Mayer of, uh, one of my escorts from the past and you were going, damn, <laughs> you, it's oh obviously God. there's got to be a place in your universe, uh, for, uh, females that you're hot to reproduce with, or at least go through the motions of reproduction without the yeah. result a child uh as, as I, I myself since i've honestly been building up the sexual tension i haven't even i haven't even considered masturbation i've been literally just building 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 it up for the last week uh i i will go into uh some of the occult ramifications of this but i find that for some reason uh the amount of strange phenomenon seems to increase with that sexual repression and I seem to direct it towards that. You know, if I ever do, if I ever do reproduce with a woman, uh, not reproduce, that, no, no, no kids, no kids. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, yes. If I ever get active with a woman, I, I, I have a tendency of trying to make the goal some kind of magical outcome. I suppose this has to do with uh, looking at things from a clipothic uh, perspective, where instead of using a, uh, Instead of using sex for the ecstasy to merge with the Godhead, I'm using it to power sorcery. So, I mean, it's, it's, practical. it's practical. So, what you're saying is like a Roman Catholic priest who uh, dedicates themselves to celibacy, or certain monastic practices in Asia dedicate themselves to celibacy, that, that uh, in a sense, celibacy uh, redirects or you're sublimating the sexual energy towards a different type of power. Yes, yes. Uh, in, in, in a real sense, I'm probably, in, in a real sense, most people would say, hey, you're the most unsatanic Satanist I ever came across. <laughs> well, there you go. No, I'm just, I wouldn't call myself a Satanist, though. I understand. Um, no, that's appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an arcanist. I, 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 I just prefer to work with infernal things because they seem to interests me so much there's just something there's just a different feel there's a feel to them that just feels welcoming but that well anyway let me not go into that too much to that you know i don't want to have to do the disclaimer even you know even though i don't believe the disclaimer when i give it i give it out of respect to you and your audience of course but uh what i will say is uh there is a sexual attraction to women but i'm i'm heavily suppressing it um, this is also done by the use of certain substances as well. Um, the reason why is because uh, I don't have an ability. I, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. I don't want to catch corona. Um, if, 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 if on an STD test, they start testing for the coronavirus as an STD, then yeah. Yeah, okay, maybe I'll uh, go look for some action after we get tested. There you go. I mean, it's uh, we're, we're in a pretty um, fraught uh, space right now, uh, the entire human species. The pandemic, of course, I will be speaking a bit to it, is obviously uh, a manifestation of some deeper uh, pathology, some deeper illnesses. Uh, definitely, we are, um, this is, uh, uh, as it's gotten to the point where uh, James and Reese himself felt that the whole human species has only a limited amount of time before it becomes extinct. Uh, of course, uh, some would argue that human beings uh, are like roaches, that many of them will survive somehow. But the truth is, humanity is very fragile, and the species is uh, very precariously balanced on a number of environmental factors that we're damaging. And the problem is our present state of leadership is is damaging it further by denying it. It's it's just it's just awful. The situation is grim. Make no mistake about it. The situation is is desperate. Uh, the, there's there's no other word for it. So uh, we are in a situation where things do have to change. And uh, when it comes to the vote, you can't just say I'm removing myself. Even someone as as negative as Jameson Reese realizes that uh, it's thank you thank you please go on take it from there I want you to just to take it from there and um. at this point it's raw survival um, <clears throat> if Trump gets in 
if any of you are on any of the welfare or, or any benefits or even if you're on like social security disability or anything like that expect that all to be axed if he gets in the second the second term yeah. that's all going to disappear yeah. you're not going to have any money nobody's going to want to protect you from the corporations who are just going to reap you either way you look at it uh, I can assure you your infrastructure is going to collapse catastrophically uh, I wouldn't say we'd reach a point where there'll be a meltdown or something but I would say that uh, we'll be pretty compromised to Russian hackers causing meltdown or some shit like that because let's not remember let's not forget these system controllers are hackable the system controllers that control the, the these are more like manual computing systems they're not binary but they still can be hacked um, from the outside. Th this is what happened during uh, Stuxnet, during the uh, Fukushima incident. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, the other problem is China. Uh, is the other problem is China. Russia and China are both equally problems. Uh, Russia's Russia's a problem in passing. I, I say that because Russia's only power is hacking. The yeah. problem is. We don't have anyone who's who's taking the effort to bring computer computer savvy people together to fucking defend the country. Rather, everyone's just saying, "Oh, fuck that shit! I can make more money in Silicon Valley, so let me just make software and shit." There's no incentive. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I, and I'm going to say that at least if the Democrats take the House, or at least if they prevent. Uh, the Republicans from taking the Supreme Court, right. which is another issue. That's a big fucking issue. Right. If they get that, whatever the hell that thing is, in 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 the place of uh, Ginsburg, mm -hmm. you can consider civil liberty a thing of the past. Thank you. Yeah. It's all going to be gone, and I might as well just fucking uh, try to hop on a ship and go, go to Africa or some shit. And they'll be like, why the fuck are you coming here to Africa? I'll be like, dude, have you seen the United States? But by the way, many black Americans are certainly a large number of them have been going back to Africa. And, uh, yeah. and they, it, so tell us what you know about that phenomenon. I know nothing about it, admittedly. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is that there's a sense in the air that something's coming and that we are in trouble as a small very very small percentage of the population 12 percent 13 percent of the american population we have no defense as far as sheer numbers are concerned we have no defense except for other white people folks who like black people which is still better than nothing but that's not a lot you know uh i don't want to wind up on some field um pulling sugar cane like you know the the fucking slaves in cuba or the slaves on palm oil plantations in uh africa and areas in asia and south in indonesia so um that's all, all the more reason to get trump out of office yeah it, it's just uh aside from all of that uh another point that you brought up that i will be following up on of course is uh just uh the threat that he represents to uh well, uh, the civil liberties in the sense that I, I, I think I've covered the Supreme Court pretty thoroughly and, and, and what the implications. The national, the national security threat is what worries me the most, um, honestly, is, is, you know, our vulnerability to hacking, not just hacking as far as hacking the election, but hacking other information systems, information systems that hold people's money accounts, things like that. Uh, things that information systems that might be held by you know city mun municipal um, uh, agencies that show how much money people are allotted for like uh, I don't know food stamps things like that mm -hmm. big yeah. problem they hack that big fucking problem if we don't find some way to check that or counter that and uh, it seems like the Republicans are like we don't give a fuck mm -hmm. They don't give a fuck. It's not seems that they get, don't give a they, fuck. Yeah, they, they don't. don't <laughs> yes. No, they don't give a fuck. They, 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 it pro they've proven they don't care. And they're proud of it. And they're proud of yeah, it. That's proud of it. Yes. And, and the danger is, like I've said, that um, 
uh, like what we heard from uh, both Crystal River and Noreen Helpan, is an attitude of don't vote because they just are tired of both parties. And uh, it's just we can't take that attitude. It's it's beyond that now. Also have, we also have to take into context, though, that these two are, you know, and as much as they, they would they would probably refute this and say it's not about race, but it is about race. Mm-hmm. Is that a, a, a white person will still have the privilege to take that stance and be able to be reasonably well off even if Trump does get in office again, even if they can't stand Trump. Mm-hmm. But if you're someone of color, you don't have that luxury. That luxury is gone. We don't have a luxury. We don't have a thank choice. You. Yes, thank you. That is what is so important about this election. And if it's, it's... of color, you don't have a fucking choice. Yeah. You don't know what the fuck they're going to do to your ass if Trump goes back in office. But you, you had best believe you would be better off putting a bullet in your head now if you're not going to vote. It, it is that bad. And uh, I don't think many people, especially if they're white, really grasp the seriousness of this because I don't think they can envision it, just how bad it is. Um, they, they, they don't have to because they don't have the context by which they... See, if one has never been subjected to the level of fear that primal survival circuit if your primal survival circuit isn't active on a daily basis you could put your head in the sand and you'll never know what the fuck is coming right. and you can take it for granted but people who are of african american descent we have been held in that state of fear for over 400 years we we are perpetually in a state of fear we are perpetually in life or death so when some shit is going to come down that's going to fuck us we know we see it coming a mile away even right. if a white person can't that's because that's, we've yeah. been held in that state of mind where we have to see it yes and, it, we're dead yeah and and um do me a favor i'm going to be right back again i'm going to take just a short trip a few minutes i just got to take care of something and again breathe and center myself before i do the solicitation and go into full monologue do me a favor and tell us a bit about intergenerational trauma the, the phenomenon of intergenerational trauma. And I don't know if you're that familiar with the term, but it should be self-evident on the face of it what that term means. Just the inherited trauma uh, from generations of racial persecution or cultural This ties into epigenetics. What happens is, let's say, uh, to some degree, you can pass on genetic memories of the experiences from what might have gone on in a mother's life to a child. And this goes on and on and on through generations. So the primal, one of one of the one of the things that you know is often critiqued about people, especially black men, is this stupid fucking stereotype that black men are lazy, which is absurd. And 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 the fact of the matter is the reason why a lot of us don't a lot a lot of people of color might not want employment is because of that slavery, is because of the fucking having been in chains, and because of some of those epigenetic memories of having nothing but work pain and suffering so that's that's passed on people don't realize that you know um the uh violence the fear of authority the mistrust of authority that's passed on because uh historically we've never had anything to trust it's only recently i mean recent like in the last maybe two or three decades that things have gone gotten as good as they are now and it's still not good it's not in fact it seems like it's going backwards it's going everything seems to be pushing backwards to the 1950s from what seemed to be like the 2000 to the 90s and whatnot everything's going fucking backwards and uh there is a a fear that's driving people in the black community where we know we're not wanted here we're not at home here this isn't our home because if you're not considered if you're not even considered human in the country you live in how can you call that home if uh, the authorities want you to die who you have to rely on for survival how can you call that home this is a trauma that's passed on from parent to child it doesn't necessarily have to be something where a, ch- uh, a, a parent sits down and tells a child. You know, my parent, I was blessed because my parents sat down and told me, they said, you're black. You can't be doing certain things that other kids do. So you, you, you seem to realize things are very different for me. Things are very different for me 
than these other people who can run around and do whatever. So you start to see you start to see the world differently. Um, the world doesn't seem like a place of opportunity. It seems like a place of uh, probabilities and possibilities. What can possibly go wrong weighed against what can possibly go right. And uh, more and more, as uh, the more trauma you have built up back there, the more you realize you're going to be focusing more on how can things go wrong than how things can go right. So those possibilities are going to diminish. Those opportunities are going to diminish. And so is that optimism. So to a degree, you can say that my, my personality is what you would call a sort of manifestation of that intergenerational trauma, of enslavement, of discrimination, um, discrimination that my family members faced. My grandfather faced discrimination because uh, um, on my mother's side, because the woman he ma married uh, was easily able to pass for a white woman. And so he was often, you know, there were often places where he couldn't go. He couldn't sit down and have a, he couldn't sit down and eat with his wife because he was black. Now, on my father's side of the family, uh, they were descended from uh, slaves. So um, there was a lot of trauma. There were a lot of things that my grandmother wouldn't talk about. <clears throat> So I definitely appreciate what you've said. Um, one of the things I'd I like to... I have to make a comment to this please. individual in the chat, Gooby okay. Goo. Know, <laughs> I'm sorry, the name. Awakened from this matrix and teaching on colors. Mm -hmm. To a degree, but to a degree, it's not, it's not that cut and dry. It's not that simple. That's an overgeneralization. I can tell you I've encountered many people of my own ethnicity who are far from awake are embedded in the matrix and they don't know it because they never had the opportunity or they never had the parents to push them as hard you know as far as education is concerned as my parents did mm -hmm. so they, they they end up becoming a part of the system and a lot of them wind up making mistakes mistakes that get them shot by cops mistakes that get them killed and this is why so many things that are happening now do happen so it's not all that cut and dry. And yeah, you're right. Even 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 more whites Yeah, it's true. Even more whites are brainwashed and asleep. But you also have to take into account that there's there's more of a white population than there's a black population. So naturally there's gonna be a different it's difference in numbers. Thirteen percent of the population is black compared to almost a good fifty percent of the population that's white. That's a massive difference in numbers. Yeah, or more than fifty percent, though more it's changing. Yeah, though it is changing, and and I look forward to the change. To tell you the truth, I mean, we certainly. Yeah. But but we also have to face the fact that that change is going to bring some violent repercussions from the other side. We have to be ready for it. Yes. yes. I would say, if to all those brothers in the hood who 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 are strapped up and all that stuff, and all these people who are gang banging. Y'all best get your shit and your weapons together because you're going to have a reason to gang bang once these uh, Trump supporting crackers come in with their fucking weapons and fire. <laughs> yes. You're going you. to have a war on your hands. Yes. You're going to have something to rap about at the end of the day. Yes. <laughs> and 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 uh, it, it's too true. It's uh, We're in a situation of uh, uh, just uh, the, it, it's it's life or death for people like James and Reese and myself, and for people who don't understand that about myself, who think that uh, somehow for me that's not the case, I, I want people to know that we are having horrible problems right now with racist violence against Asians because of COVID-19. They're considered to be the source of COVID-19 uh, because of, of course, quote unquote, the China virus. So and, uh, I want people... Yeah. Uh, listen, this, is, this is the reason why I've been telling people in the black community that we need a solidarity with the Asian ethnos. We need a solidarity with them. Yes. yes. I know that historically things are not always good, especially with people who own those Korean stores and, you know, they have, and they, and they, and they, and they get there and they uh, have their gripes about black people, but in, in 
there you the the Asian ethnos is a minority too, and the only way I can see anything working is if those minorities and those who are whites who support minorities come together. That's the only way we'll be able to face the threat of the impending violence to come, because if we're divided, we're fucked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, beyond that, I uh, would like you to kind of uh, give us a further and, emphasis and, on. And, and now I have, to, I have to, I have to give. Up. Oh God, we're breaking Again, up. I know I'm, I'm so preachy here, so I'm, no. I'm starting to concern myself. Can you hear me? <laughs> uh, we 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 lost you for a bit because of the uh, bandwidth issues that uh, were going on, but we were going for so strong for so long. Uh, hopefully, things have stabilized. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, let me. I'm gonna shut. Okay, we're gonna see if he can. Shut down my browser because I might have too many. Yes, yes. Shut down whatever else you might have that's riding on the bandwidth, and uh, that's important. Give us a few minutes here. All right. So there we. Should be good. A little better. Uh, all right. Okay, that's a little better. Sounding good again. I think we've stabilized. Uh, please uh, go on uh, back to what you're saying, because, like you said, it may sound preachy, but there's uh, there's a reason why we have to be emphatic. We have to be emphatic about this because I don't think most people get it. It's it's it, 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 the life or death uh, aspect of this because it's something. Who would want to get that? You don't want to think it's that bad. But for us, it is that bad. <laughs> so please, yes, by all means, yes. go on. Yeah. What I am, what I am, what I am saying, I am saying from a strategic perspective, because strategically speaking, we have to be aware of uh, a, a lot of issues facing. Um, one of the issues I've noticed of uh, that we're facing is the fact that a lot of people in the Midwest, you know, areas that are majority are white. They don't have nuclear power plants in those areas because they're tor- it's Tornado Alley. But in some pl- areas in the West Coast, and at least in uh, on the East Coast alone, we have over a hundred and a hundred nuclear power plants lining the entire area. If we don't get our shit together, we're a sitting target. Yes. yes. Think about what I'm saying. What happens if someone decides to uh, drive a truck into a nuclear power plant and that shit goes critical, full of ammonium nitrate or some shit? What happens? And by the way, uh, what uh, our man Jameson Reese is talking about is not a personal fantasy. I personally have reviewed Department of Defense scenarios. Oh. I'm sorry, go on. Yeah, yes. Uh, because the idea is I, I could not survive radiated hell. Oh, yes, yes. The Department of Defense was wargaming scenarios of domestic nuclear power plants as weapons of the enemy. And uh, this is something that uh, is all too conceivable. So we have a situation in which uh, these nuclear power plants could be used in the way that they attempted to use them against Japan. And uh, though that was a failure in terms of uh, what was intended, uh, here it could well be a success, or at least do enough damage, where it, uh, it, we'll be living with the repercussions that we don't want to be living with. It's as Jameson says, who wants to live with that? Now, statistically, most of the people of color are either lining the West Coast or East Coast. Yes. So, again... The entire East Coast is a potential target. And again, if we don't have our P's and Q's together, if someone like Trump gets in, then it's going to be an, okay, do whatever you want to the white supremacist. They're, they being emboldened are going to attack. Now, if Trump loses office, they're going to attack. But their shit is not going to be as together as it is if he stays in office, I assure you. Because they're going to be, because cause, cause if I know anything about Americans, it's that they react with their emotions first. And yes. They think less. They, they, they do. And so, so for this reason, you know, if, if they're in an uproar and they're angry, you had best believe you, you're better off facing an angry enemy than you are facing one who's calm and centered. Mm-hmm. Yes. You don't want these motherfuckers calm and centered. 
if they're walking around with fucking AR-15s in, in public view and the cops aren't doing anything about it. Thank you. And, the law uh, enforcement is, is giving them the, the green light to go ahead, go to work. Yes, by the way, I missed what Derek Talley was saying about um, the little white trash piece of shit who was uh, uh, used his AR-15 to kill two people and critically injure another and uh, how he... He's, he's, the Anti-Defamation League uh, are are slamming Biden, but because he called he called him a racist. Mm -hmm. Now their claim is that he wasn't affiliated with any white supremacist group. Oh, that doesn't mean shit. <laughs> which, which again, exactly, that doesn't mean a goddamn thing because his attack was carried out yeah. on the grounds of racism, yeah. whether he admits it or not, yeah. and he was supporting. Again, even if he claims he was supporting the police, the police at that moment in time were carrying out their operations with racial intent. Yes. So that's enough to make the fact that he's defending people who have intent against people of color means that he carried out a racist attack. Thank you. Thank you. And, and this is something that many people simply cannot see they are um they're too blind to it because they think that oh we're we're using this as an excuse for everything that uh this is like uh something that is just uh we're making too much of the racial issue that this is something we're we're exploiting and uh well, this is why they're saying that is because they want it to be swept away yes they want to put their head in the sand because they don't want to acknowledge the reality either the reality is too heavy for them or or they or it means that they have to face aspects of themselves yeah. that they don't like yes. that they never addressed right because everybody has their own biases right. i'm no exception to the rule either right. although my biases are less on race and more on species right. it, well there you have it and uh so uh when it comes to uh what i'll be discussing in arc of narrative tonight i'm going to uh try and open people's eyes to some of these types of biases and uh, i always try to do that of course and uh it's amazing to me how sympathetic people feel towards aliens in movies or in unhuman or non-human entities in films uh that uh seem to share some of their characteristics and people like oh et if you remember that which aside from et Everybody in the movie E.T. was a middle-class suburban white. <laughs> That's, uh, I don't remember there being any colored people or blacks in E.T. that, uh, you know, that, that Steven Spielberg uh, flick. So it, it was uh, just an, an asinine film uh, that I found uh, offensive in so many ways. But uh, when it comes to that, that people say, oh, look at E.T. E.T.'s so cute. How could anyone want to hurt E.T.? This, these are the same kind of people who, if E.T. were instead uh, what he looked like, uh, a, a, a Filipino with Methuselah syndrome, then uh, people would feel a lot less uh, empathy or sympathy. It's, uh, uh, it's appalling to me. Uh, people feel a lot less sympathy looking at someone who might have Down syndrome or something wrong with them. And, you know, it's funny because I see more humanity in individuals who were born with birth defects than I do in people who are born normal. Yes, yes. So and, in my case, yeah. it's quite the opposite of, of the way they, of the bias that most other people have. You know, most people would see someone with some kind of defect and they'll point and laugh. I've experienced this. I've experienced this in schools where there have been kids who might have been abnormal for whatever reason. And, you know, kids would laugh. There was one kid I know who was a black kid, and he and the thing is his hands were sort of deformed. Mm -hmm. So what he did was, you know, he, he was a particularly smart guy, too. He actually wound up making a joke of himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and people stopped laughing at him, and he started to like him. Well, there you are. He was able to channel that to comedic effect, but in but itself... It just, you, it just goes to show you the brutality that humans have. Yeah. yeah. And that this norm, this is not the exception. Yeah. And uh, it, it also goes to show us again that uh, the sadness in that, the fact that he had to capitalize, in a sense, on uh, his persecution, <laughs> that he turned his persecution into a career. <laughs> that's basically yeah. what happened. Uh, that's the just. That yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll humanize something that's not human before we humanize a human being that's different from yes. what we are. 
Yes. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I'd like your book review, um, if you can find it on a book. Now, I'm in no way, of course, as people know, anyone who's sympathetic to communism or Marxism. But uh, this book has some other aspects to it. Uh, certainly, many of the people who I respect it in terms of their providing a, uh, a, an important perspective on history, such as uh, Howard Zinn. Uh, Howard Zinn is an individual who wrote a definitely leftist, in the Marxian sense, history called The People's History of the United States, which uh, pretty much uh, gave everybody a perspective on history that was, other than the ideological bent of Marxism, quite valid. And the difference between many of these Marxists, e even ideological communists uh, like Marxists, uh, don't tend to rewrite history entirely. They simply filter it through their ideological prism. Once you filter that prism away, most of their history tends to be fairly valid. Uh, just uh, don't allow yourself to buy into the uh, stupid and utterly boring and, uh, and completely ineffective ideology. Uh, no. but, but so uh, a less of an interest in the information itself. Right. Uh, and someone who likes to, I, I, I like to, I, I like the pure meat of it rather than the, the uh, what, are, than the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, sort of ethical ideas that people have. It's, it, it's, it's like what Brendan uh, Zogut was talking about that book he was reading where the guy gives like a hundred and so pages about, oh yes, this is not real. Remember, this isn't real. Yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, but uh, when it comes to uh, one individual that comes to mind so that people get a better understanding of where Jameson Reese is coming from, uh, there's an individual who lives in San Francisco who uh, is 81 years old. He's a former professor and industrial designer. And uh, he identifies, having known him a little peripherally over the years, he identifies more as an artist than an academic, uh, though um, his ties to technology's early days kind of makes him the ideal guide uh, for a journey into just what he wrote about in the book that he published. So I'm recommending this to uh, J. Mo Reese particularly. But uh, David Kubrin is his name, and his surname is spelled K-U-B-R-I-N, Kubrin, and like Stanley Kubrick, it's a Kubrin, and uh, he's Jewish, that's uh, certainly what he's kind of uh, capitalized on. Uh, he studied at the California Institute of Technology with world-renowned physicists, including Richard Feynman, or Feynman, uh, depending on which dialect you pronounce it with, but... Uh, he definitely um, began to investigate the supernatural. And so what he wrote was a book called uh, Marxism and Magic. And uh, so in, in the book that he wrote, I, I think that, uh, or it might be Marxism and Witchcraft. If you look up David Kubrin, you know, uh, it's one of these, uh, the most important thing that he did, in my opinion, was that uh, he felt that he's offering an alternative to science as we understand it with what he calls a people's science. So he has an ideological bent to this. But the reason that it's important to distinguish the leftists from the rightists is that the right-wing reactionaries will revise and rewrite history completely. They'll just yeah. make it up. Uh, with the leftists, like I said, they usually stick to history, but they, they filter it. So if you get rid of the ideological filter of this Judeo-Bolshevik, what he's really saying is that you cannot be an activist without working on your inner issues, and nor can you work on inner issues without acknowledging that there be massive discontinuities in society that need to be addressed. So I think that that is probably one of the most resonant perspectives that he has with myself that I've encountered in a long time. So when he wrote Marxism and Witchcraft, what he was basically saying is that he was trying to offer a history that is not wedded, a people's science, uh, that it's not wedded to white supremacy or misogyny, wherein nature is not ours for the having and taking, and women are not vilified or burned at the stake for sustaining life. Now, the reason he says something like this is because most people are familiar with the wars against the witches, the executions and the burnings of thousands of women, 
and most assume it happened in the Dark Ages, but it overlapped with the emergence of science and rationalism. Women stepping forward to fight for a clean environment because they recognized children were getting sick from unclean environments, they were seen as blocking modernity. They were seen as a threat to industrialization. So persecution was essential to make way for a capitalist economy. Now remember, I'm a national socialist. And what I'll tell you is that capitalism and communism are far closer to each other than you would imagine. The reality is the only healthy alternative is fascism. But that's where I'm coming from. So, basically, I think that um, I'd like to hear a review from Jameson Reese on uh, David Kubrin's book. So if you could find that, I don't know if you can look that up on Amazon right now and tell me if I've got the right title, Marxism and Witchcraft. Sure I just don't want to drop the, uh, what do you, bandwidth. Okay, but... understood. Oh, good point, good point. <laughs> don't look it up. <laughs> Not right now. Look that up after transmission's over. But I hope that that's something you look into. I'll speak into it more in depth in the near future. But the important thing to realize is that this individual who has this uh, background from the uh, high technology uh, universities and academia is showing that uh, there's an importance in magic. In fact, I'll go a little bit further. Um, basically, uh, Kubrin subscribes to systems that can heal and revive and wed discovery with ancient wisdom and a dash of everyday magic, both divine and practical. And what he's really saying is that science comes with models, grand schemas of what nature is about, and that these grand schemas become part of a vocabulary and a belief system, all its own, uh, the law of entropy, being an example that led us to a worship of the anti-gods, the entropic beings that uh, threaten our very universe, the very fabric of space and time, because Michael Aquino was able to shill a bunch of scientists into thinking that entropy is the wave of the future, therefore, why not go with it? Why not be on the winning team? Now, the idea that everything is running down and that we're going to end up in a universe that we can't even see the stars in, that's a belief system that's very limiting. It's a cosmic pessimism. And that's what leads to the nihilism of the cult of the kings of Edom. It's born of science, not of Satanism. It's born of a belief in physics holding premacy over metaphysics. So the people who don't understand why I quote unquote tolerate Jameson Reese as a one trick pony bringing up magic all the time, try and see it from my perspective and my background. David Kubrin himself, this elitist Jewish family that he emerged from, uh, studying at the uh, California Institute of Technology with world-renowned uh, Nobel Prize laureates. Here's an example of someone who realized that he was offered a superb education and a wrong-headed view. Now, it took a professor and a mentor that, to set him on the course to pursue more political and philosophical directions. Uh, what he was asked was, what do you think about when you shave? And he said, well, not physics. And then Kubrin went to Cornell, where Lena Shays, my former mistress and manager, her husband went to. And we saw what that resulted in for him. He was, he's working at DoorDash. And you've got an Ivy League university where Cuban himself attended, and he forged uh, new curriculums in the history of science, which led to Dartmouth and a Guggenheim Fellowship to continue his research on Sir Isaac Newton in England. And what David Kubrin was surprised and disgusted to discover was that the idealistic academic world he hoped to become part of was filled with people who were simply careerists. And he himself was denied tenure for his activism with Students for a Democratic Society. That was an actual organization, Students for a Democratic Society. And so his academic future was questionable, and he was not alone. By the mid-1970s, he identified a bifurcation among people of his generation who, following a decade or more of protests against the Vietnam War, 
had turned to inner growth and spiritual directions in the face of dashed dreams. Now, of course, a lot of this was just pure fadism, what was faddish. And it was uh, all uh, bullshit. But the important thing was that people were beginning to doubt. They were doubling down either on what they were doing politically in the streets. And that in itself was a false dichotomy. Now, what happened to Cuban was that he landed here in the Bay Area. And he was looking for a community along with his wife to support their first child's natural birth. And they found one. And this was without any prior knowledge or interest in witchcraft, because Cuban's eyes were open to its magic when he attended a local anti-nuclear protest on the occasion of the one-year anniversary of the disaster of Three Mile Island. And he found many of the organizers on that march were Bay Area witches. So it was the best demonstration he'd ever been in, or been to in his life, before or since. A wordless march, for the most part, which advocated and argued by way of procession filled with art, posters, banners, dancers. It's what we would call guerrilla theater. Now, among those who did speak were Japanese survivors of the atomic blasts in Japan and Polynesian survivors of the atomic testing in the South Pacific, which were just as much victims of a war of genocidal extermination against their race as the Japanese had been in the war against theirs in World War II. So, he got work as a draftsman and an industrial designer. That was how I originally met him at John O'Connell, because I was into industrial design as one option from my pursuit of illustration as a profession. And I had tried to originally major in electronics. So, that's how I came into contact with David Cuprin, because his work as a draftsman and industrial designer took him deep into Silicon Valley. But he's the one who convinced me to get out of it, because he didn't like what he saw there, because electronics production is literally genocidal. And what David Cuprin was referring to when he convinced me not to go into electronics, which had been recommended for me because it was high brain power and low manpower, or rather, low physical exertion, was that he was referring to the reproductive harm certain chemicals are known to cause the people on production lines. And all too often, those people on the production lines were women of color, colored women. And compared to the workers, his own exposure was minimal. Though 23 years are gone by now, he survived prostate cancer, and he remains very careful around toxins. And he also steers away from smartphones, email, and the internet itself, because he cites their harmful effects on students, not least of which are the psychological and physical effects of the computer use for short periods, let alone for the prolonged pandemic that we're all in under lockdown, looking at the computers and being very online, all day long. So he's not comfortable online for a whole range of reasons. Chiefly that it's dumbing down the culture, which is something Jameson often refers to. So in his book Marxism and Witchcraft, which from what I've seen is mostly available through independent booksellers, uh, and yet he's still stuck making a Zoom appearance at the New York Anarchist Book Fair because of COVID-19. There's an irony in that, of course. But he had this grand plan to do a book tour to the four directions, so to speak. First up the West Coast to the East Coast, Midwest and the South. But as it is, he's done one reading at Alley Cat in San Francisco when COVID-19 slammed into us. He survived one close contact with the pandemic that I'm aware of. Uh, he, he didn't contract the virus, but he was really scared there for a while. We all go through those phases. He's more mindful and paranoid than, uh, than he ever was before in a certain sense. But uh, San Francisco is home to people like this 
and that's what makes San Francisco important. It's a, it, to a considerable degree, it's built on the foundation of its artistic community, low rent and cultural vibrancy that's, that's made possible only by rent control, which otherwise without, I would be in just another homeless veteran. Now, uh, one of the things that I think that um, people need to understand is that uh, when uh, I myself finished reading the book Marxism and Witchcraft, and uh, you understand better the vortex of political systems and spiritualism, you begin to accept the fact that Western society, through its philosophy, literature, and use of language, is dedicated to colonialism and slavery, and always has been from the conquest of North and South America, and the entire Western Hemisphere, the Americas on. So we have unwisely, insanely, set science apart from the rest of the West's institutions and cultural expressions as if it's not part of the colonial project. But when you see the fruits of science as produced by the West, all you see are the results of colonial genocide, nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and the weaponization of everything. So before I let Jameson Reese kind of go into the background for tonight and I start monologuing and I do want him to stay with us throughout so that so that of course he can spell me if I need him <laughs> I, I do want to ask him if he has anything to to say about that what that brings to mind uh, for him and, uh, I think it's dead on uh, it seems like uh, most of the people who you would find on the science channel um, a lot of them have worked with uh, private contractors who uh, manufacture weapons. Thank you. Thank all, you. Basically, all we do is use science to kill people. Thank you. That's all we do. We just all, all America does is we create shit that kills people. That's all we create. Well, that and music and movies. <laughs> well, we can't we can't forget software. Uh, yes. We yes. Can't software yes. Because that's Silicon Valley is like uh, the big bread winner right now. Um, I don't know how much, because the only people seeing money from any of those uh, weapon exports uh, that America is doing are those independent corporations that manufacture weapons, weapons such as F-35 fighters that can't even stay in the fucking air. Mm -hmm. Yeah. going to be starting F-22 Raptor. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, he's quite correct. Yeah, these are scandals. Yes. Yeah. The most effective aircraft we have is probably the F-15. Uh -huh. Yes. And the A-10 Warhawk. I don't know why the fuck they decided they were going to decommission the A-10s. Stupid. Uh, oh, just insanity. Just the kind of, <laughs> uh, you know, bullshit that you see uh, all the time where they think they're going to find something to replace it. And uh, as I said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And uh, yet they're constantly trying to fix what's not broke. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna have a we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go to war with a foreign nation with planes that just start falling out the sky, and the enemy's gonna be like, we didn't even have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, so uh, in, in terms of uh, all all of this, I, I I just want people to understand. Then this will give you some of a perspective on where Jameson Reese is coming from with magic that we have people beside him who are um, operating on the magical paradigm and uh, therefore you don't think that this is all some kind of quirk, some kind of individual uh, quirk and uh, that's probably the most important thing I want to say on uh, Jameson's behalf so that people understand that when he goes into that trip, that zone, uh, and starts bringing up grimoires and the gin and, and the like that um, it's not necessarily an insane place to go. It's, it's just a, a place that may be different from what you're familiar with in terms of working with reality. So, yeah, and it's a place to tread with, with caution. I, I want to also emphasize the fact that whether you believe it or not, that occult, these, these grimoires, these entities, 
almost everyone up the chain of command, including a lot of high-ranking politicians and a lot of people in elite places, are practicing this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's very entrenched. It's very entrenched in that hidden hand that controls everything. Uh, you, 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 you're best at the acronym. I, I, I would try to pronounce it, and I would just trip over my tongue. Oh gosh, uh, yeah. Let me try and uh, remember exactly uh, what it stands for. And of course, it's uh, difficult for most people to pronounce, understandably, because it is just so long and unwieldy. So I do want people to understand, though, that it's important to. Try and remember this at least as a way to uh, to inform your friends about the pervasiveness of the military industrial complex as we refer to it for short. But it's the U.S. MIMO Nanny Sick Com, which would be the well, it's basically U.S. for United States, then M I M O E N A N I S I C dash com for complex so uh the acronym mimo nanny sick mimo nanny sick that would be military intelligence medical occult entertainment narcotics academic academic nuclear information sciences industrial congressional complex and that was uh that's literally how pervasive your military is it infests everything it infests the entertainment more than you can imagine. Movies that they produce, like the Battle of Los Angeles, which was a alien war movie, are basically Marine Corps recruiting advertisements that you pay to see and sit through for over two hours. It's that uh, that horrific in in terms of. I, say, yeah. I, I want the viewer to ask themselves why 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 this complex pushes occult memes so much. Yes. Thank you. And, 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 and it's true. It's true. And uh, so it's, um, it's something that um, you have to confront as part of your reality. And what people don't want to confront is the fact that the, their government uh, is operating on that reality, on that paradigm. They want to take the academic perspective. See, that's what Mr. Kubrin found that was so... Uh, it destroyed his scientific paradigm as he was educated was when he found out the elite was working through magical paradigms. That's why he wrote the book Marxism and Witchcraft is because he wanted to present a people's magic that could be a proletarian response to the elites. Now remember, I don't take that leftist perspective. I'm a fascist and I feel that what he's doing is destructive in the ideological sense. And and this is because, as I've said, communism and capitalism are incredibly alike. Uh, it is very true that that circle of ideology meets left and right. They ultimately meet in a circle. And uh, the only thing in the center, which is radicalized centrism, to emerge that is the viable third alter- alternative is fascism and specifically national socialism. So in that sense, I am operating from a totally different paradigm from this individual. But then again, he's ethnically Jewish. And his concept of national socialism is one of exclusivity. But he doesn't understand the real history. The real history is, yes, there were Jewish Nazis. And yes, they were the founders of the state of Israel. Before, just for mercenary, pragmatic, Machiavellian reasons, they went all out communist. And then, for purely selfish reasons, they went all out capitalist. It's uh, you can't blame Israel, of course, for looking out for itself, but in the end, you've got to realize you can't trust them. <laughs> it's that simple. They are out for themselves, so that is uh, their survival story, and it is something that uh, ultimately, well, they're paying the price. They are in the precipice of a civil war themselves. And uh, ultimately, uh, you have the more liberal, uh, progressive uh, peoples of Israel tend to be in the north, and the more reactionary uh, types of people tend to be in the south. So we may see a north and south Israel. I would prefer we do, with a dividing line, a demilitarized zone, so that uh, the Gaza Strip and uh, uh, the West Bank of Palestine 
to at least have a connection to each other. And uh, the, the division of Israel would not necessarily make it weaker any more than the division of North and South Korea makes South Korea weaker. It's just there's different cultures. Uh, and um, so beyond that, uh, so uh, do say good night to our audience, uh, dear Jameson, and uh, remain on standby. I'm going to go into monologue mode, and um, thank you for buying me time to uh, so I could get to the point where I can do that. And no uh, problem. And uh, good night, everybody. I'll be on standby. Thank you so much. And uh, so uh, please. Um, you know, respect uh, that much, and it's uh, something that uh, I do want to emphasize the fact, of course, that I'm not going to ignore uh, Donald Trump's uh, tax evasion, which is essentially uh, what it is. Uh, we have a situation where Donald Trump's personal debts are a national security threat. Uh, so, uh, and Donald Trump himself is a national security risk. Uh, so uh, we are, uh, I'm not going to ignore that, but that's for another transmission. There's simply too much to cover tonight. And uh, what I'm going to do instead is uh, try and uh, dwell on things that are more immediate. Uh, this is uh, my struggle. Uh, by the way, uh, Jameson Reese says that Trump paid uh, less taxes than, uh, what is it Jameson is saying here? If I go into, yeah, he paid less taxes than I used used to at the 20000 buck a year bracket. Thank you, Jameson. I appreciate that. By the way, Jameson, I'm sorry. you got to come on and tell me. What the fuck were you doing that got you 20000 a year? Uh, I'm sorry. you got to tell us that before you go back into the background. Tell us what, what you were doing, please. It was less than that, but I covered a lot of jobs. Uh, uh, fast food, uh, retail, retail, and then I worked at a call center. Mm-hmm. Uh, which was the most, which was, I'm sorry, go on, say what you're going to say. I was going to say, which one was the most profitable? Oh, God. Uh, the most profitable was uh, being deemed unfit to work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Why am I not surprised? It, it's, uh, you know, and I don't blame you. Shit. It's, um, at, at any rate, um, but, but go on. I'm sorry. So you were doing all these jobs and uh, basically um, did this... Well, I can see Yes. All, I, all I can say is that I got taxed more than, you know, whatever he had to pay. Uh, I got taxed more than he had to pay. And, and he did, it seems like, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure a lot of people who, I'm sure Brendan gets taxed more than he paid in taxes. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. But, but by the way, Daniel Arola says, uh, there were only white people in E.T., and uh, <laughs> Maria Grigorich says, many whites don't think they are racist because they were raised with uh, beliefs they see as normal. And, uh, and, and then Gooby Goo said, no seed oils, absolute poison. Uh, and uh, they both say, uh, I've got a nice laugh. So thank you, Gooby Goo and Maria Grigorich say that. And uh, Raymond Joy says, Douglas, uh, Trump is not trying to weed out the pedophile in the elite world, etc. He's asking this this kind of, okay, no, he's not. It's just the opposite. And um, no, there is no chance. No, God, no. Uh, by the way, Daniel Rolla brings up the fact that Stormy Daniels received more money from Trump than the IRS has gotten from Trump in 10 years. By the way, I think Raymond Joyce might be trolling in the sense that he says, no, like he was asking if uh, if Donald Trump was uh, trying to weed out the pedophilia in the elite world. And I said, no, he's not. And he's like disappointed. I mean, you got to be kidding, right? Are people out there really that naive? You've got to be pretending, right? That's uh, it's, it's kind of like Joe Biden, Biden trying to pretend that he's got the black gene or something. It just doesn't it just doesn't come out right. It doesn't come out as sincere or authentic. And you just wonder why does he do it? It just makes him it just it's just makes him look stupid. I'm not you know, uh, come on, don't be naive. It's uh, I'll, I'll tell you why after I'm done with my solicitation, then I'm going to go straight into what I experienced as an Asian and what um, something very important to my surrogate son uh, about the, the new laws in California that people have been saying are pedophile protecting laws that and this is the propaganda you get from the Trump side. 
That's what I'm fighting against. I'm going to educate you on that's Mein Kampf. That's my struggle. And my struggle be thine own. Contribute to the struggle at DouglasDietrich.com, where we now be accepting contributions via PayPal Holdings Incorporated on DouglasDietrich.com. Uh, and in all due acknowledgement unto our own personal hero, we ask it of everyone, moral and our fiscal support, on behalf of our dearest English brother in battle, uh, Mr. Jonathan Warrington. Now, I'm going to have to open up Jonathan Warrington's uh, message here so I can uh, get a little update on what he doesn't want people to try to donate uh, through. He's not using the Facebook maggot millions anymore. He's using a different outlet uh, for PayPal. So let me uh, add that to my uh, solicitation so that people can help him sometimes when they're not out to help myself. And uh, with that, of course, uh, let me try and catch people up on the magnificent John Warrington. His full name being John Henry McMills Warrington, whom you can friend and follow via his Facebook Incorporated timeline at facebook.com forward slash John dot war. Also subscribe to his YouTube channel, the Maggot Channel, at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Magator, which itself be spelled M A W G O T A U R, he being the property manage manager thereof. Whilst also serving as Team Thrax, Dietrich or Dragon's ultimate post-episodic producer and our final productions archivist at DouglasDietrich.com. Uh, for were it no for he, my all videographic works of the internationally recognized renegade military historian would have been lost. So if financial aid no be prohibitive per budgetary constraints, electronically relay monetary assistance if you have PayPal, you can donate to Maggot, uh, which is just the Celtic phrase for someone who's seeking attention, acting the Maggot, uh, by clicking send on your PayPal account page and then putting his email address john underscore war at hotmail.com. That's how he'll get it. He's not using the Facebook for Maggot Millions as it would never let him finish set up for the renewal of his Maggot Millions fundraiser. Uh, so, uh, just, um, so that you know, uh, it's, uh, John at John underscore war at hotmail.com. That's the address you would put in if you're using PayPal to give him a little bit of financial support. Uh, understand that if anyone deserves a little bit of fiscal support aside myself, it would be he, because, uh, he's the man who of his own initiative, uh, down, uh, loaded all the majority of what I produced on YouTube, uh, into his own hard drives and only via his effort in that regard, have we been able to, uh, reconstruct, uh, so much of what was lost in the three times that I was entirely scrubbed from the fucking internet. In other words, thrice, that's three times over. I have been uh, effaced from the internet, my entire legacy stripped, and it is uh, thanks to uh, uh, his efforts we were able to reconstruct uh, my legacy, and in that sense he's kind of like my creator, because he's enabled my virtual self to interact with you uh, now uh, uh, in our uh, material world via the cyber, well, by, via the internet, via the data matrix in which I interact with you in uh this is a persona in a sense a virtual persona that was his creation in the sense that without him there would be no background and without no legacy or background you would never know where i'm coming from it's only through that background that what i say in context now in present time in real time makes sense so uh there we have that and uh so let me um just erase uh, what I've had before, and uh, that way we can update the presentation for solicitations on his behalf. Uh, other than that, of course, uh, we will uh, move on uh, to my solicitation uh, for myself, because now you too can do your part to help in the fight against total annihilation, whether it be of uh, my legacy or of uh, life from the surface of the earth that the uh, cult of the kings of Edom is seeking as their ultimate objective. And don't believe for a minute 
that what I am doing is uh, selling you fear porn or peddling fear porn on uh, behalf of some kind of uh, personal fantasy. Uh, nothing in your world makes sense in terms of the lack of leadership that we have in responding to all the convergent crises which we are suffering from, whether it be the pandemic or climate catastrophe. Why is there no leadership? Why is no one doing anything? Why are we continuing on the path that we're on? Because the majority of your leaders are cultists of the Kings of Edom cult, which Michael Aquino was a part of. Uh, simply one of the better known members or more celebrated members uh, thereof. And uh, this is why they seek the destruction of all life on earth. And they feel they will ascend to godhood thereby. That's called apotheosis. Apotheosis. The ascendance into godhood. They feel they can do this by the destruction of all life on earth and thereby rendering themselves as gods. An ideology first expressed by a biologist in 1937 or so that I had uh, brought up uh, before. Uh, when I was uh, just speaking recently on, uh, well, our latest transmission uh, prior to this one, Jane Rostand. So Jane Rostand, surname spelled R-O-S-T-A-N-D, is the biologist who said, kill but one man and ye be but a murderer. Kill millions of men and ye be a conqueror or ye becomest a conqueror kill everyone and ye be as God. That is the ideology of the nihilists. As uh, that's, that's something that leads to James Mattis, the Marine Corps General, James Mad Dog Mattis. He quoted along those lines his own philosophy, be polite, be professional, and always have a plan to kill everybody you meet. This is the kind of evil that we see as a result of this ideology. By the way, some people have doubted what I said about the Israelites killing everyone in the promised land of Canaan. They killed nursing babies. Yes, that is a historical fact. How can you reconcile that with the biblical teaching of God's grace and love? This is why I'm saying the God of the Old Testament is not your God if you're a Christian. Now, all of that being said, you might converge the God of the Old Testament with the anti-gods. That would take us into a metaphysical discussion well beyond this transmission. <laughs> but returning to my solicitation, people are forever asking, Renegatus uh, Humanus Arma Ad Mazae Reducio, the renegade human weapon of mass instruction, what they can do to fight the pedopathophilocracy, such being our present Slavo Western government by patriarchy of pathological pedophiles. You can all help spread awareness by supporting myself. You too could do your part to help in the fight against total annihilation that will be brought on by the ideology of nihilism by spreading the word about Douglas Dietrich that he, the biological son of Adolphus Jacob Hitler, which you can find out more about at douglasdietrich.com forward slash 2019 forward slash 05 forward slash 08 forward slash Douglas Dietrich, son of Adolf Hitler, fighting against white supremacist neo-Nazis. Confer a while there, a footnote on mine bio sign, which, uh, would inform you the meaning of my biological father's name, what made the man Adolf Hitler, on the homepage of showsdd.com. Let it be known by spreading the word far and wide to all and sundry that the scion of Adolf Hitler, Douglas Dietrich, be alive and well and resident in the city and county of San Francisco. And if at all possible, encourage those others to electronically relay their contributions at douglasdietrich.com. Uh, we have a new contribution page on douglasdietrich.com where you can make a donation online using either that credit or debit card. Simply go to douglasdietrich.com and click that red donate button. 
All sponsors will be granted exclusive electronic access to both my videographic and audio recorded archives through to this year, from the 2011th year in our Lord, the very year mine own late and sainted matriarch, the Grandma Dame Diana Lin Zujin Takabayashi Hideko Dietrich was murdered, assassinated nigh immediately aftermath. The San Juichi Sensemi, or the 311 terror attack against the Fukushima Daiichi, or Big One, cluster of nuclear power plant facilities on site, the 7,000 islands of the greater Japanese Empire, went was deemed by much Native American cosmological reckoning that the first rays of the dawning of the sixth world broke upon us and magics could again be worked in conjunction with Mother Earth to redeem the folk upon her. They're not on YouTube anymore, where on the intra-global crises analyst Douglas Dwayne Dietrich long ago established his high-profile visibility platform for rationale of personal security by way of public promotion. Only on contribution will thy membership be processed within 48 through 72 hours, between two to three days, for full access to all mine archives, meaning all those videos that John Warrington saved aside those on the Maggot Douglas Dietrich channel and the YouTube channel named Taboo Bros 2, spelled T-A-B-O-O, space B-R-O-S, space Roman numeral 2, as managed by mixed martial arts maestro Daniel Arola, whom you can visit at facebook.com forward slash Daniel dot Arola dot 3 of Damage, D-A-M-A-G, Daniel Arola Martial Arts Group, Incorporated, Cali Combatives. Optionally mail either checks or money orders, never cash, to the personal residential address of the Mr. Douglas Dietrich, which itself be listed on DouglasDietrich.com, the most important thing being that people regularly donate what they can within their means. Foremost among Axis Daddy D's donors, aside is Lady and Mistress Lena herself, Lena Shea, uh, former Lady and Mistress, be our most beloved greater British brother in battle, the Team Drax, Dietrich or Dragons heavyweight lifting keeper of the spirits, and YouTube Bizarre HD channel managing mixologist, George Edward Knight, whom you can friend at facebook.com forward slash george.e.knight.7, he being mine own personal hero who has substantially delivered towards my salvation from the streets, and whose self-produced videos entitled How the United States Won World War I and Why We Are Still Legally at War with the Thaled Reich, both be factually substantiated per mine own expositions, and he has a new video in production, maybe even published already, uh, entitled The Thousand Year Reich in Exile, subtitled The Thaled Reich's Flugelrad and Hanabu Technology. Uh, and of course, uh, He's uh, someone whose channel that you can subscribe to is spelled uh, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash bizarre HD. Well, it's the bar bizarre HD, which you need to know how to spell youtube.com forward slash user forward slash B I Z A R E H D. There you'll find at least the Thousand Yo Reich in Exile trailered as well as the other two videos he has produced. He's published something on my timeline I haven't even yet had a chance uh, to review. And uh, our dear friend Eric Lastick has uh, just uh, sent me another poem prior to the show, which I didn't have a chance to review either. Um, so I'm going to take a look at that later. Um, one of the things that uh, I do need to emphasize is that the last Dietrich of Gouviers, the son of Dietrichs, or son of a dragon's, uh, Anglo corrupted as Dracula's, expositions via YouTube would not be possible sans generous benefactions from my listeners on a monthly basis. The Amerasian agent of the Peacock Angel, Tavush Melia, be the only person on the surface of this world with the insider knowledge and experience necessary to lead thy resistance against the Russo sub satanic occupation and anti godly insurgency, it bearing no end of emphasis that Judy, Anglo corrupted as Jedi, literally Master D or the Master of Enlightenment myself, is not paid to articulate mine expositions and have never once been remunerated for my services rendered unto thyself and all thy holdest dear at incomparable sacrifices to myself most tragically of all mine loved ones in my most singular and quite unenviable role as the ultimate public informant at personal risk still at large your taxation cannot support myself as i be denied access to the United States Department of Veterans Affairs benefits and our services do dishonorable discharge. So again, go to DouglasDietrich.com and click Donate. The very survival of the human species be at stake, and I am not exaggerating. 
Do not wait. Donate now. It be appreciated beyond my ability to express in any language. As well, forget not to subscribe to the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Douglas Dietrich and tap click on that notification bell in order to receive notifications that live streams have started. Even if you are subscribed, you will only receive notifications if you select all in the notifications. To reemphasize, subscribe to the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Douglas Dietrich and tune in at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. That would be 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time every Wednesday and Sunday night so that you can hear our program and tap. Click on that notification bell in order to receive notifications that live streams have started. Finally, above and beyond all else, most importantly, subscribe and donate at douglasdietrich.com. Sponsors will be granted exclusive access to the online archives, including all video and MP3 recordings of Douglas Dietrich from 2011 through to the present. And a shout out on to Paquan Mireles. Paquan Mireles donated over a hundred United States dollars. God bless him and his own, but beyond that, hail and hearken all ye friends, friends and followers of Taipei Jiangan, the Taipei Repier. Because I am presenting urgent Massed prayers request for the Grand Mr. Lutz Martinez or Luz L U Z, it's often pronounced Lutz. Lutz Martinez, he is the Taco King of Flint, Michigan. The details be unknown to myself other than the need for immediate moral support from all. Do hold him in your thoughts and prayers. Now, in terms of the thoughts and prayers otherwise, let it be known that the Asian Pacific Islander American community is sad, angry, and fearful. Asian American youth are reporting anger, sadness, and fear over the surge in racist behavior in these United States. A survey has proven that 80% of Asian Americans, that's incredible, 80% are experiencing bullying, and verbal harassment. Now, here in San Francisco, we have what's called Urban School. And Caleb Lee is a junior at Urban School who helped work on a nationwide effort to track the impact of hate crimes and racism on youth. And he wishes he was surprised to hear that someone spit on an Asian American friend biking in Golden Gate Park recently here in San Francisco. A white woman told his friend, who was then 16 years of age, to go back to China and called her a slur. And another friend that he personally knew was also told to go back to China by a classmate before school shut down and called the same slur. So, Lee himself is but 16 years of age. Again, a junior at San Francisco's urban school. And he said, I was more angry and pissed off at the fact that the world just doesn't care and disregards this hate towards us. It's sort of just become a harsh reality that so many Asian American Pacific Islander individuals have been dealing with racism and hate in the form of physical and verbal harassment. Now, Caleb's words echoed some of the despair felt by Asian American youth surveyed this year by Stop AAPI Hate. That's uh, Stop Asian American Pacific Islander Hate. It's a reporting center launched by the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council. So that's got three P's in it. So it's known as A3PCON uh, or A-P-P-P-C-O-N. 
it would be A3 PECON. That's using the military style of acronym where they just put a number in for, instead of three Ps being applied into the acronym, they'll just put the number three in a P. So uh, Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council and uh, another organization involved with this project was Chinese for Affirmative Action and San Francisco State University, of which I am uh, myself an alumni. Uh, that is through its Asian American Studies Department, uh, which I was not a part of, but is a part of this project. These three groups coordinated to track more than 2,000, 2,600 incidents of racial animus since mid-March of this year when much of the country went into a shelter in place to curb coronavirus. Now, California itself, my own state, accounts for 1,135 of those incidents, just the majority of them, while 258 occurred in San Francisco as of Thursday of last week when I learned this from Caleb Lee. That's shockingly high compared to 108 in Los Angeles, 54 in San Jose, half a hundred in Oakland, 28 in San Diego, and 20 in Sacramento, the capital of my golden state near where Brendan Zogit lives. So Caleb Lee and a few other urban school students worked on this nationwide effort by Stop Double API Hate to track impact on youth, culminating in the report released on Thursday of last week entitled, They Blamed Me Because I'm Asian. Specifically, exactly, if I were to literally spell it out, it's entitled, They Blamed Me Because I Am Asian. Now, 77% of nearly a... Uh, okay, so Maria Michaela Grigorich says, Sorry to bother you, but Raymond Joyce is right. I went to uh, check your site, and uh, it says error when you're clicking donate. So I will talk to uh, Selena Khan about that. So Raymond Joyce, thank you. I, I appreciate what you're saying. And uh, thank you for trying to donate. Um, also know you, that my address is on the website. You can mail something until this is fixed, which will hopefully be tomorrow. There was a lot of sabotage done to our site. Now I'm hoping this didn't happen when our friend John Warrington was updating everything for his donations. I don't think that that would be the case. Uh, but uh, he, he's the only other person who would have the uh, the passwords, but he can get in anyway. So he's always been very good about this. So um, Selena Khan, if you're with us, do respond, which I doubt she is. I mean, God knows it's well after midnight uh, where she's at. So I will um, make certain she knows of this. Um, and of course, um, okay, sorry, this page doesn't exist. Interesting. Um, so uh, that's uh, um, basically not surprising to me. The, the entire site was uh, torn upside down, uh, just so people know. We have been uh, suffering a lot of uh, systemic hacking, and uh, so uh, that's, uh, it, it's something that will um, be brought to the attention of my managers. Uh, we hope that, um, you know, I hope that something can be done about it. It may take some time. Until then, I want to uh, thank uh, Maria Michaela Gudegoic for bringing this to my attention. And uh, we'll follow up from there. That's all I can say. Um, in the meantime, uh, I want to uh, uh, enter this into Selena Khan's... Uh, Thing here, so let me look this up. Okay, website. There we are. I'm gonna ping her with that, and hopefully, she'll see that whenever she awakens. Because right now she's retreated into slumber, more than likely, uh, most certainly has. So with that, I will continue with what I'm uh, doing. Uh, one of the things I will in encourage is that people use my personal address to mail things to me using physical mail, a check or a money order, never cash. Now, uh, when it comes to um, the youth who were surveyed in terms of this uh, Stop Double API Hate project, 77% of nearly 1,000 youth who were surveyed expressed anger over the spate of racism since COVID-19. 60% uh, said they were disappointed, and 46% expressed sadness or depression. 23%, that's almost a quarter of a hundred percentile there said they were scared. 
literally in fear of their physical safety and their very lives. They received 341 reports from youth nationally over an 18-week period, with 81% reporting bullying or verbal harassment. And 24%, that's almost a quarter of 100% right there, said they faced shunning and social isolation, while 8% reported physical assaults. Now, nearly 17% said they were harassed at school and online, respectively, and 14% were harassed in public parks. Adults were present in 48 fucking percent of the cases, but bystanders, they intervened only 10% of the time. The adults were unwilling to intervene on behalf of Asian Americans. 41% of these incidents were perpetrated by youth. The rest, meaning well over 50%, were perpetrated by adults. Now, nearly 60% of verbal harassment involved blaming Chinese people for the COVID-19 pandemic, either as being infected or as the source, while nearly 26% related to dietary habits, like shaming Asian Americans for supposedly eating bats or dogs. One 17-year-old reported that a white man online told him his insides were full of bats and to die by suicide for being a dirty fucking dog eater. Now, Russell Jung, who I consulted, is a San Francisco State professor who helped start the Stop Double API Hate project. And I quote him as saying, historically, we've seen upticks in racism in pandemics, war, and economic downturn. And here we have all three. You think San Francisco is this progressive liberal town, but again, I think, these are his words, COVID fears and political rhetoric has really screwed up a lot of anger. So San Francisco, my Golden Gate city of residence, has double the number of physical assaults compared to nationwide. That's according to Dr. Yoon, surname spelled J-E-U-N-G, which is, of course, but a romanization of the Chinese characters, has confirmed density of San Francisco, the concentration of, of residences, the sheer uh, congestion may explain the numeric concentration of incidents. Even in places like the city of San Francisco and New York City, where overtly welcoming attitudes of immigrants are expressed historically and contemporarily, but ultimately, Dr. June confirms that political rhetoric is to blame. President Donald Trump has repeatedly targeted Red China for the virus and used epithets like Chinese virus without qualifying it as Red Chinese. Instead, he uses more all-encompassing racial terms like Kung Flu, which get picked up by right-wing media. Trump has also heightened tensions between the Twa empires, the American empire and the communist Chinese empire, leading to a Cold War-like state of relations that ripples to individual behavior. This is why Dr. Kubrin, the author of the book Marxism and Witchcraft, is saying that you cannot separate your individual development from societal development. If you're developing yourself, without helping society, you're not doing anyone else any good. And how developed, how enlightened does that make you? So the end result is we have to really take into account what we can do to help others if we want to help ourselves. Now, in terms of uh, helping myself, uh, obviously something's wrong with the website. It might take a while to fix. It has been sabotaged. We're going to investigate this and uh, do what we can. But in the meantime, send it through the mail. 
and uh, honestly, give yourself an adventure, take a trip out, get a money order or a uh, check my way, and uh, the address is right there on the website, 1242 Green Street, 1242 Green, like the color green, San Francisco, California, 94109. That's the area code, 94109. Now, in terms of uh, Dr. Yu, I will also quote him in that he said, I just find it very debasing and dehumanizing that others can treat people that way. Now, his wife, his own wife, was deliberately coughed upon by a man in Oakland who went up to her and coughed on her, just uh, saying, I'm getting back at you chinks. You know, people are wanting to share their stories in the Asian American community, and they're wanting it to stop from happening. By having that collective voice, we're pushing for more bystander intervention. I cannot understand. Uh, now, uh, Jameson Reese is asking, why didn't the professor knock that dude out? I don't believe he was actually physically there. His wife related to him what had happened when she uh, came home. But I thank uh, Jameson for asking. Uh, if he was physically there, who knows? Maybe the guy was just uh, too big for him, and uh, <laughs> and he was uh, he was afraid to uh, uh, do anything, which is often the case. Uh, it's one of the reasons we need bystander, uh, you know, intervention. Just uh, we need more people to start a crowd reaction. If someone reacts from out of the crowd. Sometimes the rest of the crowd will follow their leadership and react as well. Crowds are like that. Crowds are at the cellular level of mentation or processing. They'll follow the leader. If you inspire the crowd by helping, the rest of the crowd may help. Take the risk. Unless, of course, you feel that it's going to uh, end your life, then at least call the police. At which point the police should have been called anyway. So, on an individual level, witnesses should attend to the targeted person to make sure that they are safe and to show social support. Uh, I myself would not recommend engagement. Of course, uh, as Jameson Reese says, he would uh, risk his life uh, to defend a woman, and uh, that's commendable. Uh, of course, just remember that should none of this immediately transpire, people being targeted should call out and ask for assistance or approach someone nearby and express their concern. Now, on a larger level, anti-racism training for teachers and administrators while implementing ethnic studies is part of the answer. Grassroots community workshops and signage in stores help foster an anti-racist culture too. The long-term goal is to change the narrative of Asian Americans as silent, complacent model minorities who blend into white America because the social fallout from the pandemic has proven the very false and very harmful stereotype internalized in Asian American Pacific Islander minds as well. In the meantime, what the double A, what the Stop Double API Hate Project is hoping is that workshops and preparing teachers will prevent aggression when uh, campuses open again. So as for the young man who spracketh with myself in the company of Dr. Zhu, uh, Mr. Lee said, there's a slight amount of fear and worry in the back of our mind that when we return, we might receive hate or racist comments when schools reopen. Uh, but more than that, we have hope for this. By spreading awareness, it will eventually reduce the hate because people might understand what they haven't understood before. That COVID-19 is not going to be the last time. There are going to be other pandemics emerging in the conditions of climate catastrophe, and you can't always conveniently find a scapegoat. Now, that brings us to the other uh, minority that I will advocate for. 
And uh, as I said, uh, I might end a bit early tonight simply because we don't even have a valid, uh, you know, donate button open, which is uh, part of uh, what the sabotage intended, of course. It's one of those things that simply makes the very situation of producing my, uh, my programs almost untenable. Uh, a constant attack that's unending, ceaseless, but then again, my expressing myself, advocating for what I do, is what threatens them to the point where they do what they do to prevent my ever earning a living or earning some way to maintain myself through what I'm doing. So do bear in mind, make that extra effort, put a stamp on an envelope, and uh, get a check or money order out. It's uh, probably the best way to do it. You'll find the address on the website. Douglas Dietrich, 1242 Green Street, San Francisco, California, 94109. That'll get it here. Now, in terms of the right wing, the alternative Q culture, they're promoting this myth that Governor Gavin Newsom of California signed protection for pedophiles into law. And uh, this, of course, is something that's been promoted for some time now. It is something that is beyond reprehensible. Uh, it, it is something that is, of course, a lie. And it is not at all what's going on. So let me try and educate you on this subject. Because this is one of those incredibly sensitive, touchy subjects, which if I'm misquoted, people are going to draw conclusions that have nothing to do with anything I've said. By the way, thank you, Raymond Joyce, for making the effort. And uh, thank you, Maria Michaela Grigorich, for your own. Now, pedophiles are not protected under the very recently passed California Senate Bill 145. So, SB, Senate Bill 145, is not a pedophile protection law. Unfortunately, we are currently living in a reactionary time. We hear something, and instead of researching and confirming, we simply react. Most of the time, our reactions are based on emotion and fear, not logic. That's where I enter as your Vulcan intervention. Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek franchise brought you the character of Spock as half-human, half-Vulcan, generally the embodiment of logic, but merely, in his own way, the embodiment of the culture, the philosophical culture of the Vulcan race, their philosophy being that of Kolinar, the way of the Vulcans. Kolinar is merely a Gene Roddenberry trademarked Star Trek franchise name for the philosophy of Confucianism. And, oh dear, uh, I'm finding out from uh, Selena Khan that uh, Raymond Joyce has followed up and found out that the my mail in address is not visible on the website either. So, uh, she's right. I, I, it's good of her to inform myself immediately. Uh, it's obviously something that uh, Selena Khan will tend to as soon as possible. And uh, she'll wake up in a relatively short period of time, the morning coming before you know it, on the Atlantic seaboard. But it is a situation in uh, which I'm not at all surprised. It's tragically all part of the ongoing uh, assault, uh, an endless, never-ending assault against myself. Um, so, 
Here's the address for Douglas Dietrich. Use it. 1242 Green Street. 1242 Green Light like the Color Green. San Francisco, California. Zip code is 94109. 94109. And that will get what you're sending to my home. Now, in terms of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek franchise, the culture of the Vulcans was but an allegory for the politics of his time, which are the politics of our time. That of free China, represented by the Vulcans, and the Romulans, representing communist China. The Vulcans and the Romulans were ethnically identical, of the same genotype. The only thing that severed them, separated them, made them enemies, was ideology. And it was in fleeing from the totalitarianism of the Romulans that the Vulcans encountered Earth and incepted a Vulcan intervention at Earth's request in the aftermath of a nuclear conflagration that annihilated a great deal of the human race, which was then suffering from hunger, sickness, despair. The Vulcans instituted incepted a golden age for humanity that led to the United Federation of Planets, in a sense, by proxy, a Vulcan Empire. Because the Vulcans, in return, guided the Federation into their first interstellar war against the Romulans. That is the actual canon, the actual timeline of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek universe. The Romulans being the second contact in enmity, in open conflict, after the Vulcans, who were first contact, the Vulcan intervention being so important to the human evolution, to the evolution of the human species, that in the Star Trek franchise of Gene Roddenberry, the entire human calendar is reinstated with Vulcan contact designated as year one. In other words, the most important event since the Messiah in the human experience. That's in the Star Trek franchise. So, uh, in terms of Confucianism, it is the state religion of Taiwan on which I was born. And that is what I provide you now, is the beginnings of your Vulcan intervention. I am essentially your Spock in this universe. In reality half Caucasian and half Asian, as Spock was half human and half Vulcan, and presenting to you a logic with which to understand what is going on around you. So as soon as SB 145, or Senate Bill 145, was passed in the California Senate and signed into law by Governor Gavin Newsom, Twitter and Facebook were immediately inundated with posts shared thousands of times about how California Democrats quote-unquote just passed a pro-pedophilia bill and quote-unquote they want to protect pedophiles who lure and rape your children. And also I've seen memes, posters published all over social media saying no felony for having sex with a minor. There's even a hashtag, Save Our Children, which has started trending all over social media. This is simply wrong. The fervor over SB 145 clearly exemplifies that there is not only an intentional misconstruing of our law in an attempt to purposefully, intentionally mislead and create a reactionary fear. There is also the exacerbating factor of the fervor that came us from blatant ignorance and the complete failure to educate oneself on behalf of your average American. SB 145 has nothing to do with pedophiles and it does not shield predators who rape children. Even in a statutory rape situation, 
an adult will still be charged with a felony. The legislation merely eliminates anti-lesbian, anti-gay, anti-bisexual, anti-transgender, anti-queer, plus anti-any alternative lifestyles inequality and actually standardizes the extant rules about who is required to be on the state's sex offender registry. SB 145 is what is called in other states outside California a Romeo and Juliet law and it is limited to consensual relationships that involve non-forcible statutory rape situations and only erases the mandatory registration as a sex offender. Specifically, SB 145 is really a Romeo and Juliet, Romeo and Romeo, and Juliet and Juliet type of law. The main point being to protect a young couple who is having consensual sex, meaning that neither would have to automatically register as a sex offender. The judge and the prosecutor would have discretion. But SB 145 does not even create any new law. It only amends current law to include other non-forcible sexual acts. The cutoff is still 14 years of age. That statute the statute does not apply to minors 13 years of age and younger. So under current California law, vaginal intercourse, specifically penile vagina, between a minor 14 to 17 years of age and a partner within 10 years of age is illegal but does not require mandatory registration as a sex offender. A judge is allowed to decide if the convicted person would be placed on the sex offender registry or not. Now this distinction in the law before SB 145 disproportionately targeted alternative lifestyles teens. In other words, LGBTQ plus lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer young people were disproportionately targeted for mandatory sex offender registration because lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and other alternative lifestyle people usually cannot engage in vaginal intercourse. For example, if an 18-year-old heterosexual man has vaginal intercourse with his 17-year-old girlfriend, he can be arrested, charged, and convicted of a crime, but is not automatically required to register as a sex offender. The judge is allowed to make that decision. However, if an 18-year-old gay man had sex with his 17-year-old boyfriend, the judge, until now, would have been required by law to automatically place the adult on the sex offender registry, regardless of the circumstances. Therefore, SB 145 only amends current state law to include other types of intercourse, such as oral, anal sex, and digital penetration, meaning you're aggressively fingering someone. SB 145 eliminates an inequality and discrimination in a sentencing law that has harmed alternative lifestyles practitioners of younger age. In other words, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgenders, queers, or other curious people exploring their sexuality with each other as related to California's sex offender registry. To be clear, SB 145 has no effect on the level of crime prosecuted or sentencing for that crime. It only takes away 
automatic sex offender registration and leaves it up to a judge to make it that determination. The laws against sex with minors remain intact. It is still illegal in my golden state to have sex with a minor under the age of 18. More importantly, nothing in SB 145 would protect any individual who commits a sex offense against a minor under 14 years of age, nor can they take advantage of the discretionary relief provision. Luring a minor for sex is also not protected under this bill at all. Those types of sex offenders are indeed undeniably predatory and would not benefit from the changes in SB 145, Senate Bill 145. Our golden state is simply edging, inching towards equal rights in all forms of laws to lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgenders, queers, and other alternative lifestyles practitioners. Unfortunately, advances towards equality under the law such as SB 145, are immediately marred with personal biases and fear-mongering. That is what will ultimately destroy us all. Those who conclude without thought. It's called prejudgment. The word for prejudgment is prejudice. Pre judicialism. Now, in terms of our, let me take a look into the live chat. Uh, so I hope people are seeing something now. I hope that's positive. Um, anyhow, let me know what's going on. Daniel Arola says to react is to act on impulse sans prior discernment of the moment slash situation at hand. As a martial artist, I promote practice to become the action. That is not a reaction. Thank you, sir. I should have had you on tonight. Do come on when you can. Uh, let me know when you're available on any given night. Uh, always good to have you step in for at least a few moments. And, uh, and uh, Raymond Joyce is saying, comment on the pandemic, if you will. Please, Raymond, uh, plandemic itself is a term that implies conspiracy. And uh, then he brings up Judy Mikovitz. Oh, please, please. Anyhow, I shouldn't even read out the name. Uh, giving uh, promotion uh, to this clown. I've, I've, I've discussed that in the past and totally deconstructed it. Okay, we're talking about, by the way, that woman is a mercenary for the Russians, in the sense of a mercenary propagandist. I will come back to COVID-19 as a very real disease within arc of narrative tonight, inescapably, at least transitionally. Let's start with a brief, very brief, summary of what's going on with the economy and the government shutdown, as brief as possible. Disney is laying off 28,000 United States employees as the pandemic chews into its parks and resorts business. The cuts account for a large chunk of the division's 100,000 person American workforce, and most will affect part-time workers. Disney's profit dropped a whopping 91% in the first three months of 2020. As pandemic precautions all but halted its profitable park and resort operations, it's a tale as old as time across travel and tourism industries. Airline employees, including pilots, have endured huge furloughs and reduced hours, and some worry, sans further assistance, the airline industry may not ever be able to recover. Despite it all, new research shows Americans feel better about the economy, short-term business outlooks, the job market, and their financial prospects now than at any point during the pandemic. Which brings me to the fact that the Senate has voted to advance a stopgap spending bill to avert a looming government shutdown. 
Neither party wants a shutdown right now, especially so close to the election. And this bill should help keep the government running until December 11th. Without a measure in place, government funding was to set to expire at midnight tonight. Think about that, because we're already past midnight on the East Coast, where your government resides in the District of Columbia. Meanwhile, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer took control of the Senate floor yesterday and is forcing a procedural vote on a bill that would protect people with pre-existing conditions if the Supreme Court sides with the Trump misadministration and strikes down the Affordable Care Act. This is extremely rare since the majority leader, now Mitch McConnell, usually controls what gets considered on the floor. Any senator can do what Chuck Schumer did, but it's usually avoided because doing so regularly would shut down the Senate. Mm. And now, I will take us down what's going to be a wide and varied arc of narrative, so long as I can stand it. I may have to shut down early tonight, uh, simply based on exhaustion, with all that I've been dealing with, and the fact that donations cannot be made outside of my mailing address, which again is 1242 Green Street, like the color green, San Francisco, California, 94109. Mail a check or money order there. If you've never done so before, consider it an adventure. Just a stamp and provide some help. It's much needed. Now, in terms of the debate, and I'll have to take a sigh here and censor myself. The first presidential debate went down last night, and it was, in a word, the most neutral term I can find for it, or I can think of, would be chaotic. President Trump bulldozed the evening by repeatedly interrupting, talking over, and disregarding Joe Biden and Fox News' own Chris Wallace, the debate's supposed moderator. Trump dodged questions about his pandemic record and openly called the race for a vaccine a very political thing. He also refused to denounce white supremacists, even as Wallace gave him ample opportunities to do so. Over the course of the evening, Biden called Trump a clown, a racist, and the worst president America has ever had. So if you were looking for a deeper insight into either man's policies, you were fresh out of luck and probably as exhausted as I myself feel about the entire situation. It's uh, enough to break one's spirit. Um, so, uh, by the way, uh, I do want to... Uh, say that I got a, another message from uh, Michaela Grigorich, who says, I checked again, I still don't see the address, but I'm exhausted. I am off to bed. Good night. Let me know if uh, you need me for anything. Love you. Love you too, hon. And uh, so, uh, it, really, I couldn't, I couldn't even exist without this help from so many volunteers. Uh, without uh, the volunteers and without the donations, Literally, I would die. So, do make the effort. 1242 Green Street, San Francisco, California. 94109 is the zip code. And um, do send donations. They are, um, they're needed. They're, there's something, especially in this time and place. It's just, uh, with everything that's going on, uh, I need compensation just to survive. And, uh... What we had, of course, was one nasty debate. The first presidential debate devolved into angry insults and accusations, 
as President Trump and former Vice President Joseph Biden clashed over the pandemic, the future of the Supreme Court, and more. Shouting, insults, and misinformation dominated this first presidential debate as President Trump sought to close a persistent polling gap and mobilize his base, his cult, with conspiracy theories that veered into words of encouragement for a white supremacist group and pro-Trump poll watchers engaging in voter intimidation. Now, the event in Cleveland quickly uh, devolved into an incoherent back and forth. Frontrunner Joseph Biden, whose main goal in the debate was to reassure voters that the incumbent's caricature of him as frail and incompetent is without merit, angrily pushed back as the president tried to bait and taunt him. Neither man emerged from the night unscathed, but the cringeworthy 90 minutes of yelling and finger-pointing, which moderator Chris Wallace could scarcely control, hardly seemed to change the contours of this acrimonious race. Trump made no apologies throughout the night, even when the sparring turned to the racial injustice that has sparked protest throughout America. When asked if he would condemn white supremacists, he urged the far-right group Proud Boys to stand by and stand by, words that that group took as a rallying cry. And as it became clear that Trump's strategy was to badger and berate Biden at every turn, the Democrat called Trump a liar, a fool, a clown, and unpresidential. And at one point, Biden said, Will you shut up, man? His campaign quickly put the line on a t-shirt. What a mess. If you like the chaos, the insults, the rule-breaking, and the fury of President Donald Trump's White House term, you must have loved last night's debate. And if you had money on the President of the United States refusing to condemn white supremacists and threatening to take the election all the way to the Supreme Court if he loses, you're counting your winnings right now. To call Trump's clash with Democratic nominee Joe Biden a debate is to give it too much credit. At the start, it seemed as if Biden might be blown away as he blinked in the face of the president's rants, interruptions, lies, and complaints. But as the night wore on and Biden held up, the story instead became all about the executive commander-in-chief's extreme behavior on stage which sometimes led to shouting matches with both Biden and the moderator. Trump is trailing in the race five weeks from Election Day. Unless he can make good on his claims to have unearthed a silent majority of like-minded cultists, he must reverse his losses among women and independents. But with a rule-flouting performance that was the personification of his Twitter feed, Trump likely exacerbated questions about his own fitness for office, though his scorched-earth approach will surely have delighted his loyal base cultists, his voters. It would have been an extraordinary performance for a down-ballot candidate. But coming from a president in control of the nuclear codes, charged with navigating the empire through the worst health crisis in a hundred fucking years, the most punishing economic slump in well nigh a century, 90 years, and the deepest racial reckoning in half a hundred years, it was more than a little troubling. The president's best moments of the night came as when he appeared to silence Biden with his relentless attacks on law and order. But, as has oft times been the case, 
Trump might have ruined his victories with his own instincts. When asked to condemn white supremacy, he instead equivocated on the Proud Boys group, a far right radicalized Russo collaborationist organization. Trump saying, Proud Boys, stand back, stand by. Stand back and stand by. Obviously, a call for intimidation. Await his orders to attack. While under a barrage of heckling, Biden wasn't especially impressive for much of the debate either. Saying at one point, after Trump tried to talk over him, Will you shut up, man? Pathetic. Biden did land some decent blows on Trump on the pandemic, health care, and racial justice if any voters could hear through the cacophony. And it wasn't hard to look like a statesman compared to the demagogue with whom he shared the stage. At the end of the night, for all the bitterness, the debate did serve one purpose. It clarified the question at the center of the election. Do Americans want four more years of the miscreant misbehavior showcased by Trump on Tuesday night. In the meantime, no one who suffered through what DA CNN's own Dana Bash rightly called a shit show will be looking forward to the candidate's next clash on the Ides of October. Mid-month, my birth menses, my natal menses, my birth month, now, in terms of my ultimate analysis on this, this was the worst debate in American history. I can tell you that as a professional historian. Trump talked and talked on Tuesday night. But politically speaking, it added up to nothing. Even for Donald Trump, there was something particularly over the top about his debate performance against Joseph Biden last night. I mean, you might ask, what does the worst debate in American history look like, Doug? It looks like the debate that took place yesterday night between President Donald Trump and the former Vice President Joseph Biden. It was a joke, a mess, a disaster, a shit show, a dumpster fire, a national humiliation. No matter how bad you thought the debate would be, it was worse. Way worse. Trump shouted, he bullied, he hectored, he lied, and he interrupted over and over again. Remarkably enough, it was seemingly on purpose. Losing in the polls, and with the country stricken by a pandemic that has claimed over 200,000 American lives, the president offered incoherent bluster, inflammatory racism, and personal attacks on his opponent's son. But mostly what came through was Trump's refusal to shut up. He talked and talked and talked. He talked over Biden. He talked over the moderator, Fox News' Chris Wallace. He talked over Biden some more. How bad was it? The line that history is likely to record as among the most memorable was Biden's lament at the end of the debate's very first segment. Will you just shut up, man? This is so unpresidential. This is so unpresidential. Mark those words to the extent that there was a substantive headline. It was Trump's refusal to disavow white supremacy. After, it should be noted, claiming that he has been great for African Americans. And his continued campaign to undermine public confidence in the upcoming election by baselessly asserting that ballots will be interfered with. Showing once again that his plan of attack is to attack the very idea of voting it itself. Trump said of the election this is not going to end well. He repeated it for emphasis. And it most certainly 
can only be interpreted as a direct threat to you. This is not going to end well. Biden, for his part, made a strong argument for the overall disastrousness of Trump's tenure, speaking in especially caustic terms about Trump's botched response to COVID-19. At one point, Biden saying, you're the worst president America has ever had. And later he added, under this president, we've become wicker, well, weaker, sicker, poorer, more divided, and more violent. It was a tough line and potentially even memorable, but Trump's crosstalk kept it from being memorably delivered, which was true of many of the specifics that Biden sought and often failed to get across. Biden hardly mentioned, for example, the New York Times' revelation this week that Trump, a self-proclaimed billionaire who has refused to release his tax returns, unlike all previous presidents for the past four fucking decades, had paid only $750 in federal income tax for each of the first two years of his administration. Instead, both Biden and Wallace were left sputtering by Trump for much of the evening, which is not a good look for either an aspiring president or a journalist who is generally admired for his tough questions. At times, Trump succeeded, if that's the right word for it, in getting them both to descend to his level. Biden slinging a few insults of his own, calling Trump at various points racist, a clown, and even Putin's puppy, which I personally like. Mm. Wallace, himself visibly frustrated and not sure what to do about it, was left to lecture Trump about not following the rules that Trump's own campaign had agreed to, but Wallace was completely powerless to stop the rampaging president. A true impotente. Limp dick. Trump even interrupted Biden as he attempted to finish his very last sentence at the end of the debate. The whole thing was hard to follow and nearly unwatchable, as if you'd stumbled into a family's dinner table fight over politics and Trump was the drunk belligerent uncle who would just not stop talking but could not make a coherent point. With such tumult, of course, neither candidate was able to communicate much about his plans for the country, which seemed to be Trump's point. About midway through the debate, the evening's low point came, just as predicted, when Trump attacked Biden's son Hunter, talking about his history of drug abuse. Trump asking, Was it cocaine? and falsely claiming that he had been dishonorably discharged from the United States military. An honor few other than myself can actually claim it being such a rare event. And that Hunter had received millions from the wife of the former mayor of Moscow. This was no surprise in the hours before the debate. Axios publishing an item about Trump's plan to do just that. In the end, the only shock was that Trump chose to launch the attack as Biden spoke about his other th son, Bio, who had died of cancer after serving in Iraq and being exposed to depleted uranium thereby. And going on to a career in public service like his father, prior passing. Now, Biden, perhaps because of the Trump campaign had put him on notice, maintained his composure, though there were more than a few times when he flashed his famous Biden grin in disbelief at what he was hearing. That look at the camera and breaking the, um, how do we say it? Uh, breaking the third window, so to speak, they say, that, that when you're looking directly at the audience and communicating with them, 
that look of can you believe this shit you know when the character turns away from all the other characters in the comic strip and looks out that frame at the reader as the longest 90 minutes of many people's lives wore on <laughs> biden was at his best as the personification of the exhausted america he hopes to lead shaking his head and commenting on the trumpian tantrum as it played out on stage across from himself biden at one point saying he just pours gasoline in the fire constantly later the democratic nominee observed when wallace tried to shame trump into abiding by the agreed upon rules he never keeps his word when trump bragged about his response to the coronavirus pandemic insisting that we are doing phenomenally and then claiming he had not been against wearing masks while making fun of biden for wearing masks the former vice president again assumed the role of wary narrator for the public biden saying he's been totally irresponsible he's a fool on this with the election now less than five weeks away, the question of Trump's foolishness and whether it will do him in politically will soon enough be answered. Trump's debate performance will not help him in that respect. The race was Biden's to lose before the debate, and it almost certainly will remain that way after this debate. As of last night, the real clear politics national polling average had Biden up by six points nationally, and 538 had Biden up by seven points, a wider margin than any candidate has had at this point in an American general election since Bill Clinton trounced Bob Dole circa 1996. And those polls were before the New York Times' revelations about Trump's taxes. Even the setting of yesterday's debate at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, underscored Trump's political weakness. Four years ago, he won Ohio, a bastion of his white working class supporters, by eight points. Hours before the debate, a new Fox News poll showed Biden leading Trump in Ohio by five points. And the Cook Political Report changed its rating for the state from leans Republican to toss up <laughs> with Trump in a corner everyone expected him to lash out at Biden with particular viciousness he does not do defensive crouches he does nasty he counter punches this is after all Trump's mantra his lifelong habit Trump actually wrote on Twitter way back in 2012 when someone attacks me I always attack back, except a hundred times more. But even for Trump, there was something particularly outrageous about his debate performance last night. It was more of a primal scream than a political appearance. A rant by a man who not only cannot control himself, but for some reason thinks he doesn't even have to try. Who could this possibly have been designed to persuade? For the last few months, as polls have shown the decisive suburbs slipping away from him, Trump has talked about his appeal to the suburban housewives of America. If there be a single additional suburban housewife, or any woman, who is voting for Trump after that debate, I myself would like to meet her. The bottom line is that Trump's chances for a second term are dwindling fast. He knows it, which is why he will not shut up on the debate stage or anywhere else for the next 34 days. At this point, there is only one way for, to get Donald Trump to shut up. In his very first answer of the evening, he said, Elections have consequences. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do we know that? To which America will soon have its chance to reply, yes. 
you orange motherfucker, they do. One of those consequences has been coronavirus, with over a million deaths around the world as officially acknowledged. The COVID-19 death toll has hit one million amid fears of renewed outbreaks. Let me emphasize that fact and let it sink in. Mull on that. Because that's war level exterminatory campaign death rate. That's called mega death in military nomenclature. The COVID-19 pandemic has claimed the lives of well over one million people. A grim milestone that be but one metric of a scourge that has ravaged lives and economies, mocked nations of, well, destroyed any notions of stability and evoked a seemingly bygone era of plagues. It has brought great cities to a standstill, shuttered schools, and unleashed social and political tumult. It has brought restrictions on where we can go and when, prompted mask mandates and reshaped the world and the ways we live and die. And still it goest on. There was a man I saw on Asian news, Imong Maulana, and between digging graves in Jakarta, Indonesia, for an endless line of victims, he was quoted as saying, it feels like it's never going to end. More than a fifth of the recorded lives claimed worldwide have come in these United States. Brazil, under Bolsonaro, the Trump of the tropics, has suffered the second highest number of deaths, followed by the Trump of Asia, Narendra Modi's India. Experts in those tw- other countries worry that a recent uptick in cases presages a renewed outbreak. So could the cold weather flu season in the Northern Hemisphere. The United States' own infectious disease is chief. Dr. Anthony Fauci has gone out on a limb to say, don't ever, us- don't ever underestimate the potential of this pandemic. Now, more than 63 million people in India have contracted COVID-19 that we knowest of. That's according to studies they themselves conducted, what they're officially willing to cop to. That stunning figure is 10 times higher than the official tally for that country of 1.3 billion people, as officials acknowledge cases are severely underreported. In these United States, two new studies have confirmed that coronavirus cases have surged among young people just as colleges got back in session. Our colleges have earned themselves an F minus for reopening. It being one arbinger of the increased fall and winter outbreaks so many medical experts have warned us all about. Some European leaders, like United Germany's Angela Merkel, have reinstated restrictions in preparation for this predicted winter surge. On a positive note, the World Health Organization has announced a deal to make just about 120 million rapid COVID-19 tests available to low- and middle-income countries across the globe. And early data show as promising results from Regeneron's antibody cocktail to treat coronavirus patients. 
But the best note of all, the high note, is that by practically every metric, my golden state of California is steadily beating back the pandemic. But our officials are watching data that could suggest a second surge of the virus is on the way, as confirmed by our governor, Gavin Newsom. Now, the most important national security question Trump and Biden needed to address, but never even approached. Be that the fact that as the world braces for the inevitable second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, there is also growing concern in the counterterrorism, scientific and global public health communities over the potential future threat posed by bioengineered pathogens. Now, but a few weeks ago, scientists at the United States Military Academy at West Point warned that, well, I'll just read their warning. The wide availability of the protocols, procedures, and techniques necessary to produce and modify living organisms combined with an exponential increase in the availability of genetic data is leading to a revolution in science affecting the threat landscape that can be rivaled only by the development of the atomic bomb. Now one scenario prompting particular concern is a contagious virus created or modified by a terrorist network or other bad actor that is then deliberately unleashed into the general population, potentially causing even more death and disruption around the world than COVID-19. Microsoft founder Bill Gates actually went on record in April of this year to say that a bioterror attack involving a pathogen with a high death rate is kind of the nightmare scenario. Now, I, of course, was not only educated in medical journalism, attaining the credit equivalent of a master's degree therein. But of course, I was a Department of Defense research librarian. So, at the time that I was involved with the DOD, the Department of Defense, I don't believe there was even a CTC, or a Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. There is one now that leverages its network of scholars and practitioners to understand and confront contemporary terror threats. And since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the rising level of concern about the bioterror threat among some of the best and the brightest minds should be a Category 5 wake-up call for all of us. Now Juan Zarate, who served as Deputy National Security Advisor for Combating Terrorism from 2005 through to 2009, recently noted in a CTC, or Combating Terrorism Center, roundtable that the severity and extreme disruption of a novel coronavirus will likely spur the imagination of the most creative and dangerous groups and individuals to reconsider bioterrorist attacks. What is especially sobering is that the pandemic has exposed the current weak capability of public health systems in even highly developed countries like these United States to even begin to respond to any potential future bioterror attack involving a deadly virus. In the past 20 decades, there have been enormous advances in the ability of scientists to engineer biological systems, a field known as SYNBIO. That's an acronym spelled S-Y-N 
BIO with the S and B in the uppercase. Synbio references synthetic biology. It's simply a foreshortening thereof. While this is a very welcome development when it comes to improving human health, it has also led to growing concern over malevolent abuse. Mm. Now, unlike in the nuclear field, where access to key know-how and materials is limited to a small number of highly vetted scientists and in which massive resources are needed to surmount the engineering hurdles to weaponization. In the SynBio field of synthetic biology, access has significantly widened around the world to knowledge, tools, and materials that could be abused to create bioweapons. These dynamics led scientists at the United States Military Academy at West Point to sound the alarm over the potential future bioterror threat posed by synthetic biology. And so, writing in the August issue of CTC Sentinel, J. Kenneth Wickeser, Kevin J. O'Donovan, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Washington, Major Stephen Homel, and Colonel F. John Burpo, who all serve at or be affiliated with the Department of Chemistry and Life Science at the United States Military Academy, have warned that the economic and social impact of COVID-19 has in and of itself increased the chance that terrorist organizations will now attempt to deploy biological agents to asymmetrically attack these United States and all our allies. Now, uh, little feedback here from Jameson Reese. Yeah, talking about the nuclear fact is arguable given how easy it was for the atomic boy scout to acquire materials to make his own crude nuclear reactor yeah but you don't often get minds of that uh range of thought that level of commitment and probably now he's uh almost certainly dying of cancer now uh, if he's not dead already from radiation exposure he's dead oh thank you well all i can say is Drug overdose. Yeah, probably to kill the pain from the radiation cancer that was eaten away at his nervous system. How's that? <laughs> there you go. Anyhow. So, uh, uh, fentanyl and opiates. Jesus Christ. Right, white trash all the way. Yeah. Uh, so, um, now in terms of the counterterrorism analyst, thank you, Jameson. I appreciate that. That's actually a bit of upbeat news. Never liked the son of a bitch anyway. Now, in terms of counterterrorism analysts who have shared their concerns, one of them that I was looking into was Audrey Kurth Cronin, the authoress of a recent book entitled Power to the People, subtitled How Open Technological Innovation is Arming Tomorrow's Terrorists. Now, she noted in the CTC Roundtable that with the ability to alter DNA through easily accessible tools like CRISPR or slash Cas9, uh, which of course may require some explanation uh, so that people understand uh, what the fuck I'm even talking about or referencing, uh, because most people are not familiar with these terms. Uh, we're talking about genome editing. Uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, is a genome editing tool that is creating a buzz in the science world. It's faster, cheaper, and more accurate than previous techniques of editing DNA or dioxyribonucleic acid and has a wide range of potential applications. So... <coughs> Uh, CRISPR-Cas9 was adapted from a naturally occurring 
genome editing system in bacteria. The bacteria capture snippets of DNA from invading viruses and use them to create DNA segments known as CRISPR arrays. Now CRISPR itself is an acronym that needs some explanation. It's a family of DNA sequences found in the genomes of prokaryotic organisms such as bacteria and archaea or ancient biological artifacts, living relics. These sequences are derived from DNA fragments and bacteriophages or microscopic creatures that feed off bacteria that had previously infected the prokaryote. They are used to detect and destroy DNA from similar bacteriophages or bacteria eaters during subsequent infections. So it's a replicating system that occurs in nature that we can emulate. With uh, CRISPR, the acronym standing for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Now, CRISPR associated is acronymous as CAS, C A S, for CRISPR associated. And CAS9 specifically is a protein, a uh, 160 kilo Dalton protein, which plays a vital role in the immunological defense of certain bacteria against DNA viruses and plasmids, and which is itself heavily utilized in genetic engineering applications. Its main function is to cut DNA and thereby alter a cell's genome. So, in terms of, uh, yes, Jameson is saying you could create a superbug with it in theory. Yes. So, uh, the way that um, you would uh, formalize a uh, description would be that Cas9 is a bacterial RNA or ribonucleic acid uh, guided endonuclease, endonuclease that uses base pairing to recognize and cleave target DNAs or double-stranded genetic components with complementary, well, with complementarity to guide the single-stranded RNA or ribonucleic acid. So the programmable sequence specificity of Cas9 in particular has been harnessed for genome editing and gene expression control in many organisms. This is what happens in nature and it's what we can exploit industrially. So in terms of what Audrey Kurth Cronin, the authoress of the book entitled Power to the People, subtitled more expressively as how open technological innovation is arming tomorrow's terrorists, she is saying that with the ability to alter DNA through easily accessible tools like CRISPR slash Cas9, individuals can change known bacterial or viral pathogens to make us them even more dangerous. Now, far more people have access to the means to do this now much more rapidly than ever before. Now, late yesteryear, Russell Travers, then acting director of the U.S. National Counterterrorism Center, stated on record that the potential terrorist abuse of biological weapons has moved from a low probability eventuality to something that is considered much more likely. In the last two decades, scientists seeking to better understand and protect against the threat posed by viruses have managed to synthesize the entire poliovirus genome, reconstruct the 1918 pandemic army and navy influenza virus, known as the Spanish flu, 
and develop a novel strain of the H5N1 or hemagglutin 5 neuromodase 1 avian flu virus, which could be transmitted more easily among mammals, of which species you and I belong to. While these breakthroughs were the result of U.S. government-funded efforts in state-of-the-art laboratories, the West Point scientists are saying that as the technology improves, the level of funding, education, and skills necessary to engineer biological agents decreases, making it ever more easier for non-state actors to develop and deploy them as weapons. Exemplae Gratiae, a small Canadian research group, was successful in constructing infectious horsepox virus, a genetically distinctive relative of smallpox, directly from genetic information obtained solely from a public database for the relatively modest sum of a hundred thousand United States dollars. So with enough money, a moderate funding base, comparatively speaking, and the internet, the Canadian team was working to improve public health, but the concern is that not all such undertakings in the future will be so well intentioned. So the West Point scientists in writing have gone on record to say that as technology increases and spreads, those with a simple home laboratory system may be able to manipulate bacterial and viral genes without expert training or years of experience. So the scientists are calling for the threat posed by engineered pathogens to be anticipated and planned for at all levels of government. Now, a former commander of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization's Rapid Reaction CBRN uh, Battalion. Uh, now, for those of you who uh, don't understand what that acronym is for, it's uh, Chemical, Bi Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear Defense, CBRN uh, Defense, uh, or... Um, CBRNE, which is uh, chemical, bacteriological, radiological, nuclear, and electronic uh, defensive. Uh, these are protective measures taken in situations in which chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear warfare, uh, including terrorism, hazards may be present. So uh, CBRN defense consists of... Um, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear passive protection, contamination avoidance, and CBRN mitigation. These are all kind of like buzzwords in the military nomenclature for containment, uh, evasion, uh, preemption, in other words, or mitigation should the situation be too late to avoid. Mm. Now, in terms of uh, what um, they're saying, Hamish de Breton Gordon, he's the former commando commander of NATO's Rapid Reaction CBRN Battalion. He wrote a book that I referenced entitled Chemical Warrior, which has just been published. And in it, he asserts that action by the international community is urgently needed Indeed, long overdue. Again, this man's name is Hamish de Breton Gordon. Breton spelled the same way as the Breton Woods Monetary Agreement, B R E T T O N, uh, dash Gordon, a hyphenated name, like he got married to a gay partner and kept his own or something. Now, he says if we are to prevent the potential Armageddon of an engineered, highly virulent, toxic pathogen, we need a united international community effort to be put into effect now, 
Now, by way of comparison, he emphasizes that COVID-19, a not very virulent but highly transmissible pathogen, has already brought the world to its knees and is a huge neon advertisement to every dictator, despot, rogue state, and terrorist who would do us harm. Now, he is especially worried harmful biological materials could be stolen, spirited away by a rogue insider, or might accidentally be released. Himself noting that the huge increase in level 4 containment laboratories in all parts of the globe where the most deadly pathogens are stored should tell us all we need to know. Now, another urgent call for action comes from the retired Japanese-American general, Michael Nagata, surname spelled N-A-G-A-T-A, a a romanization of the Japanese character, of course, who until but yesteryear was the strategy director at the United States National Counterterrorism Center, with General Nagata himself telling the CTC Roundtable that the United States counterterrorism community has long held that the use of a biological agent of some kind for a major terrorist attack is not a matter of if, but when. The likelihood of a future terrorist deploying a highly potent, clandestinely produced, difficult to detect, slash identify, slash track, easily transportable and dispersible, and quite lethal biological weapon is rising significant. So, let me quote Nagata at length and verbatim. What he said was, we should confront the question of whether the United States counterterrorism community our policymakers, congressional representatives, and the American people are informed and aware enough of the trajectory we are now on. I believe, this is his words, the answer is a resounding no. During my career as a CT operational practitioner, again, I'm quoting him at length, all the way through my final years, as the senior CT strategist at NCTC, the amount of energy, focus, and resourcing devoted to bioterrorism is but a small fraction of what is still given today to more conventional threats. In other words, it's still in the realm of the exotic. Exotic enough, we don't take it seriously enough to prepare for. And that in and of itself shows that we're in for a catastrophe once the attack is launched. Now, in terms of Nagata, to continue with what I'm reading from his statement, he said, like all things in life, we have choices to make about how prepared we wish to be. The question is, will we make them today, before disaster happens, or be forced by catastrophe to make us them tomorrow? Now, much of the work necessary to counter the bioterror threat from engineered viruses will also translate into greater preparedness for the next naturally occurring pandemic. Biosecurity should be the number one. One, national security and public health priority for whomever resides in the White House during the next four years. And the time for action is now. But that brings us to the other biological threat. The immediate, the clear and present bio threat is white supremacy. The clear and present danger to our republic and the threat unto us all. 
no matter what our color. And why can't Trump just say it? President Donald Trump once again refused to condemn white supremacist groups outright. The threat of far-right violence is not going away and will likely be the source of the next bioterror attack. So here we had the first presidential debate last night. The president refused to unequivocally condemn white supremacists and militia groups. And when pressed, he said that members of the far right group, the Proud Boys, should stand back and stand by. Now, that delivery was no accident. In moments of direct confrontation, Trump refuses to state clearly that he condemns white supremacy or white nationalists. And they notice. And they remember. They take it as a direct presidential order when he says what he says. Meanwhile, the threat of far-right violence in America is growing every day. Now, one right-wing militia group, a militant group to maintain watch on, is the Oath Keepers. Never trust an Oath Keeper. The Oath Keepers is a terrorist network founded on the premise that law enforcement officers and soldiers may, if necessary, refuse orders that they believe enable tyranny. And it has already recruited thousands of police officers, soldiers, and veterans. This is your enemy. As I've warned you of forever. The greatest target of the U.S. military and the veterans it indoctrinates and produces is yourself. And of course, America's adversaries overseas seized on the first presidential debate as proof that the American empire is eating itself alive. Now, an opinion piece that I read in the original Chinese language, published in the Global Times, a communist Chinese state-run tabloid, gloated, this debate was like the country. Everybody's talking, nobody's listening, nothing is learned, it's a mess. The author claimed to be channeling the thoughts of most Americans while playing into Beijing's goal of flattering its own totalitarian system by contrast. But Iran, too, took a superior tone in highlighting the dysfunction of the debate, in which President Donald Trump raged and interrupted Democratic nominee Biden and the moderator. Now, I didn't read this in the original Farsi or the Persian, but President Hassan Rouhani said, See what a situation they are mired in. On the one hand, they had the worst management in the coronavirus and are grappling with the worst unemployment rate and unrest inside the United States. On the other hand, they achieved no victory in their foreign policy. And glasses are no doubt being quietly raised and clicked in toast elsewhere as well, certainly in the Kremlin. Russia's 2016 electoral interference effort to sow discord and damage American democracy is a gift that keeps on giving. And perceptions, like those I articulated sourcing out of the communist Chinese empire and Islamic fundamentalist Iran, 
fostered by unfriendly government's propaganda, deeply damage American imperial soft power abroad. And Trump, suffering dire reviews at home, as well for his Tuesday tantrums, did get help from one of his best foreign friends, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, the Trump of the tropics. And on Twitter, Bolsonaro blasted Biden's 20 billion United States dollar plan to help protect the Amazon as motivated by a hidden agenda. Jair Bolsonaro's attack was slightly spoiled, of course, by getting Biden's name wrong in the English version of his message. What a shame, Mr. John Biden. What a shame. That's what Bolsonaro wrote. He can't even get a first name right. Therefore, instead of calling him Jair Bolsonaro, you should just call him Jerk. Mm. Jair Jerk Bolsonaro. There we are. Now, in recent years, as the Trump volcano has perpetually blown its orange top, a new attitude toward America has emerged overseas. While there's often been respect, admiration, fear, or resentment directed toward these United States, there's rarely been pity before. But as the columnist Tory Shepard of the Advertiser newspaper in Adelaide, Australia wrote, There are many reasons to feel deeply sorry for the United States today including COVID-19, wildfires, civil unrest, school shootings, and a, I'll use his own words, shambolic cluster schmuck of a debate. Plus, she wrote, it's actually a she, I'm seeing her picture now, the name was rather indeterminate. Their politics is utterly toxic. By the way, Tory Shepard is, uh, for a woman, got some pretty big fucking Aussie balls to be saying that when Australia is run by the goddamn Murdoch media machine, the Murdochocracy, the Murdochocracy. Murdoch is who I'm thinking of. Murdoch, of course, runs Fox News out of Australia. These are the very people who run your state propaganda machine, then telling us how fucked they are after they've just removed their fucking cock. In the case of Tori Shepard here, she had a strap-on dildo she was fucking our ass with. Fuck the goddamn Aussie murdocracy and their state media machine. That's what led to their continent burning alive and the loss of over a billion animal lives. But you see, weaponizing outrage has paid off for the Republican Party. President Donald Trump is intent on sowing doubt over the electoral results to come, thereby creating a pathway to contest the results and remain in power even if he loses. Trump has baselessly attacked mail-in voting and accused Democrats of rigging the election. During a campaign rally in August this year, he told supporters in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, the only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. It's the only way we're going to lose this election. So we have to be very careful. And Wednesday midweek last, he sent off alarm bells, Trump did, when he refused, yet again, to say as to whether he would commit to a peaceful transfer of power if he loses. When a reporter asked him about the potential for a peaceful transference of power, power, Trump failed to offer up an unequivocal yes. Instead, instead, 
We're going to have to see what happens. Now, it doesn't take any trained detective to see what Trump's up to. And as a historian, I can tell you that I fear a repeat of the Brooks Brothers riot. The Brooks Brothers riot historically, effectively, put a halt to the manual recount in Miami, Florida, following the millennial election between Texas Governor George W. Bush Jr. and Vice President Al Gore in the 2000th year of our Christian calendar, 2000 A.D., a day many of us born in the 20th century never thought we'd live to see. That was when, 20 years ago, after a confusing and chaotic election night, it became as clear that Florida was too close to call. Gore phoned Bush to concede, only to take it back upon realizing that the race had been called with razor-thin margins and questions over ballots in Florida. A heated recount ensued. And while Bush's point man, James A. Baker III, authorized a full court press to end the recount in a case that was ultimately decided by the United States Supreme Court, the Brooks Brothers riot on November 22nd showed just how far the Republican Party was willing to go to wage a political war that weaponized outrage and intimidation. On November 21st, the Florida Supreme Court authorized manual recounts in four counties and set a November 26th deadline. The next day, the Miami-Dade County Canvassing Board decided to focus solely on the contested ballots in order to meet that deadline. To hunker down and avoid the media frenzy that had descended on Miami, the officials decided to move to a smaller room on the 19th floor so they could be closer to the ballot scanning machine. That is, according to an account in Salon Magazine, an impeccable source in general that I have sourced on this subject. But Republican operatives, congressional staffers, and attorneys had organized a group of protesters to fly to Florida, and the mob of 50-year-old white lawyers with cell phones and Ermes ties, as described by the Wall Street Journal, gathered in the high-rise building where the recount was taking place. When New York Congressman John Sweeney, who was working for the Bush campaign, learned that the recount had been moved to another room, he ordered the troops to shut it down. The protesters yelled and screamed, accusing the canvassers of trying to steal the election. The chants became fiercer, and the demonstration increasingly raucous, as they directly confronted the county officials, chanting, Stop the count! Stop the fraud! Now, Miami-Dade Democratic County Chairman Joe Geller bore the brunt of the protesters' ire. When someone handed him a sample ballot to test one of the voting machines. The protesters surrounded him and demanded that he desist, accusing him of stealing ballots. He recalled in testimony that this one guy was tripping me and pushing me and kicking me. At one point, I thought that if all these half a hundred year old white guys knocked me over, I could have literally gotten stomped to death. 
The police escorted Geller so that he could safely leave the building alive. Republican organizers denied that the situation ever became violent, and their strategy worked. Hours after the riot, the board decided to shut down its operations, and, well, the manual recount in Miami came to an end. Now, David Leahy, one of the members of the canvassing board, told the New York Times, this was perceived as not being an open and fair process. That weighed heavy on our minds. But days later, he denied the protests played a role in ending the manual recount. The Supreme Court later handed the victory to George W. Bush Jr. And a number of the participants in the Brooks Brothers riot went on to serve in the administration and work in reactionary politics to campaign for Donald Trump. So now, two decades and on, it's fair to ask, might we see more dirty tricks of this sort in the aftermath of the 2020 election? If anything, the threat is much higher today than it ever was in 2000 and O'Domini. Bush had not spent the months leading up to the election challenging the very process and raising questions about the outcome. He did not threaten to reject an unfavorable outcome, nor did he possess the presidential power that enables Donald Trump to abuse his position to sway the election. Donald Trump, who has stoked reactionary outrage for years, has been priming his cultic base to challenge the outcome. It doesn't help that the Trump base, the cult, is also much more fervent than anything Bush ever enjoyed. Many Trump cultists have proven a loyalty so fierce, it's hard to imagine what the president could ever do to lose their support. Add to this fraught environment, the recent memory of white supremacist far-right protesters showing up to anti-racism demonstrations and at protests against pandemic measures armed with semi-automatic rifles. And it's not hard to imagine that violence will break out in the event of a contested election. In light of the president's own words and actions, officials are rightfully worried about a too-close-to-call nightmare scenario that might spur this president or his cultists to go all out in an attempt to make his things go his way. When this happens, the Brooks Brothers riot of the first year of the third Christian millennium will simply look like child's play. And as if America had not already suffered enough, chaos reigned supreme when President Trump and Joseph Biden clashed yesterday night in their first face-to-face -face debate. Fox News host Chris Wallace rightfully panned for his inability, his total impotence, to prevent the presidential debate from going completely out of control. Shouting over each other, the candidates repeatedly accusing the other of lying and incompetence, personal attacks flying fast and furious with Trump 
repeating false claims about Biden's son and Biden at one point calling Trump the worst president America has ever had. And when asked whether he would condemn these white supremacists, Trump refused to categorically do so and told the Proud Boys, a right-wing extremist terrorist group, to stand back and stand by. And as for the California of it all, the president again harped on my golden state's need to improve forest management to prevent California wildfires, even though only 3% of California forest land is managed by our state. The entity responsible for the overwhelming majority of California's forest land is Trump's own goddamn federal government which manages well over half of it. Trump also calling our Governor Gavin Newsom's long-term plan to phase out gas-powered vehicles in California quote-unquote crazy. What we've got here is a triple whammy. In what has been called California's most destructive wildfire season ever. The glass fire in wine country is now one of more than 20 blazes burning our state to ash. It has destroyed at least 80 homes I'm aware of as the flames straddled Napa and Sonoma wine counties, which together are home to more than 800 wineries, many family owned. That this area is once again engulfed in flames after the fires of 2017 is painful enough that it happened in the midst of a global pandemic is almost one blow too many. This year, the pandemic has closed tasting rooms. Wildfire smoke has threatened multi-million dollar vintages and the fires have created a devastating triple blow. Vince Toffinelli, the owner of the Toffinelli family vineyard in Calistoga, simply said, I'm no. His grandparents purchased the vineyard's first parcel circa 1929. But yesterday, by Tuesday morning, all of its structures had been destroyed, including an old redwood barn, a water tower, two homes and outbuildings. We are once again besieged by fire. The toll from my Golden State's latest round of wildfires has just kept worsening, with three deaths reported in Shasta County and numerous structures lost in wine country where tens of thousands have been forced to flee their homes. And the memories of devastating fires three years ago still run fresh. It's 2017 all over again. The number of structures damaged or destroyed was unclear on Monday, opening this work week. But according to Santa Rosa's fire chief, there was significant loss in some areas. Almost 34,000 people have been ordered to evacuate, which I confirmed with officials while more than 14,000 others have been warned that they, too, will have to leave. In Shasta County, authorities have attested that three people died in yet another fast-moving wildfire that ignited Sunday afternoon while I was burning bandwidth live near the rural county of Ego, about nine miles southwest of Redding. California. Meanwhile, hot and dry winds prompted Pacific Gas and Electric, our utilities monopoly, PG&E, to shut off power to about 87,500 customers in 16 California counties, and the National Weather Service issued a red flag warning for the mountains of Los Angeles and Ventura counties and the Santa Clarita Valley. And California's worst fire season in modern history has continued to wreak havoc yesterday with the glass fire raging in Sonoma 
and Napa counties simultaneous the Zog fire, Z-O-G-G, swelling in the rugged terrain near Redding. Wine country has become an epicenter of California fires in recent years. The more than 9,000 structures were lost and dozens of people were killed in 2017 when the fires swept through Santa Rosa and surrounding communities. And last year, the Kincaid fire menaced the region for weeks. Fires once again exploded in the region Sunday while I was burning bandwidth and have continued to rage ever since. We can cite a number of factors for the nightmarish increase in fires in region which have left some residents fleeing their homes on an annual basis, creating a condition known as fire fatigue. Those factors include increased development from the suburbs to the wildlands, which has carried the fire risks of utility infrastructure along with it as well as our changing climate. In recent days, I myself have oft thought of a tweet sourcing from Eric Wittner's house. Wittner's house is spelled W-I-T-T-M-E-R-S-H-A-U-S, the deputy managing editor of the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. He wrote a few weeks ago that when people ask him about climate change, he tells them that he doesn't recall covering any major wildfires during his first 14 years at the Press Democrat. Now it's every year, sometimes more than once. Further south, the fast-moving Zog fire continued to cut a destructive path through Shasta County, the fire, which started Sunday afternoon while I was commencing to host transmission, about nine miles southwest of Redding, California, has killed three that we know of and destroyed at least 146 structures. To try and contextualize this, give you some comprehension of the gravity of the emergency. The deadly Zog fire has continued to carve a destructive path through Northern California's Shasta County ever since, swelling to more than 40,000 acres. Let me go a little in depth here. California's single largest wildfire has in and of itself spawned Two massive flamenados, fire tornadoes, one of which was measured as an EF2. Most of you will not be familiar with the measurement system. EF is enhanced. Fujita scale. The enhanced Fujita, obviously a Japanese term. The enhanced Fujita scale rates the intensity of tornadoes in some countries, including the United States and Canada, based on the damage that they caused. The enhanced Fujita scale replaced the decommissioned Fujita scale that was introduced circa 1971 by Ted Fujita, obviously a Nikkei America Jean, a Japanese American. Now, an EF2 tornado is the third weakest tornado on the enhanced Fujita scale. An EF2 will have wind speeds between 111 and 135 miles per hour. Anywhere else in the world, it would measure by the metric system as between 178 and 217 kilometers per hour. The damage from an EF2 tornado will be considerable to say the least. So, 
California's Creek Fire is not only the largest single wildfire in the state known for huge and destructive blazes at baseline, it has spawned two rare flaminados, pyro tornadoes, a day after the fire started earlier this month. One flaminado, the pyro tornado, the fire tornado, was rated as an EF2 with winds up to 125 miles per hour as measured. The other had winds of up to 100 miles per hour and was rated an EF1. They wreaked havoc across this rugged landscape in area, the result of what government forecasters admitted on Thursday. These are their words, not mine. Three words. Unprecedented fire behavior. In other words, the fire nados behaved as if alive and sentient. When water bombs were dropped by aircraft, they moved out of the way to evade them. This is the supernature of pyro golems. Jin from the dimension of fire, fire elementals. The Flamma Vampir are the fire vampires of the anti-god Cthulhu, one of the pantheon worshipped by the cults of the kings of Edom. Flaminados are created when the rising heat from a fire pulls in smoke, fire and dirt creating a rotation vortex above the blaze itself. Now, to have even one tornado within a fire is rare. Fires can lead to fire whirls, kind of like a dust devil, due to differential heating. But to get a tornado with winds of over 100 miles per hour is quite unusual in understatement. These pyronados uprooted pine trees, snapping even several two-foot diameter trees like toothpicks and stripping bark from their very trunks. I read this on a storm survey report. The historic wildfires California is experiencing this year have generated intense heat, causing the vortices to form. Now, I've discussed this with the meteorologist Gerald Meadows at the National Weather Service office in Hanford, California. And while Meadows cannot say for certain why the state is seeing more Pyronados than in the past. He did go on record to attest that we will learn more as the technology has improved to track and monitor their formation. And it's not the first time this year this phenomenon has occurred. The Loyalton Fire in Northern California near Nevada spawned a Pyronado last month. The Creek Fire, which started on September 4th, has burned 291,426 acres in the Sierra National Forest last time I checked and remains just 34% contained. That's when I looked at it before the weekend. Both Creek Fire Pyronados occurred on September 5th. The first near Huntington Lake and the second near Mammoth Pool where a rescue operation had to be organized to airlift hundreds of trapped people to safety ere they otherwise would have burned alive, consumed by this ravenous 
supernatural entity which was heading toward them with single-minded purpose to the point where we had to organize planes to airlift them en masse because none of them had any hope of escaping even in their vehicles. The fast-moving glass fire has burned more than 11,000 acres and prompted evacuations. Indeed, thousands of residents have been forced to flee their northern California homes in recent days as the fast-moving glass fire continues to grow. The glass fire in California burned one acre every five seconds as it doubled in size. The fire has tripled in size since it began Sunday, burning 36,236 acres and having 0% containment. We can't contain it. I confirmed that with Cal Fire Division Chief Ben Nichols, who said such at a Monday evening press conference opening this work week. The glass fire sparked in Napa Valley early Sunday morning, around 4 a.m. Pacific time, growing at a rate of around an entire acre every five seconds between Sunday night and Monday morning, according to satellite images from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the seaworthy version of NASA. More than 70,000 people have been ordered to evacuate in Sonoma and Napa, Sonoma and Napa wine counties. At least 21 people that I know of have been treated at hospitals for severe burns that will scar them the rest of their lives. They will spend the rest of their lives rehabilitating, according to local hospitals in area. A red flag warning remains in effect for the region, or did so until 9 p.m. local time on Monday. Flames tearing through vineyards and structures near St. Helena, roaring over hills and jumping across both the Silverado Trail and the Lodi River, despite fire crews' efforts to contain them. As announced by CNN affiliate KPIX. And while a number of structures have been damaged and destroyed by the glass fire, last time I checked, no exact figure was even yet available. That was Monday evening. I do know that more than 8,500 structures were threatened across Sonoma, Lake, and Napa counties. That was according to a press release from Cal Fire. And according to KPIX, the Boyson Fire just west of St. Helena and the Shady Fire near Santa Rosa, these two other wildfires erupted spontaneously in area Sunday night, simultaneously. Totally separate areas, just like that, with no discernible source. Fueled by dry conditions and high winds, presumably. And flames also engulfed California's famed Chateau Boswell Winery, the winery along the Silverado Trail in the St. Helena area, with three people dying as a result of the fast-moving Zog fire in Shasta County that has quickly grown to 15,000 acres. At least that's what I got from the press conference on Monday opening our work week as delivered by Shasta County Sheriff Coroner Eric Margrini. Literally a law enforcement officer coroner, a coroner who's been sworn in as an active duty officer and provided weapons. In other words, an armed coroner. Now, my own uh, cousin in New York, a member of the Dietrich family I interviewed on either Critical Omissions or Saturday Night Firing Lines years ago on when I was on Revolution Radio, was a sheriff coroner's assistant or a deputy coroner, a nurse for the dead, so to speak, or a 
Necro Corman, a Corman for the dead. He too was uniformed and armed. There has always been an awareness that the dead can rise and walk. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Governor Gavin Newsom said he would commit more money for suppression and prevention of wildfires. There is a historic amount of money in the current budget, as confirmed by our governor. Details of Newsom's plan are expected in the coming weeks, but the governor said they will include predictive fire analysis that allows for prepositioning firefighting equipment and teams based on weather patterns, infrared technology, more cameras, and new equipment for both air suppression and traditional ground firefighting. And so, in his own press conference, delivered on Monday to open our work week, Newsom said, there's a lot of progress. We are not just standing still. We are not just victims of fate. We want to shape this future. We want to work on suppression and work on prevention and then work on adaptation strategies that are longer term as it relates to decarbonizing our economy. By that, he meant no more gas-guzzling cars, all electric, as soon as possible, with Trump calling him crazy. And yet, all of those living here, the fire fatigue, it's becoming a lifestyle. There have been more than 8,100 wildfires in state this year alone, and the year hasn't even ended yet. And firefighters continue to fight at least a quarter of a hundred major blazes burning now. As testified via news release on Sunday, this weekend last, issued by CAL FIRE. With the release saying, since August 15th, when California's fire activity elevated, there have been 26 fatalities and over 7,000 structures destroyed. Fire has prompted tens of thousands of evacuations in Sonoma County, Santa Rosa. Fire PIO Paul Lowenthal was being interviewed by KPIX. That's the CNN affiliate in area. His uh, position about... Uh, PIO is an acronym that uh, it's a, um, if I remember correctly, it's a public information officer. And uh, it's the public information officer's job to protect firefighters', firefighters reputations and get one unified story to where it needs to be. He's the man who juggles all the testimony. It's one of the loneliest jobs in the fire department. Um, having said that, uh, the one thing that he testified to was that many have been forced to leave Napa County as well. While he was being interviewed by KPIX, he said, that's where thousands are under some form of evacuation notification. And that was cross-referenced with Napa County spokeswoman Janet Upton, who was saying the same thing, essentially, on Sunday night on CNN. And among those forced to evacuate the blaze was one Jan Zakin, who lives in the evacuation zone on North Crystal Springs Road. Um, the reason that case stood out to myself was that Zakin told KGO, that's a radio affiliate of CNN, another one, we woke up in the middle of the night and saw flames. I was in my underwear. There was a car on fire blocking our escape any access out. My dog ran away and I still haven't found her. We left with nothing. 
just literally nothing but the underwear across my loins. And I still think we're lucky just to have gotten out alive. Now, Migali Otero, who was interviewed by KGO, had been forced to evacuate due to the LNU complex fire weeks ago and testified that the fires and evacuations are becoming an unwelcome part of life. Otero saying, it gets tiring, it's becoming a lifestyle, it's a beautiful place, but it's not right. Spokesman Henry Vawford of the Napa County Sheriff's Office did testify that all residents were heeding evacuation warnings on Sunday. Basically saying, well, to quote his T precisely, when they hear that high-low siren coming from cars as we drove through their neighborhoods, they know it's time to evacuate. The motto is, if I can hear it, it's time to go. Imagine living like that. St. Helena Hospital, located in the foothills, also had to evacuate for the second time this summer due to fire risk. Approximately 466 homes evacuated in Shasta County. And that Zog fire, which was sparked on Sunday, is burning about 150 miles north of Sacramento, near the city of Redding, where approximately 466 homes have been evacuated in Shasta County due to the Zog fire. That's according to the Sheriff Coroner Magrini. And the fire still remains 0% contained, according to CAL FIRE. We can't even get this thing under any modicum of control. Firefighters have been battling the August complex fire in several neighboring counties for more than a month. That fire has burned more than 870,000 acres since being sparked by lightning in August. And multiple roads have been closed as fire operations continue throughout the region. And the weather conditions remain dry, which is just bad news in and of itself. The National Weather Service has put much of California under a red flag warning. At least it was throughout Monday opening this work week. In Butte County, town of Paradise was bracing for the worst as the North Complex fire burns nearby. But the town appears to be in the clear for now. That's the town that was completely destroyed a few years back. Cal Fire official Shane Lauderdale said Monday that they are very, very happy because fire activity was minimal in that area and everything stayed within the control lines through the latest wind event. The more than 3 million acres burned in wildfires this year in California is 26 times higher than the acreage burned in, well, throughout yesteryear for the same time period according to what I've been able to source from CAL FIRE. Now, in Southern California, the NWS, the National Weather Service, tweeted, Due to hot temperatures, dry conditions, and gusty Santa Ana winds, a red flag warning will be in effect on Monday for the L.A. Ventura Mountains and Santa Clarita Valley. There will be the potential for rapid fire growth and extreme fire behavior. So be alert. Think of that quote. I bring it up now, even though that red flag warning was in effect throughout the opening of this work week, because think of what they said on record. Extreme fire behavior. This fire is not behaving the way we know it. And we've got planned power outages. Because the concerns about high winds and continued dry conditions have led PG&E, our utilities monopoly, to shut off power in some areas in an effort to prevent more wildfires, which can be sparked by electrical equipment. And so on Sunday, while I was burning bandwidth, 
the utility, the monopoly that runs much of California's electricity, said the planned shutoffs in Northern California, my area of the state, had decreased from 100,000 to 65,000 because of favorable changes in forecast weather conditions that spared myself blackout and enabled me to transmit our digital broadcast. Napa County, where the glass fire is burning, is on the list of counties expected to experience shutoffs. And um, according to the release, once the high winds subside Monday morning, PG&E will inspect the de-energized lines to ensure they were not damaged during the wind event and then restore power. PG&E will safely restore power in stages as quickly as possible with the goal of restoring power to nearly all customers who are safe to restore within 12 daylight hours after severe weather has passed. This was issued Monday, but I'm bringing it up now because it was only a change in wind that enabled me to broadcast transmission. And here we've got, coming up, well, California, the economic engine of all half a hundred states in union, burns the election that could break America. No matter the outcome, President Donald Trump will not concede the presidential race. The election itself will fall into crisis. Given its magnitude, this election will be the one that breaks America. Now, that means America's election mechanisms might break down entirely. You might ask, so what happens if President Trump refuses to concede the election? Look, it's not a question of if. Unless Trump scores a legitimate win in the Electoral College, everything we know about him says he will refuse to accept defeat and instead abuse every tool at his disposal to undo the result. Jameson Reese says they will probably be forced to take him out, as in perhaps literally escort him physically from the White House. Or, perhaps, what James and Reese is suggesting is they might be forced to kill him. Now, that sounds extreme, or it sounds stupid, or, or provocative, or ridiculous. Why don't you look at the facts? Refusing to concede is a remarkably powerful thing. Concessions are how elections end. Full stop. Trump will have plenty of options to keep the outcome in doubt. In court, on the streets, in the Electoral College, and in Congress. The subtext of his efforts will be that nobody knows who won and that he is stepping in to restore stability. The president will abuse his powers to muddle the results, leaving no clear procedural winner. You see, unlike baseball, elections have no umpire, no singular authority with the power to rule decisively on the results. The most significant risk is that Trump will ask Republican allies in battleground states to appoint Trump electors regardless of the outcome. We're accustomed to choosing electors by popular vote, but the Supreme Court has said a state legislature may take back that power from the people and name any electors it likes. I bet you didn't fucking know that. That's why the Supreme Court is an anti-democratic establishment.
Now, according to a legal advisor to Donald Trump and three top Republican leaders in Pennsylvania, they are already discussing contingency plans to set aside the voting results by claiming the vote count is rigged. Republicans control the House and Senate in all six of the most closely contested swing states. There's a lot of frightening details I'm going to go into. You might ask ahead of time, which one should keep me up at night? Well, what frightens me is that Trump has the power, with only modest help from Republican Party elected officials, to throw the outcome into doubt and keep it unresolved indefinitely. And if he throws the decision to Congress, which he can do almost at will, the law is a labyrinth full of dead ends when it comes to how that's resolved. Experts tell me that the Electoral Count Act is so garbled and full of logic bombs that it can easily lead to deadlock. If two men show up to be sworn in on the 20th of January, the chaos candidate and the commander-in-chief will be the same man. My best advice to Americans going into November? First and foremost, stop thinking about this election in any conventional terms. Expect an extra constitutional challenge because it is most certainly coming. And take agency because an election cannot be stolen without some kind of acquiescence from the people at large. So by our God, don't acquiesce. Vote. Vote early if your state allows. Vote in person if you can tolerate the risk because late count at mail votes will be the heart of the post-election contest. More than a million, one million Americans plus have already cast their ballots in the presidential election. It's a small fraction of the votes that will be cast this year, but it's a start. Now, one among the creepiest true crime tours in America is the Tucson Murders True Crime Tours. The Tucson Murders True Crime Tours provide us historic crime investigation into forgotten lost crimes in Tucson, Arizona. These small private tours are hosted by the Mr. Ben Baron Astanius, a true crime researcher and enthusiast who will personally take us the to real historic crime locations related to these crimes in Tucson. Relive these events and hear the untold stories behind the stories. The Baron Ben specializes in the seemingly ever-developing case of the late serial rape killer Charles Howard Schmidty Schmid Jr., the Pied Piper of Tucson, an aftermath tour. See theunfinishedman.com for uh, excerpts from his book yet to be published and uh, scenes from the film documentaries he's been working to produce. But other cases, such as the strange case of Morris Brady, the Dr. George Marvin Tejudine case, and the Red Rapist are also within his repertoire, as in fact are all the crimes that shocked the Southwest throughout the 1960s, the very decade I myself entered this veil of tears. These devastating crimes stained a city so deeply they may never be removed. For tour information, contact the TucsonMurders.com. Tucson is spelled Tucson, T-U-C-S-O-N. Put the word the in front of it, the TucsonMurders.com, or telephone 1-520 forward slash 323-3406. Telephone Ben Estanius himself to personally guide your private tour. Again, that would be at 1520. 
323-3406. And don't forget to subscribe to the Man of the Soil YouTube channel. That's where you'll find the young girl with big tits in the green sweater that says uh, Ace Hardware or something like that. And you'll know you're in the right place. Check out the aerial footage of the landscape architecture uh, put together by the work crews of Mr. Well, the Baron, Ben Estedius. And uh, aside from that, support myself. Send a check our money order to Douglas Dietrich, 1242 Green Street, San Francisco, California, 94109. That's 1242 Green Street, like the color green. San Francisco, California, 94109. Now, I'm uh, not going to read a message, but I'm getting an important communication. And uh, I am struck by, by it. Something important has happened that I've been privately informed of. Nothing to be alarmed about, per se, but alarming enough. So, again, I cannot overemphasize the damage that has been done to our website, intentionally. There are entire sections that are missing, including any ability to support myself monetarily, or to even find out where you can send money that is not uh, from a credit or debit card. Use your check or money order and send it to 1242 Green Street, San Francisco, California, 94109. Make those bastards pay. Now, Crystal River says, give out your PayPal uh, details uh, on air. I don't know what to say. The uh, PayPal button is, is not working. Uh, so, I'm not quite sure what my... There's a second donate bar with the address on the right, she says. Let me uh, go check that. Second donate bar with the email address... Let me say, um, I don't know. It, it, there's a subscribe bar. Um, I'm pretty ignorant of my own website. So, I guess what you can do is press donate up at the top. There's a uh, donate and donate. And again, that keeps going to the uh, lack of any URL or connection. Uh, okay, there is a second donate bar that leads to my address so you're right honey thank you so much if you go look at douglasdietrich.com go to douglasdietrich.com and you'll see a bunch of words at the top cross my forehead that will take you to douglasdietrich.com forward slash donate dash to forward slash and that will tell you where my address is so uh, make certain to go there and that should help out immensely I'm going to go into the live chat and enter that now so uh, Crystal River says even if it doesn't work on your website give it out on your links in the chat and below this video um, thanks honey you are right so there we are hopefully we will uh, get some responses through that and uh, I should edit that in as our honey says and uh, let me do that right now and uh, that will hopefully get things uh, going for us. Let me, uh, I guess I shouldn't uh, bracket that. 
uh, hopefully it will work if bracketed though I think our, our links uh, do work when bracketed so uh, good there we are I'm gonna press save that should manifest now okay so thank you honey couldn't do it without you God bless you and uh, so Devin Bulldog uh, so here we are he says cow and plow vote on Friday the second if the vote yes then hopefully before Christmas the funds will be deposited been a listener for years thank you thank you sir hugs to Devin Bulldog wonderful human being yes he has been a listener for quite some time now the details this year each side has mustered for a legal fight that began months ago and will well continue us long after election day we have a legal fight awaiting us after the election the aftermath of November's vote has the potential to make the year 2000 look like a mere skirmish the immediate aftermath of the presidential election of 2000 has taken on the air of a legend on election night news organizations first called Florida for vice president Al Gore then about two hours later withdrew the call and about four hours after that declared that George W Bush the governor of Texas had won the state giving him enough electoral votes to become his president Gore called Bush to concede and left his hotel in a motorcade to announce the end of his campaign to his supporters his aides learning that the race in Florida was in fact too close to call tried frantically to contact the vice president in his limousine they reached him just in time and he telephoned Bush to retract the concession Bush indignantly told Gore that his little brother the governor of Florida Jeb Bush had said that he had won Gore replied let me explain something your little brother is not the ultimate authority on this like all historical events the following 35 days can look in retrospect inevitable even preordained but they were a product of choice improvisation and happenstance Gore demanded recounts in four Democratic leaning counties which began the painstaking process of studying their punch card ballots and determining whether the tiny boxes known as chads had been fully detached Bush responded by filing a lawsuit in federal court in Miami to stop the recounts and in one of the lesser known events surrounding the case James A Baker the third Bush's lead strategist at the time called John C Danforth the former Republican senator from Missouri and an ordained minister who was famous for his rectitude Baker wanted Danforth to be Bush's spokesman in the lawsuit Danforth himself was horrified he told Baker candidates don't sue you could ruin Governor Bush's career he's only 54 years old and the decision to file a court case like this would be a black mark that followed him forever and it would destroy the reputation of everyone involved in the Bush side now Danforth came from an era when political norms dictated a culture of deference to announced electoral outcomes Richard Mulhouse Nixon reflecting those values chose not to challenge the results of his very narrow defeat circa 1960 and that's how you got Kennedy as president Baker thanked Danforth for his time and proceeded to file that lawsuit and several others mobilizing the Republican Party behind the efforts uh, for the Bush George Bush Dick Cheney ticket there were street protests outside the vice president's mansion get out of Cheney's house and a deployment of the finest 
political and legal talent in the Republican Party. Many of the attorneys working on the recount cases, far from suffering damage to their careers, were guaranteed political futures. They included John G. Roberts Jr., whom Bush appointed to the Supreme Court, and Noel Francisco, who became President Donald Trump's Solicitor General. To the frustration of countless Democrats, the idiot Al Gore took this insanely high-minded traditional approach, asserting that the recount was a legal, not a political process, and directing his supporters to stay off the streets. Gore told the Reverend Jesse Jackson to call off protests that he had organized against the disenfranchisement of black African Americans in Florida. Of course, Gore being a spoiled white boy, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, could easily tell a black man, what matters that you darkies don't get to vote? and were held off at gunpoint by a bunch of white trash. I don't care because I'm still rich. And I didn't own no slaves. And in that spirit, Gore named the diplomat Warren Christopher, rather than a politico, to lead his recount efforts and relied on a talented but small group of lawyers in Florida who struggled to keep up with the Republican reinforcements shipped in from around the country. The contrasts were cultural, in addition to being substantive. David Boyes, Gore's lead lawyer toward the end of the process, promenaded along the broad plazas of Tallahassee, bantering cheerfully with reporters and passersby. Benjamin Ginsburg, the general counsel to the Bush campaign and the dean of the Republican election lawyers, paced the streets in a state of rage. Repeatedly, Ginsburg, with color rising to the top of his bald head, said of the Democrats, They are trying to steal this! In the end, Bush's resort to the courts proved to be his salvation. In the case known as Bush v. Gore, the Supreme Court of these United States, by a vote of 5-4, to four, held that the recounts violated Bush's rights. No rights for the goddamn voters! No, Bush has rights, we do not thus sealing the victory in Florida that would last us two administrations, eight goddamn years. Which resulted in the invasion in Iraq and Afghanistan preceded by Bush's participation in the toppling of the Twin Towers that enabled his declaration of illegal war, no declaration of war, simply an invasion. That we're still intractably, inexorably, inextricably entwined in to this very day. Ultimately, George Bush was declared the winner in Florida by but 500 votes. Half a thousand out of some six million cast. The result might have been the same if Gore had chosen a more assertive strategy. But the party's contrasting approaches, Republican subversion, intimidation, and aggression versus democratic restraint remain a crucial legacy of that contest. That year, the recount struggle came as a surprise to both candidates. This year, 
Each side has mustered for a legal fight that began months ago and will continue long after November 3rd. President Trump has ratcheted up the Bush strategy of total political warfare. Trump has already refused to commit to accepting the outcome of the election he knows he will lose. Recently saying, the only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. So we have to be very careful. The only way they're going to win is that way. And we cannot let that happen. Now, Democrats say us that a strategy of reticence is a thing of the past. One Democratic veteran assured myself that the Democratic Party of today is totally different from the party of 2000. To quote us them in anonymity, it is much less institutionally focused, more ideologically grounded, and uncompromising. There is zero chance that anybody is going to say at some point, that it's better for the country that we settle the matter now, give in, and then try to wait another four years to win. No one thinks that another four years of Trump is survivable to the human species or to even life on Earth. He is a mass extinction event. The campaign on the Democratic side knows this is literally an existential battle, a battle for your fucking existence. Compounding all this is the coronaviral pandemic, which will force dramatic changes in how voters cast their ballots. The number of mail-in ballots will increase exponentially. Recent national polls suggest that about a third of all voters plan to vote by mail this year. And Trump has assailed the practice of voting by mail, asserting without evidence that it be susceptible to fraud. In fact, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, and Utah have used universal mail-in voting, in which the state mails a ballot to each registered voter for some time, including in previous presidential elections, with no significant problems. There is no meaningful difference between absentee voting and mail-in voting, but Trump supports absentee voting, even using it himself. In early August, when he was signing his Florida absentee ballot application, he said, absentee ballots are good. Universal mail-ins, when you get inundated with these things, are bad and will lead to terrible things, including voter fraud. And more recently, Trump has bracket that length about the purported evils of universal mail-in voting. In an interview with Sean Hannity on Fox News, on the final night of the Democratic Convention, he said, They're sending out 51 million ballots to people that didn't ask for them. This will be the most fraudulent, fraudulent election in history. It's just a horrible thing. It's going to be impossible to police. You know, it's totally unclear where Trump even got that figure. At other times, he has used the figure of 80 million. Well, Yester Menzies, last month, the House of Representatives passed a bipartisan bill to provide an additional 25 billion United States dollars to the United States Postal Service, largely to ensure that it could process the additional mailed ballots. Trump has vowed to veto the bill if it reaches him, saying... They need that money in order to make the post office work so it can take all of these millions and millions of ballots. If we don't make a deal, that means they don't get the money. That means they can't have universal mail-in voting. They just can't have it. In recent weeks, he's also attacked the use of drop boxes, which allow us voters to deposit their ballots before Election Day. He has claimed, without evidence, that they can be used to perpetrate electoral fraud. Now, Trump's grievance is almost certainly tied to the fact that the Democrats are more likely to vote by mail in the upcoming election than Republicans are. This will contribute 
to a phenomenon called the blue shift. Votes that are counted and reported later on always tend to favor Democrats. This year's blue shift will be particularly dramatic. In a recent poll by Hawkfish, that's a data firm associated with Democrats, only 19% of Trump supporters are cultists said they plan to vote by mail, compared with 69% of Biden supporters. Now, using data from late summer polls, Hawkfish predicted that election night results could show Trump in the lead with a total of 408 electoral votes. And four days later, with 75% of the mail-in votes counted, Biden will take the lead with 280 electoral votes. With all the votes counted, the former vice president will win the presidency with 334 electoral votes. Throughout this campaign, Trump has sought, therefore, to undermine voters' faith in the democratic process. Going so far as to insist on Twitter that the election must be delayed until people could properly, securely, and safely vote. Now, he was later forced to backtrack on that insistence, which would require a change to federal law itself. But, yester Septimania, last week, Trump tweeted, The November 3rd election result may never be accurately determined! That was all in the uppercase. The norms of political conduct already fading at the turn of the century have now disappeared altogether. Resultantly, the aftermath of the 2020 election will make his 2000 look like nothing. Because Democrats and Republicans have already filed dozens of lawsuits in attempts to define the rules in November. An overture for the battles that will follow the election. If Trump is the id of his campaign, its superego is Justin Reamer, the chief counsel of the Republican National Committee, who previously worked for the Virginia Board of Elections. Reamer has chews overstatement in favor of the careful words of a one-time bureaucrat. To quote his team, We see what's going on as a systemic attack on the existing absentee voting safeguards that are in place around the country. We acknowledge that there is going to be much more absentee voting, so it's never been more important to have those safeguards. In recent weeks, the Trump campaign has been sending questionnaires to election officials in swing states asking for details about how they intend to conduct the election and count the votes. The officials' answers could become as important evidence in any post-election day litigation. The architect of the Democrats' pre-election day legal strategy is Washington well, a Washington lawyer named Mark Elias. He's a partner at the firm Perkins Coe, C-O-E-I-E, C-O-I-E, Coe, the former professional home of Bob Bauer, who defined the role of the Democratic elections specialist and served as the White House counsel under President Obama. Now, Bauer is bearded, and professional. He now teaches at New York University School of Law and advises the Biden campaign. Elias, who relishes the combat of litigation, is more of a street fighter. He came to prominence in 2008 and 2009 when he represented Al Franken in an extended recount in a Minnesota Senate race. Franken eventually prevailed by 312 votes out of nearly 3 million cast. And Elias 
goes on record to say that shaped my approach. Everything you do in the voting process should w shape what happens at the end when the votes are counted. Now, in light of the likely challenges to changes in vote totals after Election Day, the Biden campaign has established a legal task force which includes hundreds of lawyers. It's led by Bauer and Dan Remus, the campaign's general counsel, and includes two recent solicitors general in Democratic administrations, Walter E. Dellinger III and Donald G. Verrilli Jr. Now, shortly after the pandemic broke out in these United States in March, Elias, in a blog post titled Four Pillars to Safeguard Vote by Mail, outlined the Democrats' approach. One, postage must be free or prepaid by the government. Two, ballots postmarked on or before Election Day must count. Three, signature matching laws need to be reformed to protect voters. Four, community organizations should be permitted to help collect and deliver voted sealed ballots. Now, to someone unversed in the arcana of election law, these demands may seem uncontroversial, but Reamer likes to frame each of Elias's pillars as an invitation for voter fraud. Reamer, so saying, Federal law says that Election Day is the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, and we believe that's when the election ends, and the postmark rule is impractical. He believes that states should make their own decisions about the postage paid envelopes, and that election officials must compare the signatures on absentee ballots with those on voter registration documents to ensure that only eligible people vote and that no one votes twice. Reamer also emphatically opposes the community collection of ballots, the practice by which campaigns or community groups gather absentee ballots from multiple voters and submit them together, known by Republicans as ballot harvesting. It is true that community ballot collection, unlike Elias's other pillars, has been associated with voter fraud by Republicans. The only recorded case of such is a 2018 race in North Carolina's 9th Congressional District in which a Republican operative, as confirmed by investigators, filled in at least a thousand mail-in ballot requests, all of them without the voters' knowledge. After the fraud was exposed, the state held the election again several months later. Now, bizarrely, and with great audacity, the temerity, the chutzpah, Republicans always cite this past May's election for city council in Patterson, New Jersey, which led to charges of fraud for the misuse of mail-in ballots against several local officials without ever acknowledging what they did to pioneer what happened there. Now, uh, in terms of this level of Hypocrisy. Trump himself tweeted, So much time is taken talking about foreign influence, but the same people won't even discuss mail-in election corruption. Look at Patterson, New Jersey. 20% of the vote was corrupted. Now, at a news conference, Trump told reporters that they should look into Patterson where massive percentages of the vote was a fraud. Now that fraud involved several hundred votes, as in North Carolina, a judge ordered a new election. 
Campaigns, of course, face a maddening variety of challenges as they try to change or even fully understand the rules of the road. The United States has arguably the most decentralized election administration of any advanced democracy. This is especially evident in the process for choosing a president. Each state conducts a separate contest for its electoral votes with its own rules for casting and counting ballots. But there be approximately 10,500 different voting jurisdictions, many of which have their own distinctive procedures as well. The legal doctrine known as the Purcell Principle, named for a Supreme Court case from 2006, holds that courts should refrain from making changes to election procedures close to election day because of the potential for creating confusion for voters. The court has never defined how close is too close. As a result, the debates over Elias's four pillars and also over universal mail-in voting are being played out in state after state at a frantic pace. Each party has created a website to track the progress of election litigation around the country. The Republican site, protectthevote.com, lists cases in 19 states, and the Democratic site, democracydocket.com, lists cases in 28. By one accounting, there are now more than 200,000 pending lawsuits, well, 200 pending lawsuits, excuse me, <laughs> about the rules for the November election. 200 is enough. Sorry, I was thinking of something else when I said 200,000. It'll all out to that by the end of the next four years. The claims in the lawsuits I'm citing vary, but there are consistent themes. The Democrats are seeking both to make it easier to vote and to relax restrictions that prevent individual ballots from being counted. The Republicans are insisting on measures that they assert will limit the number of improper or fraudulent votes. You know, votes by niggers and shit. Now, during the first week of August, Nevada's Democratic legislature and governor passed a substantial revision to the state's election law, effectively creating an all-male contest in November. The Trump campaign suit. The suit asserted in a 114-page complaint. Many of those provisions will undermine the November election's integrity. Some go beyond that, crossing the line that separates bad policy judgments from enactments that violate federal law or the United States Constitution. According to Trump's attorneys, the revised law requires county or city clerks to count potentially fraudulent or invalid ballots, thereby diluting the votes of honest white citizens and depriving them of their right to vote in violation of the 14th Amendment. You know, the one that made nigger citizens. Mm. Which the Republicans never got over even though they're the ones who railroaded it in place at a time when Republicans were the good guys and the radicals. In response, Elias's team has asserted that the Nevada legislature has taken the necessary and appropriate steps to ensure that all Nevadans have safe and meaningful opportunities to vote, both during the pandemic and thereafter. By the way, the case is still pending. More recently, New Jersey made a similar maneuver to offer all residents the opportunity to vote by mail, and Republicans sued to invalidate the new rules, again asserting that the system would lead to fraud. Phil Murphy, the state's Democratic governor, who initiated the change, said of the Republican suit, Bring it up! This case is also pending. Anyhow, there are at least five ongoing cases in Pennsylvania, several of them Republican-backed efforts to restrict, quote-unquote, ballot harvesting. 
But even if limits are imposed, it's not clear how they would be enforced or what exactly they would be. I mean, could family members drop off one another's ballots? Or is that somehow fraudulent misrepresentation? What about distant family members? Close friends? How close? Like, butt fucking close? Cock sucking close? Who would monitor that process? Democrats have filed a suit in Pennsylvania to obtain prepaid postage for absentee ballots and to relax a postmark date requirement. In another of the Pennsylvania cases, a Republican challenge to the vote by mail procedures, a federal judge, J. Nicholas Rajan, told the plaintiffs, in effect, to put up or shut up, to produce evidence of fraud in their possession, or if they have none, state as much. The Republican plaintiffs submitted a 524-page filing that mentioned examples of fraud by voter intimidation at the polls and by the alteration of vote totals, but provided no single example of fraud in mail-in elections. And this case, too, is still pending. And so, last week, or the week before last, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court gave the Democrats an important victory, holding that the state should count all mailed-in votes that were postmarked by Election Day and permitting election officials to add more ballot drop boxes. Take that, Republicans! Now, some of the lawsuits involve relative minutiae. In Iowa, Republicans sued three counties that sent absentee ballots applications to voters with their names and addresses already filled in. We think voters should have to fill out that information themselves. And I'm disgusted to report that the Republican Party actually won that case. Only a handful of the lawsuits appear to have even been resolved. Rhode Island waived a requirement stipulating that voters obtain the signature of a witness in order to file an absentee ballot. Republicans challenged the change. Their case was rejected in federal district court and in the First Circuit Court of Appeals, and they failed to persuade the Supreme Court to review the judgment. But even when the Republicans fail to win in court, their lawsuits succeed in raising issues that Trump and his allies will exploit to claim fraud in the event that the vote count ends with Biden in the lead. You know, one of the ironies of the Republicans' obsession with fraud is that theirs is the party with the more significant recent history of misconduct at the polls. Shortly before the 1981 governor's race in New Jersey, the Republican National Committee created the National Ballot Security Task Force. The group consisted mostly of armed, off-duty police officers hired by the Republican Party as mercenaries to monitor polling sites in black and Hispanic neighborhoods in Newark and Trenton, specifically with the job description of keeping the coloreds from coloring the vote. And this group, whose members wore NBST armbands, National Ballot Security Task Force, armbands, posted large signs outside the polling places that read, let me tell you what they said. Warning! This area is being patrolled by the National Ballot Security Task Force. It is a crime to falsify a ballot or to violate election laws. The task force members challenged the right of colored people to vote and blocked the way to the polls, physically barring a colored vote in the election, the Republican challenger, Thomas Keene, very narrowly defeated the incumbent Democrat, James Florio, using this tactic of force 
and intimidation. The Democratic National Committee sued the Republican National Committee for its role in creating the task force, and in 1982, the two sides settled the case with a so-called consent decree. The Republicans admitted no wrongdoing, but they agreed to refrain from engaging in tactics that suppressed the vote, especially those that affected minority voters. They also said they would not hire anyone to wear armbands at the polls and agreed to allow a federal court to review in advance any plans to conduct ballot security operations at polling places. Over the years, the Republican National Committee has attempted to have the consent decree lifted, arguing that it be obsolete and unnecessary without success. Finally, in 2018, Judge John Michael Vaquez, over Democratic objections, lifted the decree. Again, an undemocratic act by a higher court. The 2020 presidential election will be the first in almost 40 years in which Republicans will be free from the strictures of the consent decree. The Trump campaign and its allies have announced plans to hire 50,000 mercenaries, armed mercenaries as poll watchers in 15 states to suppress voting locations. With Reamer being so bold as to say as the Democrats have had an unfair advantage for years because of the consent decree allowing the coloreds their vote, and we're just trying to have a fair playing field. Our people will be well trained. They are not there to intimidate. They are not there to suppress the vote. They are there to get out the lawful vote. But the president himself has insisted that the Republican poll watchers will not be so restrained. Sean Hannity, in the interview during the Democratic convention, asking him, are you going to have an ability to monitor, to avoid fraud and cross-check whether or not these are registered voters, whether or not there's been identification to know if it's a real vote from a real white American? And Trump answered, we're going to have everything. We're going to have sheriffs, and we're going to have law enforcement, and we're going to have, hopefully, American attorneys. And we're going to have everybody and attorney generals. Now, bear in mind, the president has no authority over local officials. Sherilyn Ifill, the president and director consul of the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's Legal Defense and Education Fund, said of the poll watchers, we should prepare for widespread intimidation of voters at the polls and the use of dubious lists that challenge their eligibility to vote. This has long been a tool that has been recognized as a form of voter suppression. It's an utterly appalling message that no president should be sending out to the public. Now, in advance of the 2016 election, Roger Stone, Trump's longtime friend and advisor, organized a group called Stop the Steal, which was ostensibly intended to stop voter fraud at the polls. In response, Elias's team invoked the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which prohibits private citizens from interfering with the right to vote, and won a court injunction against Stone's efforts. Elias doesn't rule out a similar lawsuit this fall. In addition, Democrats and nonpartisan civil rights groups like IFIL's plan on being stationed at as many polling stations as possible to defend the rights of voters. In such a polarized environment, 
The presence at the polls of watchers with conflicting agendas presents one of the leading possibilities for conflict. Very likely, violence on election day. Shortly after the polls close, states will begin releasing vote tallies, largely based on ballots cast at polling places. The news networks and the Associated Press are likely to be cautious about issuing projections of victory for one candidate or the other on election night. Instead, the vote counting process will go on for days, most likely weeks, under the constant gaze of partisans from both sides. According to Richard Hassett, a professor of law at the University of California, Irvine, whom I consulted, representatives of the campaigns have the right to be present during every step. Every ballot has to be verified. Every envelope has to be sealed. Every voter identity checked and the campaigns get to dispute every judgment that is made. So even if the courts have clarified the procedures for casting and counting votes in each state and locality, the possibilities for disputes arising as those rules are applied to the actual ballots are essentially endless. How closely must the signature on an absentee ballot match that on the voter registration form? What happens if a voter clearly indicates her intent, say by circling a candidate's name, but fails to fill in the correct bubble on the form? New York's Democratic primaries on June 23rd, among the first major contested elections to take its place during the pandemic, offered a modest preview of the chaos we will see after November 3rd. In those races, landslides were called quickly and without controversy, but the process of resolving the closer contest was long and agonizing. I mean, the main race still in dispute was the Democratic primary between Carolyn Maloney, the longtime representative, representative from a district that includes the east side of Manhattan and slivers of Brooklyn and Queens and Suray Patel, a young businessman and activist. Turnout was high for a primary. Patel had also challenged Maloney yesteryear, no, the year before yesteryear, 2018. About 44,000 people voted in that election. This year, the tally on election night put Maloney ahead by 648 votes, 1.6%. But more than 65,000 votes had been cast by mail, and 12 weeks later, none of those had yet been counted. In a typical pre-pandemic race in New York State, about 95% of voters cast their ballots in person. This year, it is estimated that between 40 and 60% will vote by mail. In Illinois, more than 1.1 million people had applied for absentee ballots by August. In 2018, only 430,000 people in the state voted absentee. The magnitude of the challenge for election officials was evident as soon as you entered the counting room, which from what I saw of the footage took up most of the eighth floor of a large office building. There were about 20 counting tables set at least six feet apart. From what I could see, two board staffers sat at each table and they were monitored by representatives from both campaigns. Everyone was masked. At the tables, people tried to maintain social distance, mostly in vain, since they were all squinting at the same ballots. The staffers first compared the signatures on the envelopes with the ones in the registration book and then inspected the ballots themselves. The pace was... Glacial. At first, staffers counted just 200 ballots a day, though after a week or so, the pace quickened to about 800 a day. Still, the initial count took more than a month. Now, New York, which is heavily Democratic, is 
unlikely to be competitive in the presidential election, but there is every reason to believe that the count in the Maloney-Patel race will be simple and straightforward compared to what might happen around the country when, well, in the presidential contest. Based on previous trends, at least twice as many people will vote in November as voted in the June primary. That means at least double the number of absentee ballots to count. In the case of a close race, a recount, in which a, each side could contest the validity of each ballot, it would certainly go on for longer than the month plus that it took for Maloney to declare victory. And as that New York race also demonstrated, mailed ballots have a markedly higher rate of disqualification. About 20% of the ballots from Manhattan and Queens and nearly 30% of those from Brooklyn were disqualified, mainly because, well, many at least because voters didn't sign the envelopes of the absentee ballots or because they sealed the envelope with tape rather than with moisture. The Postal Service had failed to apply postmarks to many of the absentee ballots, so the Board of Elections disallowed all those that were received after Election Day. Patel successfully sued in federal court to have more ballots counted, especially those without postmarks. But by that point, in early August, Maloney's lead had grown to 4% and the Associated press called the race to her. Patel conceded on August 27th. Now, Samuel Isakaroff, a professor at New York University of Law, observed that the Democrats want to blame Trump and the Republicans for all the problems with voting and claim that it's vote suppression. But the Republicans had nothing to do with the fiasco in New York. The Democrats made all the rules there. There was no conspiracy. The system is just not set up to absorb that many absentee ballots and count them in a reasonable period of time. Now that high disqualification rate for absentee ballots poses a special peril for Democrats. According to a study co-written by Daniel Smith, a professor at the University of Florida Law School, the mail-in ballots of racial and ethnic minorities, and also of young voters, were rejected at a substantially higher rate than those of older white voters across counties, even though the counties varied in the overall rate at which they rejected ballots. High disqualification rates for mail-in votes were evident in 2020 races around the country. According to studies by the Washington Post and NPR National Public Radio, during the primaries, mailed ballots were disqualified at a far higher rate than in 2016. 500,000 in total were deemed invalid. By comparison, about 318,000 ballots were disqualified in the 2016 general election. Now, Franita Tolson, a professoress at the USC Gould School of Law, has noted that you will still see many claims that absentee ballots have been wrongly rejected and those will lead to court cases. The fact that we are generating lots of voting by mail will generate a lot of litigation. And Daniel Smith said, ultimately, in Florida, it may all come down to the three-member canvassing boards who will decide as whether each vote even counts. This time, they won't be staring at chads, but comparing signatures and deciding if they match. In the days following election night, there is likely to be an increasing disparity between the initial poll tallies and the numbers that include mail-in votes. This isn't anything new. According to Edward B. Foley, a professor at The Ohio State University Moritz College of Law, 
For most of the 20th century, the preliminary count on election night was about 99% of the total count, but even before COVID, a new normal developed because of greater reliance on vote-by-mail. Exemplae Gratiae, uh, on election night circa 2018, the Republican Martha McSally led the Democrat Christine Cinema by 1%, in the Arizona Senate race, but there were still about 600,000 votes to be counted, a quarter of the total number, and once they were, it was clear that Cinema had won comfortably by about 55,000 votes. This year, with more mail-in votes, a blue shift is going to be taking place in essentially every state. Now, voters in nine states will get their ballots mailed to them directly by default, and 36 states will offer no excuse absentee voting. That is, voters will be allowed to choose to vote by mail without having to give a reason. These include two major swing states, Pennsylvania and Michigan. In the past, four presidential elections. Pennsylvania experienced a blue shift of about 20,000 votes. That was before COVID and before the state moved to no excuse absentee voting. So that means there will be a great deal more mail-in votes this year than in the past. In the Pennsylvania Democratic primary in June, which had a low turnout because the presidential nomination had already been decided, it took more than two weeks still to count the votes. There is nothing sinister about the fact that Democrats use mail-in voting more than Republicans do. My concern is that Trump will claim that the blue shift, which will occur, is but evidence of partisan foul play, particularly if it eliminates an apparent election night lead in an important state. Some Democrats have deemed a possible Trump lead on election night the red mirage. If the votes keep shifting, Trump will demand that the election night numbers be certified because he doesn't trust the mail-ins. The year before yesteryear, after a blue shift narrowed the election night leads of Republican statewide candidates in Florida, Trump tweeted, The Florida election should be called in favor of Rick Scott and Ron DeSantis in that large numbers of new ballots showed up out of nowhere and many ballots are missing or forged. An honest vote count is no longer possible. Ballots massively infected must go with election night only. The prospect of a blue shift And Trump's reaction thereunto is one reason that Michael Bloomberg decided to spend a hundred million dollars to help Biden in Florida. Now, Howard Wolfson, a senior political advisor to Bloomberg, observed that in swing states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, they count their election day votes first and then the mail-in ballots So it's entirely possible that Trump will be ahead there. Trump has no respect for decorum or tradition, so we assume that he will just claim victory at that point and argue us that any ballots that come in after that point be fraudulent. Florida, on the other hand, counts mail-in votes as they arrive, so the election night total may well come close to the state's final result. Florida is obviously very close, and it's a state that Trump really has to win to get to 270 electoral votes. If we can just show that he lost Florida on election night, it makes it pretty much impossible for him to claim victory in the election. That was a huge factor in why Bloomberg decided to invest in Florida. It took a Supreme Court ruling to conclude the presidential race in 2000. And there is an additional set of procedures that will come into play this year. They have roots in an even more controversial presidential election which took place 
1876, but 100 years after the foundation of the nation itself. That year, on the night of November 7th, it appeared that Samuel J. Tilden, the Democrat, had defeated Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican. But the results in several Republican-dominated states had not yet been reported. The vote was especially close in Florida. Shortly before the Electoral College was to meet, in December, the Florida Canvassing Board certified electors pledged to Hayes, but the state's Attorney General certified Tilden as the winner. Louisiana and South Carolina also sent contradictory certifications to Washington. Because neither candidate commanded a clear Electoral College majority, Congress improvised a solution establishing an electoral commission of five senators, five House members, and five justices of the Supreme Court. A few days before Inauguration Day, 1877, the commission voted 8-7 to seven to award the presidency to Union General Rutherford B. Hayes, and Republicans like Hayes had established Reconstruction in the South after the Civil War, but as part of the deal that made him president, Hayes agreed to end Reconstruction with catastrophic implications for black African Americans for generations to come. Congress knew that what happened in 1876 was a complete disaster, an embarrassment, and then there were two more close elections in 1880 and 1884, so they realized they really had to do something about it. Resultantly, Congress passed the Electoral Count Act of 1887, which purported to establish a procedure for resolving disputed presidential elections. The statute was a placeholder, better than nothing, which they figured would be improved over time. But Congress has never returned to the issue, and the law has never really been tested. No one even really knows what it means. There does seem to be general agreement on but one provision of the 1887 Act, the Safe Harbor Clause. It provides that if a state submits its final tally in the presidential contest by six days before the meeting of the Electoral College, that decision is conclusive and thus free from legal challenge. This year, the Safe Harbor deadline is December 8th, the Electoral College meets in each state capital the 14th of December. It is unclear, however, what will happen if a slow vote count puts a state in jeopardy of missing the deadline. The court's opinion in Bush v. Gore provides one possibility based on Article 2 of the Constitution which says that the states must appoint electors. Now, they say, specifically, I'll read from the Constitution itself, Article 2, the states must appoint electors in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct. In its Bush versus Gore opinion, the 